Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clerk. Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, paid parental leave amendment improvements for families and gender equality bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you, um, President. Um, I'm very pleased to stand today to speak on the paid parental leave amendment improvements for families and gender equality bill 2022. Uh, the opposition will be supporting uh, this bill for a number of reasons. And we we're glad to see this bill um, goes that, that this bill, uh, the government has chosen to implement the former coalition government's reforms to pay parental leave, which we announced as part of our March 2022 budget. The bill will provide increased flexibility, improve choice, and ensure that pay parental leave scheme is fit for purpose for modern families. The bill increases the total number of weeks of available paid parental leave from 18 to 20 weeks, and removes some of the constraints around the two-week period of dad and partner pay and the 12-week, six-week uh, paid parental leave period breakdowns that were currently in place. We understand the importance of these changes because we know that 
parent make household decisions around caring arrangements to reflect their own personal circumstances. So increasing the number of weeks from 18 to 20 weeks with the enhanced flexibility on how those weeks can be shared reflects this need for choice and flexibility in modern households. It is also important that both parents are able to spend the time that they choose to spend with their new child, and the increased flexibility encourages both parents to have a period of leave. The re bill removes the notion of primary, secondary and tertiary claimants, taking away some of the rigidity that existed between the, who takes the leave, when and how, between the two parents. This bill also expands access to the scheme by introducing a $350,000 income test, which will ensure that household income is considered when determining eligibility to PPL rather than just the individual income uh, of one of the two parents. We strongly support the increased flexibility this bill achieves, which allows parents to use the leave over a two-year period in a way that they choose. This allows parents to take leave in one block or in multiple blocks or in whatever way that works best for them and their particular family circumstances. This reform goes to the heart of what the former coalition government sought to achieve in enhancing PPL, which is why we are pleased that our announcements from the March 2022 budget are included in this bill. The coalition has a strong record of supporting government-funded paid parental leave. And through my role as the former Minister for Social Services, I was very proud to be part of a government that made important amendments to strengthen paid parental leave during the last term of parliament. Our PPL scheme gave, people, um, uh, gave families flexibility to choose how they access their payments, giving either parent the option, depending on individual's household circumstances, with the last six weeks being able to be shared or taken any time. Importantly, we also introduced special circumstances, allowing a parent to meet the work test if they had been impacted by family and domestic violence, by a natural disaster or by a severe medical condition. We allowed JobKeeper and the COVID-19 disaster payments to count towards the work test for PPL to prove a genuine connection to the workplace, and we introduced indexation on the income threshold for the first time since the scheme was introduced. And as this, implant, uh, this legislation implements in March 2022, as part of the Women's Budget Statement, we again underlined our strong commitment to the social and economic benefits of paid parental leave by announcing enhanced paid parental leave. Our enhanced paid parental leave represented an investment of $346.1 million over five years to expand PPL, giving working families full choice and control over how they use their 20 weeks of taxpayer-funded paid parental leave. So once again, the coalition will support this bill, giving the vast majority of the changes in this bill reflect the important reforms that we announced as part of our last budget to enhance the scheme and ensure parents are able to make their own caring arrangements based on their individual circumstances. We will support the government in any sensible measures that seek to support Australian families, particularly where those measures reflect the former coalition government's policies. I'm proud the coalition was a real steward of paid parental leave in government, and our enhancements to the scheme saw it become a mainstay in every Australian life. But, there are, but where there are enhancements and improvements that can be made, um, we will absolutely make sure that we stand with those improvements if they are to the benefit of Australian families. And at its heart, paid parental leave should make it easier for parents to make decisions that work for their particular families that give them the opportunity to spend important time with their new child, uh, unencumbered by the pressures of work where they choose to do so. The changes in this bill that provide greater flexibility for families to determine how they use that 20 weeks of leave reflect the changes in modern families. But this legislation also maintains what is a timeless aspect of paid parental leave, and that is the need to give parents time with their child. We absolutely understand the importance of paid parental leave in alleviating some of the additional pressures felt by families with the birth of a child, and we know that those pressures are particularly strongly felt at the moment, with the cost of living pressures only rising under this government. So, of course, we will support good and sensible reforms to paid parental leave to ensure families are supported through the scheme to take off some of these significant pressures. We will happily support this bill, acknowledging that a huge number of the changes and a significant proportion of the increased flexibility that this bill delivers were adopted from the Coalition's policies, mm -hmm. who announced these important reforms in 2022. I commend the bill. Senator Green. 
Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I also rise to speak on this um, important bill, and I do so as part of a government filled with so many incredible women. In the week of International Women's Day, it's a pleasure to speak on such an important bill um, uh, for Australian women and for Australian families. Um, I think back to last International Women's Day, and especially the one before that, and think how much things have changed for Australian women, for women across Australia, but also for women in this place. Um, our government took to the election very real commitments that had positive impacts on Australian women, uh, from improving access to childcare, making childcare cheaper, to closing the gender pay gap. Uh, and since the election, we've also made commitments um, to uh, ensure that we have we end gendered violence within a decade. And I know that some of these reforms are ambitious, but our government is committed to delivering them to bettering the lives of Australian women. And it starts with bills like this one today, bills that level the playing field and make things fairer and more equal for all families. The Albanese Labor government is getting on with the job of delivering for Australians. The bill is just the start of a, the largest reform to paid parental leave since Labor introduced it back in 2011. It is really good economic policy to deliver these types of reforms. It will see fairness and equality in the way parents take leave, and it will also see more flexibility in how leave is taken and ease tr transitioning back to work for parents. Um, now, from I thought I would share just a personal point of view um, with this uh, bill. It's been almost exactly a year ago. Uh, my wife and I welcomed our first child into the world. Um, <laughs> we celebrated her first birthday a few days ago. Um, and a really beautiful um, christening and um, celebration with family. Um, but it's been a really busy year, <laughs> uh, and it is really um, a, a time that you look back and think about those first couple of weeks, those first couple of months, and how important that time is together. When you have a new little baby, it is an incredibly stressful time, uh, and you want to spend all of your time with this new, perfect human. Um, you don't really want to have to worry about going back to work or returning to work. And I'm incredibly lucky, and my family is incredibly lucky, that my wife works in a heavily unionised industry with a very good enterprise agreement, which already allowed for flexible parental leave arrangements, meaning that she could take maternity leave while also having days that she could return to work. I think it's that employer-employee relationship open and allowed her to stay connected to her colleagues and her role that really made transitioning back to work easier. This transition option helped ease both mine and my wife's mind in such a new and vulnerable position. And I'm so grateful. Some families don't get that opportunity. Uh, people will tell you time and time again that um, babies are only little ones. And that time spent with these little tiny humans is so important. And it's so important for mums, it's so important for dads, it's so important for every type of family. Most of the time, though, it is mothers who are left without that work connection, deepening the economic gap between men and women in our country. That's why this reform is so important. We also um, have heard this time and time across the country, um, particularly at the jobs and skills roundtables that I held in far north Queensland um, last year. Uh, we held forums in Mareeba, Cairns and Townsville, and the number one thing that was coming up is ret women returning to work. Um, how difficult it was to get childcare places, but also how difficult it was to manage that transition between paid parental leave and returning to work. I had women tell me that even though they were the larger income earner, the system worked against them, making them take leave instead of their partner. We heard it again in the successful National Jobs and Skills Summit our government held last year. And so we listened and we are acting. Right now, the current scheme does not do enough to provide access to all parents, whether they're mothers, whether they're um, partners. It limits flexibility for families to choose how they take leave and transition back to work. And the eligibility rules are unfair to families where the mother is the higher income earner. Our bill fixes these issues. It gives more families access to government payments, gives uh, parents more flexibility in how they take leave, and encourages parents to share care to improve gender equality. 
From 1 July 2023, the bill delivers six key changes. It will combine the two existing payments into a single 20-week scheme. It will res reserve a portion of the scheme for each parent to support them both to take time off after the birth or adoption. We will make it easier for both parents to access the payment by removing the notion of primary and second carers, um, which I have to say in a same-sex relationship is something that's quite interesting. Um, uh, but it's really a helpful idea that not one parent is the primary carer because we know both parents play an incredibly important role. We are expanding access to introducing a 350,000 family income test, which families can be assessed under if they exceed the individual income test. And we are increasing flexibility for parents to choose how they take leave days. We are also allowing eligible fathers and partners to access the payment irrespective of whether the birth parent meets the income test or residency requirements. This bill goes a long way for Australian families. Around 1, sorry, 181,000 will benefit from the changes in this bill, and that's including more than 4,000 people who are eligible under the scheme. While the former government had an attitude of um, let's uh, make um, some announcements just before the election, the Albanese Labor government is listening to Australians and we're delivering this change in our first term of government. We are listening to businesses who are also crying out for these changes to support their employees, to support the women that work in their workplaces. And we are fixing and improving on systems that just aren't functioning the best way they can. We want Australians and their families to get ahead and not be left behind. We want parents, especially mums, to have good, secure jobs and families and not to have to choose between work and taking care of their kids. That's what this bill will achieve. The changes in this bill send a clear message that treating parenting as an equal partnership supports gender equality. And our government values the care that men do as well, and we want to see that reinforced in workplaces and our communities. When fathers take a greater role from the start, it benefits mums, dads and their kids. We know this and we know that there are so many fathers out there that will really be welcoming the introduction of this scheme. The government's paid parental leave reform is good for parents, it's good for kids, it's good for employers and it's good for the economy. I couldn't be prouder to be part of an Albanese Labor government with its ambitious yet practical reforms that will change the lives of Australians for the better, and particularly change the lives of Australian women for the better. It's always Labor governments that bring the country forward. It is a Labor government that introduced paid parental leave back in 2011, and it's a Labor, Labor government that is today delivering a fairer and more flexible scheme. I commend this bill and I thank all senators who will be supporting this bill today. Parents will be better off, women will be better off, men will be better off, employers will be better off, and this is just the beginning of delivering for Australian women. Thanks. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. And can I say happy birthday to Senator Green's uh, little one? Uh, this bill is a step in the right direction, but they are baby steps, if you will pardon the pun. One of the strongest messages coming from last year's Jobs and Skills Summit was the economic and social benefits of stronger paid parental leave. And it was a theme that was repeated in the landmark work and care inquiry chaired by my colleague Senator Barbara Pocock. That inquiry has been hearing from women, families, businesses and academics around the country about the critical role that paid parental leave plays in keeping women connected to the workforce and in allowing families to juggle work and care responsibilities. A report released today from the Impact Economics and Policy uh, Group estimates that since the introduction of paid parental leave, just a little over 10 years ago, there's been an $8.5 billion rise in GDP due to the increased participation of parents, predominantly mothers. So that report again confirms the importance of maintaining a link between parents and their workplaces during leave. Economists, families, women's organisations, unions and the business sector all agree that fairer, gender-neutral, flexible paid parental leave will unlock women's workforce participation and help close the gender pay gap, which sadly persists over decades now. 
fairer pay parental leave will break down traditional gender roles and encourage more equitable sharing of care between parents. It will improve maternal and infant health by allowing time to recover from birth and establish breastfeeding where that's possible. It will give kids the best possible start and it will set up good parenting habits for life. And yet, despite all of that, despite the clear benefits of a strong paid parental leave scheme, Australia's scheme is the second worst in the developed world. At just 18 weeks for birth parents and two weeks for partners prior to prior to this bill, it falls well behind international best practice of 52 weeks, with structured use-it-or-lose-it provisions for partners and higher rates of pay. After a decade of inaction, Australia is now playing catch-up and we're going too slow. This bill is a welcome recognition of the need for reform and the, uh, the recognition that the way we design parental leave um, uh, needs to be stronger. And we do support, of course, the distinction, uh, removing the distinction between primary and secondary carers that has locked mothers into the primary caring role. It's 2023 now. We can have a broader view on that. Combining the existing primary care and uh, dad and partner leave entitlements into a single entitlement that can be shared between both parents acknowledges that both parents share a critical role and allows families to decide how they want to share that care. We support the increased flexibility in how leave can be taken and the introduction of a family income threshold to address the inequity of a family missing out because the woman is the higher income earner, a situation which does happen now because it is 2023, but which our laws had not uh, countenanced prior to this bill. But it must be said, and it was said by almost all the submissions uh, to the inquiry into this bill in which I participated, that much more needs to be done. This bill doesn't increase the amount of leave available to families. It does increase uh, by two weeks for single parents, but, uh, and of course those are predominantly women. The government has committed to a staggered increase in paid parental leave entitlements, but it's not until 2026 that those increased weeks, up to 26 weeks, um, will flow. Parents who've been calling for fairer leave entitlements for a decade are being asked to wait for another three years to get the international minimum standard. There is no reason to delay the implementation of good policy. Australian parents should have immediate access to at least 26 weeks of paid parental leave, and I'll be moving a committee, uh, committee stage amendment to make that so. Further, the government should be providing a pathway to 52 weeks of paid parental leave by 2030, as the ACTU, the Parenthood and many others are calling for. We welcome that this bill sets up the infrastructure for use it or lose it provisions. Co-parents, especially fathers, need encouragement, sadly, to take up more responsibility for the direct care of young children. Currently, only one in 20 fathers in Australia takes more than the two weeks of dad leave. The bulk of leave and the bulk of care still falls to mothers. The experience in other countries puts beyond doubt that use it or lose it provisions does help increase men's participation in caring, um, and it does so by reducing the stigma around shared care and flexible work arrangements. In Scandinavian countries, the number of fathers taking leave increased dramatically with the introduction of use it or lose it provisions. Fairer sharing of care has now been sustained for more than a decade. When Canada introduced paid parental leave on a use it or lose it basis, the percentage of partners taking leave in the first year doubled. We know that it works. We know that it creates a better system for all parents and children. So we support the introduction of a use it or lose it component to paid parental leave under this bill. However, the two weeks use it or lose it allocation in the bill, which effectively just replicates the existing provision for dads and partners, will not be enough to provoke that deep cultural shift towards shared care that we need. So we would like to see a significant expansion of the use it or lose it allocation. The Women's Economic Equality Task Force is, I understand, looking at this issue at the minute, and we look very much forward to seeing their recommendations implemented sooner rather than later. Use it or lose it provisions must be supported by campaigns to educate families about the benefits of shared care, incentive for employers to encourage both parents to take leave, flexible working initiatives to support juggling care responsibilities, and more affordable and accessible early childhood education and care. And when I say more affordable and accessible, I mean free early childhood education, no matter where you live. That's the kind of revolution that we need to have equality in the workforce. Um, critically, Services Australia also needs to ensure that its staff are trauma-informed 
and able to identify and respond to coercive behaviour, where abusive partners attempt to use the increased PPL flexibility as yet another weapon of control. We also support measures in the bill allowing partners to take leave, even where the birth parent does not meet the income or residency tests. This is a welcome extension of eligibility. However, the inflexible work and residency tests remain a barrier. The bar is too high and too rigid, and too many people are missing out. It's important that all families are supported to take leave in the early years, early years of parenthood, regardless of their circumstances. My colleague Senator Faruqi will be moving an amendment to close a gap that prevents postgrad students from accessing PPL. I want to talk briefly about the rate of paid parental leave, sadly yet another area where Australia has fallen behind other countries. It's currently set at the woefully inadequate minimum wage, a rate which we believe should be raised uh, for everyone and which I might add women are uh, disproportionately the recipients of. So it's set at that woefully inadequate minimum wage and, as no surprise, it is now one of the lowest rates of paid parental leave in the OECD. Parents taking leave to care for kids marks a significant break in their career and their earning capacity. Women who take leave often return at reduced hours, they defer promotions, they reduce their overall retirement income. Replacement wages ensure that parents are not financially punished for taking time to care for their children. Higher rates of pay would also encourage shared care. Leave paid at well below normal wages forces families to make difficult decisions about how long they can afford to take leave for and who takes it. Without a change in the payment rates, parental leave will continue to be taken by the partner earning the lower wage, and more often than not, sadly, this is still the woman. The Greens will, call, uh, will continue to call for the rate of PPL to be increased to replacement wages, capped up to 100000 a year. But we also note alternative models proposed by witnesses to the inquiry into this bill, including lifting the rate to the average wage or applying a livable wage or encouraging employers to top up government payments. The Greens urge the government to invite the Women's Economic Equality Task Force to review the options for a PPL payment rate that will incentivise parents to take their leave entitlements. Finally, we know that periods of parental leave and part-time work on return from leave have been a contributor to the superannuation pay gap. A gap in super earnings for parents taking leave compounds over time and can result in that parent, mostly women, being around $20,000 worse off in retirement. We do have a retirement income gender, cap, gender gap, and this is part of the reason why. It's been a long-standing policy of the Greens, of unions, of women's economic security advocates to pay superannuation on paid parental leave. This has also previously been a policy of the Labor Party. As far as gender equality measures go, it's a no-brainer, and yet it's not part of this bill. I will be moving, and in fact I do now move, a second reading amendment calling on the government to urgently reconsider that decision and include superannuation contributions on paid parental leave. And that's amendment uh, on sheet 1827. Overall, this bill is a positive step towards fairer paid parental leave, but as I said, it's a baby step. There are equitable, equitable measures which could be taken to align Australia's paid parental leave scheme with world's best practice now rather than waiting for later. As one of the wealthiest nations on the planet, we should be able to give all working parents and their children the quality care and early childhood education that they need. The families of Australia deserve it. And I'll, in closing, just make the point that why are we making women wait three more years for 26 weeks when many of our other comparable nations already have 52 weeks internationally? Why are we again making women wait for their slice of the pie when this government has $246 billion in revenue that it is choosing to continue? to give to the very wealthy in the form of those stage three tax cuts that former Prime Minister Morrison proposed. You can't cry poor and yet dish out $246 billion in tax cuts to the wealthy. If you axed those tax cuts, you would have more than enough money to not only address the housing, the cost of living crises and the climate crisis, but you could afford to increase paid parental leave to the amount that women deserve, that parents deserve, at a proper rate for a proper amount of time and not off in the never-never but now. Senator Brockman. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this bill as a member of the Community Affairs Committee and a member of the Coalition. And, uh, the Coalition will be supporting this bill and, in fact, it reflects um, the Coalition's policy when in government. Uh, large parts of it are taken from the changes we um, proposed to uh, the paid parental leave scheme when we were last in government, and we acknowledge that uh, Labor in government has adopted our policy in large part and is now implementing it. Uh, I was lucky enough when our third child came along to be self-employed, and that gave me the opportunity to take a few weeks out of the workforce. Uh, at our own expense to, to spend time uh, with our third child. And that was an extraordinarily valuable time and something that uh, I very much cherish. But I understand, and we on this side understand, that that's not always possible um, for all uh, new parents to, to take that time out uh, uh, from their own financial uh, circumstances. So we understand that these changes and the flexibility inherent in these changes is so important to families, and that is why we did propose these measures in government. Uh, I guess the, the one note of caution I would sound, and, and the one area where I still think we do need to continue the conversation and where governments need to ensure that adequate supports and resourcing is put in place is assisting small business. Small business does still face a challenge uh, that um, when they, particularly small, uh, small and medium-sized businesses uh, with large staffing uh, components where they lose key staff members for a period of time in a tight labour market, uh, replacements are not always available. So uh, governments need to help and support those small businesses in dealing with those circumstances as well. Uh, it's a conversation that obviously needs to be had between uh, business owners and their staff and uh, very much encourage those conversations to continue because it is such a vitally important uh, social measure that we take to ensure that uh, new parents can spend time uh, with their newly born baby. Uh, so the coalition does support these measures. Uh, we support the fact that uh, these will see economic and social benefits that flow through society. Uh, in government, our paid parental leave scheme gave families flexibility to choose how they access their payments and gave either parents uh, the option, depending on individual household circumstances. Uh, when in government, the coalition made important amendments to strengthen paid parental leave, including increasing flexibility, introducing special circumstances, which allow a person to meet the work test if they've been impacted by family and domestic violence, uh, natural disaster or a severe medical condition. So uh, in March 19, uh, 2022, as part of the Women's Budget Statement, the Coalition once again underlined its commitment to paid parental leave by announcing the Enhanced parade, Paid Parental Leave um, system. Enhanced Paid Parental Leave would have seen an investment of $346 million over five years to expand paid parental leave, giving working families full choice and control how, how they use 20 weeks of taxpayer-funded parental leave. Uh, through the course of this bill, as I said, uh, through the course of the inquiry into this bill, as I said, there, there, there remains concern, particularly amongst small family-owned businesses, of the potential impact of cost changes in this area. And, and uh, particularly in light of tight labour markets. So I emphasise again it's important that governments provide support to employers, particularly small and family businesses, ensuring their obligations are made clear, that the administrative burden of these changes is minimal, and to give the chance um, for these businesses to minimise the economic impact uh, that may come in the future. So once again, we do support these changes and we do support paid parental leave. Uh, Senator Barbara Pocock, would you happen to be seeking the call? Oh, uh, with indulgence, apologies, we'll, if we can.
I'll, I'll, I'll say your name slowly, um, Senator. Colleagues, Senator uh, <laughs> thanks, um, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. I, um, I did want to uh, make a short contribution in relation to this uh, piece of legislation. Um, firstly, uh, to indicate that uh, paid parental leave is not, um, and this piece of legislation is, while I think it is an achievement of this government that is worth celebrating, and I, I trust that this uh, piece of legislation will make its way uh, through the Senate uh, over the course of today. Um, it is not just an achievement, though, of this government. It is an achievement um, that really rests upon the shoulders of the contribution of uh, generations of uh, people, particularly uh, in the labour movement. Uh, so, in, in uh, recent times uh, in, in the labour movement, uh, uh, union leaders like uh, Sally McManus and Michelle O'Neill, but also uh, people like our own Linda White, who is, uh, who is uh, now a Senate colleague, um, uh, Joanne Schofield from United Workers' Union, um, uh, Julia Fox from the uh, SDA and others, have led this set of arguments in recent times. Uh, but, but I will not name all of the people who have been engaged uh, in this. The point that I wanted to make is that their contribution rests upon the shoulders of generations of mostly uh, women uh, in the labour movement who have been arguing the case for expanded paid parental leave for many, many generations. I recall that in the short happy period I served on the executive of the ACTU in the late 1990s um, that uh, women like Sharon Burrow and Jenny George uh, and indeed uh, leaders like Greg Combe were making the argument for uh, this set of reforms. Um, it is also important to point out that, uh, that uh, there are um, leaders in Australian business uh, who have been making the case uh, for these reforms as well. Um, I point, of course, to Jennifer Westacott but many others. Uh, who have been making uh, the case for this set of reforms, but also dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of business leaders in large businesses and small ones who have made decisions in their own organisations to extend, you know, to not only make the case for a broader policy reform, uh, but to uh, make changes in their organisations uh, to set out uh, to, to set out better parental leave entitlement for uh, women and men, uh, for young parents, uh, not only to make their firms employers of choice uh, uh, in an increasingly uh, uh, competitive labour market, but also, but also because those business leaders uh, have uh, listened carefully to the debate from uh, uh, from the academic community, the international debate uh, and to the trade union movement itself, but I've decided that it's uh, actually the right thing for them to do uh, to lead the community debate. It is not the only area of community debate where debate has been led by the trade union movement uh, and by Australian business and sections of this parliament have been left behind. Uh, uh, but in, term, in paid parental leave terms, uh, the consensus uh, in the, across the economy uh, and the consensus uh, in the labour movement has certainly led uh, where this parliament has got to, uh, and it has taken, I think, uh, far too long for this set of reforms to come uh, to the parliament. I also wanted to make a few comments about the difference that this will make, um, the difference it will make to uh, young parents. Uh, and to uh, uh, young parents, young people who are thinking about starting a family, uh, thinking about their careers, and thinking about the capacity for them as as couples uh, to work through making the difficult uh, choices uh, to make sure that they can support uh, each other uh, and their families, but also make sure that they have got um, real career options uh, in front of them. 
uh, and this, this set of reforms will uh, ensure uh, that, that uh, uh, workers and families are being supported by the government when they make uh, these decisions. So it'll make a real difference in ordinary families' lives. Um, but it's not just a reform that is good for ordinary families. It is a reform that is good for economic participation. It is good for productivity. It is good for economic growth. Um, and it is good uh, when we're dealing with some of the other significant challenges, uh, particularly the different outcomes for women uh, in the workplace and across their working lives. Uh, the gender pay gap is persistent. Um, it, has, it has gone up and it has gone down, but it has persistently hovered around the mid-teens now for uh, well over a decade. Most of the movements that have occurred uh, in terms of the gender pay gap um, over the course of the last decade have really happened uh, as a reflection of changes that have happened in men's wages. Uh, and I've seen uh, members of the previous government come in here uh, you know, fist pumping uh, whenever the gender wage gap has gone down by a few decimal points, but it has always been as a result of uh, diminished growth uh, for men's wages, not serious policy reform uh, that has made a difference uh, for women's wages. Uh, some, of the, some of the decisions that this government took through last year have had some impact. Uh, the decision to support minimum wage increases does have some impact. Uh, future decisions um, uh, that, that are targeted towards workers who work in the care sector will have some impact on the gender wage gap. But, but this set of reforms uh, will allow women to, uh, more women, more Australian women, to uh, develop careers and to ensure that their career and connection with work uh, continues. And that is, uh, that is a very good thing uh, indeed. Um, I, uh, I'm delighted just to have an opportunity to make a small contribution uh, in this debate. I know that there are uh, some amendments that are going to be brought forward over the course of uh, today's debate, um, and just say that, you know, from the government's perspective, uh, this is a very important step forward. Um, it is a very important set of reforms. The government is, of course, constrained in terms of what it can do, uh, given the uh, given the tight fiscal environment. Uh, and the challenges that are in front of uh, the country in terms of uh, the, uh, the legacy that we've been left by the previous government. Um, I know that those uh, amendments will be agitated and, and developed around, and um, that is, that is welcome, uh, a welcome debate, um, but, uh, but the government uh, is constrained, of course, in terms of uh, uh, what it can do. But this is a momentous, um, historic uh, set of reforms that builds upon um, uh, generations of uh, struggle and advocacy uh, and work, and I wanted to use this small contribution to thank those people who have done that work. Thank you. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Bill before us. Uh, in doing so, I note the worthy and very welcome aims of this bill in assisting to close the gender pay gap and provide greater freedom to dads and partners taking time out to spend with their newborn children. It is important we get this right, as there is a lot at stake, most importantly the well-being of the next generation. Research overwhelmingly shows the benefits of par parents taking time out of work to spend time with their newborns. It's important for bonding, but also for the mental health and well-being of parents. Throughout the committee process, I've also seen evidence on the well-being benefits for dads. These are the kinds of benefits, benefits we have the opportunity to promote through this bill. But more broadly, for our economy, we know that we, we need to be doing more to lift women's economic participation. The National Skills Commission estimated that 1.2 million additional workers will be needed across the economy by 2026. A large majority of these roles will be in traditionally feminised industries, such as those in the care economy. We are feeling those impacts even now as we look at the shortages of re registered nurses that are available to enter the aged care system. Modernising our paid parental leave scheme is one lever we, we can pull to help close the participation gap and, by extension, the pay gap. Deloitte recently reported that more flexible ideas 
around gender norms could lead to an additional $128 billion each year for Australia's economy and deliver 461,000 additional full-time employees into the economy. And when we look across the world, there is ample research to show how tweaking PPL schemes can work to lift women's economic participation and close the gender pay gap. This bill presents a first step on that pathway. Uh, there's plenty that's good about this bill. Firstly, the bill allows all paid parental leave days to be taken as flexible days. Uh, allowing flexibility in how new parents manage care and work is a good thing for both parents and businesses. It means that parents and partners can manage a gradual return to work in a way that suits them and their needs. It respects that each parent and every family will have different circumstances, whether that's a grandparent that is able to help with care or a job with irregular hours. For businesses, a gradual return to work is also optimal. As the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry notes, forcing people to take 12 consecutive weeks of off work has always been an unnecessary feature of the current scheme. In reality, it's far easier for a business to manage a partial vacancy rather than a full vacancy. And it's likely that these changes will help strengthen the con contract, the contact, sorry, between employers and employees while a person is using PPL. I also welcome the positive changes for dads and partners. For too long, women have shouldered the greatest burden of caring responsibilities for newborns. Currently, 80% of all paid parental leave is claimed by women. This is despite a host of evidence showing, that the, showing the benefits of fathers being able to take time to care for newborns in their first years of life, inclu including improved well-being for both dads and children. These changes do the right thing by giving dads and partners greater access to a shared PPL entitlement, which I hope will give more incentive to take time out of work. While there's plenty to be proud of in this bill, it really should be seen as a first step. There's so much more to do. Given the workforce shortages being felt in various industries, I feel this bill misses an opportunity to accelerate those changes needed to unlock greater workforce participation by women. The bill will not increase the overall PPL entitlement. It joins together the current 18-week scheme with the separate two-week dad and partner pay scheme into a single 20-week entitlement that can be used by both parents. While it is the government's stated ambition to reach 26 weeks by 2026, it is not included in this bill. As of right now, the 26-week entitlement remains just an ambition. And even after we reach 26 weeks, Australia will still lag behind other OECD nations. The OECD average is 51 weeks, which is more than double what is offered in this bill. PPL is also not offered at a replacement wage, rather it is offered at the minimum wage. So at full-time equivalent pay, the OECD average is 36 weeks, while Australia currently offers just 8.6 weeks. We know that more is, in, more is required to increase participation of dads and partners in PPL and to stimulate workforce participation by women. We know this because the international research in this area is well advanced. And when we look across the world, we can see clearly the policy ingredients that are needed. A big ingredient is the use it or lose it period. That is the period within the whole entitlement that is reserved for just one claimant to use. Under this bill, the use it or lose it period, periods are set at two weeks for each claimant. This is basically what already happens under the current scheme, and so far there has been very little uptake of PPL by men. Nordic countries that have implemented dedicated parental leave for fathers have seen significant increases in uptake by men. To give one example, when Iceland introduced 13 dedicated weeks for fathers in 2002, the number of fathers who took leave increased from less than 1 per cent to 80 per cent. I feel it is a shame that this bill does not con contemplate longer use it or lose it uh, periods to greater effect, knowing from international experience that they have been making a huge impact. However, I'm aware that this is a question that the Women's Economic Equality Task Force is currently considering, and it will form part of another bill on this subject later in the year. A big concern that's been raised with me through consultations on this bill is around the continued administrative burden that PPL is putting on our small businesses. 
And these small businesses are increasingly being run by women who are having to shoulder this burden. With this bill, we have an opportunity to change that by giving small business the option to either pay Commonwealth PPL direct or to have Services Australia pay this, as they already do for 40 per cent of payments. I believe there's a really strong argument for medium and, and large businesses to administer the payment and to ensure that there, there is a connection between them and the employee taking the leave. However, for small, overworked businesses, we need to be doing all we can to reduce the amount of red tape and cost for them. Even small changes to a payroll can have a big impact on a small business. Small businesses who need to liaise with the government, grapple with how to manage the flow of cash between Services Australia and their employee, and recalculate how much tax needs to be withheld. It is a clear pain point, and it's something that has been raised with me by businesses in my community, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Canberra Business Chamber, and the Australian Hairdressers, Hairdressing Association, and others. And it's not a new concern. Uh, it was something that was raised with the Parliament when it was first contemplating PPL over a decade ago now. It was then raised again in a review of that Act, which, which I, I uh, found and, and, and I quote here, employer and industry groups generally did not support the employer role, particularly in relation to small business. To continue to quote, these stakeholders considered the employer role places un an unnecessary administrative burden on business and any benefits to employers in terms of employee retention were not commensurate with the administrative burden imposed. Uh, this is feedback that has been reflected in my conversations with small businesses here in the ACT. Kate from the Healthy Eating Clinic told me how her small business employing 11 people has seen payroll processing time blow out from half an hour to two hours. And that lost time is precious and adds up. We hear a lot about the workforce shortages, and in many small businesses, it's the owners of those businesses who have to step up and work extra hours to fill, fill the gap. Um, this burden on small businesses will likely increase when hopefully we start paying super on Commonwealth PPL as well. And that means small business will be lo logging onto MyGov, receiving money from the Commonwealth, withholding tax and sending it back to the ATO, processing super, and then sending that on to the super fund and doing this every pay cycle. None of these transactions involve any interaction between the business and the staff members other than a deposit of money and an emailed payslip. But the greater burden risks being a disincentive to employing women, the last thing we want to see with this legislation. Uh, I have been frustrated to hear that we shouldn't take action because it has always been a, pay point, uh, a pain point. Clearly, just because something has always been broken doesn't mean that it shouldn't be fixed. Uh, it's, it's also frustrating to hear that we need to force small businesses to administer this payment as it will preserve their relationship with their employees. Small businesses are likely to be far closer to their employees than medium and large businesses where often in small businesses your staff may also be family, uh, if not technically, then in spirit. And some small businesses may want to administer the payment themselves, and that's fine. We should provide them with the option, recognising small businesses are as unique as the people that run them and require some flexibility. Uh, it is a small piece of red tape that we can start cutting today, and I hope the Senate will endorse my amendment. I also want to join my colleagues across the chamber in urging the government to prioritise changes to extend super to paid parental leave. PPL is currently one of the only types of paid leave for which the superannuation guarantee does not apply. Paying super on PPL would significantly reduce the super gap between men and women. Uh, currently, women retire with nearly 35 per cent less super than men, which is clearly unacceptable and something we need to address. Uh, one last point that I wanted to bring to the attention of the Senate are 
issues with how we are supporting foster and kinship carers. Uh, while this bill contemplates adoption, I want to note that adoptions are generally quite rare in comparison to the amount of children in foster or kinship care. Uh, foster and kinship carers are not entitled to PPL. It has been raised with me that the exclusion of foster and kinship carers from this type of leave actively discourages those carers from taking opportunities to welcome and settle often very vulnerable children into a new home environment and we know how important those early years are for children. One of my constituents has seen the impact firsthand. She was able to take time away from work to spend with a child placed in her care and noted how it promoted steadiness in their relationship which endures today. She also experienced not being able to take time away with another child and experienced a placement uh, breakdown as a result of this. And she, she's raised with this, and me, this with me and, and to quote her, to have those extra weeks to focus on the child, set aside employment pressures, is invaluable to the child or young person to build bonds and attachments crucial to their development. While foster and kinship care is the domain of the states and territories, no payment is offered to help them take time out of their work. Uh, it seems to me that foster and kinship carers are falling between a gap in our federal, uh, state and territory systems and that more can and should be done to assist them in taking time out of work for the benefit of the child or the children that they are looking after. Uh, I urge the government to consider this in more detail and uh, I thank you. I, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise uh, also to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Bill, uh, and I am really proud to do so because paid parental leave is another strong and critical labour legacy. We first implemented paid parental leave back in 2011, and today we are building on those strong foundations to modernise the scheme to make it more flexible for two parents to provide care and to consolidate the current entitlement of 18 weeks parental leave plus two weeks partner leave into a single 20-week scheme. It's a legacy that will improve the lives of Australian families and, of course, of course, there's more to come because this is a first step in the Albanese government's plan to move to expand paid parental leave in Australia. We will bring forward more legislation starting July 2024 to phase in an additional six weeks until we reach 26 weeks in 2026, a full six months of paid parental leave. This is the largest expansion of paid parental leave since we established the scheme uh, more than 10 years ago. And these are the types of reforms that make me proud to be a Labor senator. These are reforms that we lay the foundation for, that we protect, that we build on, that we sustain, that over time become entrenched and treasured parts of Australia's social and economic fabric. These are reforms that Labor governments get done, reforms like Medicare, reforms like the NDIS, reforms like quality affordable education in the early years and expanded access to TAFE and higher education reforms that Labor governments deliver and that we deliver in a sustainable and long-term way. Paid parental leave is widely supported across the community, and this particular bill is supported by the ACTU and by the BCA uh, and many other groups. And the bill's not controversial. In two-parent families, it provides each parent with two weeks of leave, and the rest can be shared as suits the family up to 20 weeks. It can be taken by two parents at the same time. It can be taken in flexible blocks and it can be taken across the first two years of a child's life. Uh, importantly, single parents will be eligible for the full 20 weeks. In two-parent families, the bill resolves outdated assumptions, which meant that in some cases women were unable to take the larger portion of parental leave because they were the higher earner in the family. Combining what is currently 18 weeks parental leave, mostly targeted at mums, 
with the two-week partner pay mostly targeted at dads just makes good sense. Uh, and it is now urgent that this bill passes the Senate this month. That's so that parents expecting to give birth or adopt uh, on or after July 1, 2023, have the option of pre-claiming three months in advance so that they can receive their entitlements as soon as they are eligible. So it's urgent that we pass this reform. Expanding paid parental leave is part of our vision for greater gender equality and for a stronger economy. Uh, and we know that those two things go hand in hand. We know that families, and women in particular, need support to balance their caring and work responsibilities. And we know when parents have the support they need to move in and out of the labour market as their children's needs change, it's good for everyone. It's good for families, it's good for parents, it's good for employers, it's good for productivity, it's good for the economy as a whole. Uh, and it's good for dads. Um, this approach that we're bringing in this bill gives dads and partners more options for sharing in the care, including by also making sure that they can be on paid leave if they're eligible for it through work, while they also receive their take-it-or-leave-it two weeks of the scheme. It's important to note that the government's scheme is not designed to replace employer schemes and, indeed, we encourage employers to keep paving the way and providing greater paid parental leave for their employees. Um, the government scheme is a foundation for employers to build on to make sure that they can attract and retain fantastic employees who become parents and help maintain strong incomes over the life course. Um, we know uh, that when dads can take a greater caring role from the start, um, that can often lead to greater involvement in their children's lives in years to come. And of course, that in turn helps um, women uh, be able to balance their own work and care as well, keep up their own participation in the labour market and improve their own economic security. Uh, and paid parental leave is also, of course, fundamentally good for mums, allowing them to spend time in the crucial early days and weeks of their child's life, which we know is good for both maternal and for child health. So, to sum up, this is a bill that meets the needs of the modern Australian family uh, and the modern Australian economy, and there is more to come from the Albanese Labor government. This is a smart, flexible approach to providing care and support for children after birth or adoption. It's an investment in gender equality and in productivity. Uh, it's another proud Labor legacy as we build up to six months paid parental leave, uh, and I am proud to support this bill. Senator Barbara Pocock. I rise to speak to this bill and to add my support to the widespread support that exists in this chamber, including that of my Greens colleague, Senator Waters. The Greens will be supporting this bill because it represents a step. It's a modest step, but it's an important step, and it's a step in the right direction. But much more needs to be done. 21 years ago, in 2001, I sat at the back of this chamber as a staffer near the senator who introduced Australia's first private members' bill, uh, Senator Natasha Stockton Spoyer, on paid parental leave. At that time, Australian women were alongside the US, the only women in the OECD not to get a paid rest when they had a baby, a hundred years after the ILO said that they should. Anyone who has carried, fed a new baby, been sleep deprived for months and recovered knows how essential that rest is. If Australian men had babies, we'd probably leave the, lead the world on paid parental leave just as we led the world on the eight-hour day in 1856 and set a decent minimum wage at Federation. We were international leaders in creating a working man's paradise, a white working man's paradise, it's important to note, but that paradise did not extend to mothers, and we are still not yet a working woman's paradise. Sadly, it was not until 10 years after that first private members' bill that this parliament finally enacted paid parental leave in 2010 with leave of 18 weeks at the minimum wage, an additional two weeks added later for partners on a use-it-or-lose-it basis. Eleven years on, we have been overtaken by the rest of the OECD yet again. 
with the average period of paid parental leave now around 52 weeks in the OECD and close to full replacement wages in many places. Australia now has one of the poorest paid parental leave schemes in the developed world, and we're now stuck at an inadequate 18 weeks paid leave with two weeks for partners at minimum wage without superannuation, a pay cut for so many people at a crucial moment in a family's life. While I welcome some parts of this bill, including strengthening the use it or lose it provisions and the government's commitment to incre incrementally increase paid leave to 26 weeks by 2026, these provisions are too little and too slow to effectively support Australian parents. And this is why the Greens are seeking to amend the bill to increase paid parental leave to 26 weeks now. Australian parents should not be left waiting for the government to increase the entitlement by miserly two weeks a year until it reaches 26 weeks in 2026, a rate that is still well below the OECD average and best practice. At the Jobs Summit and the Select Committee uh, on Work and Care, an inquiry which I've had the privilege of chairing over the last eight months, and at the inquiry in relation to this bill, Australians and organisations from across the country, parents, women, unions, employers, were united in a call for paid parental leave and for a greater increase. Indeed, the ACTU, who Senator Ayres has referenced in his comments, calls for a pathway to 52 weeks. I urge the government to support our amendment to increase paid parental leave to 26 weeks immediately and to create a pathway to 52 weeks paid leave to bring Australia in line with international standards. Women in our labour movement, Sally McManus, Michelle O'Neill, many leaders, stand alongside and on the shoulders of this parliament as they push to ask for more, to play catch up on this important workplace provision. I also call on the government to support the Greens' amendment to add superannuation to parental leave. Recent data shows that women retire with much less, nearly a third, less savings in their super than men. And we know that periods of paid parental leave and part-time work on return from leave have been a contributor to this gap. Yet last week, Katie Gallagher told people, Australian women, that they need to wait longer until the budget can comfortably accommodate paying women superannuation on top of the parental leave. We have costings that tell us that we could do this tomorrow for the sum of 200 million. It's a small proportion of the budget and it's something that will make a difference to many, many women in Australia. We don't have to wait. We can afford to do it now. It's time the government uh, took action to reflect on its priorities and recognise that supporting women's economic equity is an overdue investment in the future of Australia. There's powerful evidence that improving paid parental leave in these ways will do many good things. It will increase women's participation in paid work. It will address skill shortages. It will increase GDP. It will improve children's development and improve relationships between couples and between kids and their parents. It has a very positive effect on men's health and it will help address gender inequality. I want to finish with a story from the work inquiry. We heard a work and care inquiry. We heard from many individuals around Australia who look for a, a decent period of paid rest at the time of birth. Both, uh, both parents looking for that kind of opportunity. We heard from Suvi, who lives in Sweden and has a 13-month-old daughter. Based on Sweden's parental leave policy, Suvi is planning to take a total of 16 months paid leave and her partner is taking seven. The first 390 days of that leave are generally paid at 80 per cent of a person's income up to a cap. And Suvi said the best thing about this policy is she won't be financially disadvantaged for caring for her child and can return to work part-time. She's appreciated having that time after a very difficult birth and a start with her daughter and the chance, of course, to see her daughter grow, reflect on her life and work after a busy period through the pandemic and to share that leave with her partner. She said that policies like this have created a family-friendly and caring-friendly culture in the workplace for both parents and at all levels of the workplace. And this helps explain the much greater sharing of domestic work that we see over the life course in countries with good lengthy periods of paid parental leave, paid close to ordinary earnings and free childcare, an arrangement which together with paid parental leave gives kids and their families a much better start 
and is associated with a much narrower gender pay gap. This is just the tip of the iceberg of benefits in countries like Sweden in terms of what their paid parental leave policy delivers. At a work and care inquiry hearing, James Fleming, the executive director of the Australian Institute of Employment Rights, explained that Sweden's parental leave policy, along with affordable childcare, uh, have helped Sweden to achieve much higher rates of women's workforce participation than Australia and higher gender equality on many metrics. The institute calculated that if Australian female labour force participation increased to match that of Sweden, overall labour force participation would increase by more than four percentage points, increasing GDP by at least six per cent or as much as $100 billion. Suvi's story and the broader equity and economic advantages Sweden's work and care system delivers is possible for countries like Australia. Those supporting increased paid parental leave, and they are many, know we can afford it. We can afford to increase the length of leave and we can pay superannuation on it. Rather than give a $9,000 tax cut to the very wealthy and each of the 227 politicians in this building, we can direct the $254 billion that's going to be handed out to very wealthy people uh, through the stage three tax cuts, uh, we could redirect that to the parents and the kids who need it most. We should set aside those tax cuts and instead improve paid parental leave and take other measures that will help Australian families deal with the cost of living crisis, including providing free, quality, accessible early childhood education and care. At the Jobs and Skills Summit and through evidence presented to the Work and Care Inquiry and to this bill, Australians and organisations from around the country and parents, women, unions and employers were united in a call for a paid parental leave increase and improvements for Australian parents, especially mothers. No one opposed it. It's time to act. We can afford it and for the sake of our kids, parents, women, workplaces and our economy, it's time we did it. Thank you. Senator Billick. Thank you. I rise to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022. And I'm only going to make a short contribution on this bill as I understand there is some urgency to this. If the bill is passed by the end of this sitting week, it will allow parents expecting to give birth on or after 1 July this year to pre-claim three months in advance. You will notice that the government has decided to include the words gender equality in the title of the bill, because gender equality is at the heart of what this bill is about. As a nation, we need to ask ourselves why there is a 13 per cent pay gap, a gender pay gap, and why women retire with super balances on average 23 per cent less than men. These gaps are closing, but not fast enough. And to address this inequality, we need to address a number of underlying causes. One of these underlying causes is that women, more than men, make the sacrifice to put their careers on hold to care for children. We can see the stark figures in the Australian Bureau of Statistics Head of Household Survey, which in May 2021 showed that 38 per cent of women spent five hours or more on unpaid caring or supervision of children, compared to only 28 per cent of men. The same survey shows that on just about any measure, women take on substantially more unpaid household work than men. Under the paid parental leave scheme, the notion of primary, secondary and tertiary claimants and the requirements that, that the primary claimant must be the birth parent meant that the system was geared towards an expectation that women would bear most of the responsibility for spending time raising their children. The flexibility that this bill provides is for the benefit of both women and men. Many birth mothers would like more opportunity to advance their careers, while many dads and partners would like more opportunity to spend time caring for, playing with and forming bonds with their children. It's about providing the flexibility that parents need to come up with the arrangements that work for their individual family circumstances. But this is also critical for children. From my experience as a parent, but also as an early childhood educator observing other families, I've seen how critical those early months of a child's life are to forming a lasting bond with their parents, regardless of gender. As the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry said in their submission to the inquiry into this bill, and I quote, 
These changes should deliver significant benefits to the economy by boosting women's workforce participation, improving flexibility in the use of paid parental leave, enhancing gender equity outcomes and ensuring businesses continue to have access to a diverse, experienced, productive labour force. So Labor understands that. We understand that with the right set of policies, getting the balance right between giving parents the time they need with their children while maintaining their connection with work is boosting labour productivity, promoting gender equality and also improving development outcomes for children. This is also what we sought to achieve with cheaper early childhood education and care for Australian families. It is not, as one senator in this place once described it, the hand of government reaching in and taking away the youth of our children. I note that the inquiry into this bill showed broad support for the provisions, including from representatives of employees and employers such as the ACTU and ACCI. There were also a number of community groups backing the changes. In this bill, we're extending the shared paid parental leave entitlement from 18 weeks to 20 weeks, and we will go further in accordance with our election commitments. This is just the first point. This is just the first step. The Women's Economic Equality Task Force is currently examining the best model for the expansion to 26 weeks and will provide advice to the government later this year. This is the type of action that Labor takes to help improve the lives of working women and men, and we will continue to assist families wherever we can. Senator Faruqi, are you seeking the call? Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak about the Paid Parental Leave Amendment Improvements for Family and Gender Equality Bill 2022 and associate myself with the excellent observations made by my two colleagues, Senator Waters and Senator Pocock. This bill aims to improve the paid parental leave scheme by making it more flexible, accessible and gender neutral. Currently though, Australia has one of the weakest parental leave schemes in the OECD, both in terms of rates of pay and the length of paid leave. With this bill, things will definitely improve, but we still won't meet international best practice. Increasing the availability of leave from 18 to 26 weeks is an important step forward in ensuring parents are adequately supported in the first few crucial months of parenthood. But why do people have to wait for another three years to get the 26-week entitlement? This should come much sooner, and we should be moving to 52 weeks of paid parental leave quickly as well. As my colleague Senator Waters has said, there is no reason to delay the implementation of good policy. This bill does introduce measures to increase flexibility in how and when paid parental leave can be taken, which will allow families to juggle their work and care responsibilities a little bit better. But to be truly effective, the scheme should really be complemented by other reforms um, to support flexible work. And that means universal and free early childhood education and care. High quality early childhood education and care can give children the best start in life, and it is a critical component of lifelong learning. It will enable women to pursue career opportunities and ensure they aren't held back because this essential service is too expensive or is not available. Time out, for, uh, time out of the workforce and taking on more unpaid labor has significantly contributed to the superannuation gender pay gap as well. And by failing to pay super on parental leave, the government is increasing the risk that certain parents, particularly women, retire into poverty. Women of color are even further impacted because they tend to have significantly lower rates of workforce participation and are generally overrepresented in low paid and insecure work. The Greens also support full wage replacement Paying parental leave at the minimum wage is insufficient and discourages men who are often higher paid from taking parental leave. Uh, and my colleagues, Senator Waters and Senator Pocock, will be moving amendments to fix some of these shortcomings of the government's paid parental leave scheme. I want to now turn to a cohort of people who often fall through the cracks, PhD students. A key shortcoming of this bill is that PhD students are not included in the paid parental leave scheme. 
who despite often conducting research on a full-time basis, cannot access the same parental leave entitlements as other working parents. And I will be introducing amendments to fix this. Currently, PhD students do not qualify for the scheme as their activity is counted at, as study through a scholarship or other award of financial aid, and therefore fails the test in the current Paid Parental Leave Act. I can think of no good rationale for excluding PhD students. As a PhD student who years ago had a baby while doing my research, and a former academic who is passionate about the importance and necessity of research and supporting researchers, this matter is very close to my heart. PhD students are currently eligible for a stipend from their university through funds the, um, through the government's research training program. However, the stipend is a measly $29,863, well below, well below the minimum wage. Universities have the option to top this amount up, but data on 189 universities shows only 42 offer above the government stipend, and none of them meet the minimum wage. In response to a written question on notice asked by Senator Waters during the Senate inquiry on the bill, the Department of Social Services advised that the paid parental leave scheme is intended to support working parents who have demonstrated attachment to the workforce. The department said, should a PhD student undertake paid work in addition to their studies, such as tutoring at a university, this counts towards the work test. Now this is completely unreasonable. It is unfair to expect that every PhD student in Australia has the opportunity to get paid work while they are studying full time and have the time and you know to commit to this work. That is just atrocious. PhD students are struggling. They are struggling to make ends meet amidst the cost of living crisis and rising rents. And in January this year, The Guardian reported that PhD students are barely scraping by, often relying on a partner to survive or being forced to eat instant noodles and work extra jobs during the night. We need to lift government support for PhD students. And we must ensure that they are not put off pursuing higher education because of the high costs of living and the lack of entitlements. We need to increase the stipend and where we, here today we have the opportunity to actually include PhD students in the paid parental leave scheme. So I do urge my Senate colleagues to support the Greens amendments to expand the eligibility of the paid parental leave scheme to PhD students. This amendment does so by including a new entitlement to paid parental leave for someone doing eligible postgraduate work. A person performs eligible postgraduate work if the person is enrolled in a course of study or research for a doctoral degree and performs study or research for the purposes of that course, whether the enrollment is within an institution or the study or research is performed within or outside Australia. So these amendments expand the work test in the Paid Parental Leave Act to include eligible postgraduate work. In November last year, the Minister for Social Services told Parliament that this bill reflects the government's commitment to deliver better outcomes for families and advance women's economic participation. Minister Rishworth also said Australians need a paid parental leave scheme that reflects the needs of modern families. So if Labour is serious about achieving this, achieving gender equity for all and promoting the health and well-being of all parents and children in Australia, it must extend the scheme to postgraduate students. Anything less will be a pretty cruel oversight by the government. Changes to improve paid parental leave and make it more equitable have been a long time coming. Women, women's organizations, women's rights activists, unions, families, and economists have been pushing for this for ages. The discrimination of women at work in the form of diminished responsibilities and lower wages still continues. Improvement to paid parental leave, as are presented in this bill, will hopefully help create more equitable workplaces 
and less disadvantaged for women, and hopefully improve the sharing of care between parents. But it is really time to move beyond incrementalism that is quite apparent in this bill and to make the changes that we need in leaps and bounds. Women, parents and families do deserve more. They shouldn't have to wait for years more for fairness and equity. We've waited far too long already. Deputy President, and I rise today to speak to the Pay Parental Leave Amendment Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022. And once again, this is Labor delivering on its promise to the working families of Australia. And we are delivering two weeks of paid family leave now and will gradually increase it up to a total of six months of paid leave shared between two parents by 2026. Now, this measure will have a demonstrable and beneficial effect on parents who want to spend more time with their children and what can be wrong with that. It also reminds me, as a mother of three myself, where I didn't get any paid parental leave at all in, for the first two, uh, finally got some for the third. And by that stage, we thought um, th th that it, was, it was about time, but it was such a, it was such a struggle. Uh, and it's been a long time getting to this point. Um, I know how precious those first few months are with the remarkable uh, gift of, of, of a child. And care responsibilities are critically important to the healthy life of a child and the family. And I'm proud to be part of a government that acknowledges this and is making real changes. Now, it's really important to think that in so many policy areas, when the Australian people elected for three terms the previous government, there was a huge policy vacuum in this space and a failure to respond to what reality, the realities of Australian people. And I don't think it's a surprise that having so many women sitting on this side of the chamber and our colleagues over in the other place and men who share the parenting very, very significantly speaking up in our caucus about that shared parenting that such a policy has been able to be advanced as a commitment during the election by Labor and now getting on with the job of delivering for Australians so they know that they can trust the government, we've said what we're going to do and we're getting on with doing it. Labor created the paid parental leave scheme and we're expanding it. We're taking a staged and a sensible approach to expanding a scheme. And we have to do that sensibly because of the fiscal reality in which we find ourselves as a consequence of nine wasted years of debt growth by those opposite. Clearly, we have, uh, we're, we're speaking into a time of global economic headwinds and budgetary pressures. From 1 July 2023, the bill is going to deliver six really significant changes, combining the two existing schemes into a single 20-week scheme reserving a portion of the scheme for each of the parents to support them both to take some time off work after the birth or adoption. And it's going to be the case that for some Australian men, you know, they, they, they will be saying, well, how do I do this? And the response will simply be, well, you go to your work and you say that you're taking your leave because you've got childminding responsibilities. And that's going to be a radical departure for some men in particular professions. But this is going to support and encourage that, and we know it's good for families and it's great for children. This bill is going to make it easy for both parents to access the payment by removing the notion of primary and secondary carers. You know, like the reality is, for most working families, you just muck in and get on with it. You don't go, oh, I'm the primary carer today, I'm the secondary carer. You're both the parents. You do the job, and this recognises that. Expanding access by introducing a $350,000 family income test under which people can qualify if they do not meet the 156 647 individual income test. So this is dealing with the reality of what's out there in the Australian population and not trying to pit one part, one type of family against another. It's about getting Australia working and making sure that kids get cared for properly. Increasing flexibility for parents to choose how they take paid parental leave days and transition back to work because it's very different from context to context, from family to family and from region to region. This is uh, the sixth thing that this will do will, is allow eligible fathers and partners to access the payment, irrespective of whether the mother or birth parent meets the income test or residency requirements. 
very important. Uh, it's an extremely important bill, in fact, and it's a very substantial reform. And it's one that's been driven by the Albanese government's deep commitment to the maximisation of women's economic equality. And the economic benefit for the Australian economy that's derived from proper and equitable social policy. Australians need a paid parental leave scheme that reflects our modern Australian families. The expansion to 26 weeks by 2026 reflects the Albanese government's commitment to deliver better outcomes for families and to advance women's economic participation. And in the lead up to the election, the leader of the Labor Party, now the leader of the country, the Prime Minister, was out there stating this over and over. And my colleagues sitting here beside me, men and women, fighting for this reform, standing up for this reform, and it was poo pooed by so many people. And that's the problem. Other countries have been getting on with this job. We've got nine blank years, nine wasted years to make up for when we, when we um, removed the previous government and have established the Labor government. Our changes are not only going to help families better balance work and care, they're going to support the vital participation and productivity over the longer term, providing an immense return on investment for this policy and a huge boost for the Australian economy. It's a policy that addresses the demands of modern life and the realities of modern families. It's a bill that's thorough and successful in achieving what it sets out to do, creating a paid parental leave scheme that truly works for families. And it centres equality and economic growth, not just the principle, but absolutely embeds this in practice. It's going to give more families access across Australia to government support. It's going to provide families with more flexibility and encouraging parents to share the care with a view that supports what we know is just the fair and decent thing, and that's gender equality for all the men and women who are being born and all the men and women who are looking after them together. It gives me immense pride to speak in support of the bill as part of a government which is delivering on its promises, and this will assist the lives of 180,000 Australian families every year. The bill's good for Australia's economy, it's good for our society, and it's absolutely totally intertwined with our success and our future. It delivers for parents, it benefits children. It's good policy by a Labor government that is inspired to do the best thing for Australian people. And for those reasons, I commend the bill to the House. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise today to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment, Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill. And I am so proud to stand here as part of a government which has brought this legislation before us. Yeah, yeah. This is the first major change to paid parental leave since the scheme was introduced by a Labor government more than a decade ago. The first tranche of reforms were groundbreaking and they made a difference to so many families' lives. But in the years since, the need for further reform has been clear. Because as Australian families have changed, as more and more families are seeking to share in the beauty and challenges of parenting more equally, this legislation has not kept up. It hasn't kept up with those changes, those cultural changes happening in Australian families. The changes in this bill are about supporting families, but they're also about supporting gender equity. The changes are about valuing fathers as carers too and, in some families, as primary carers. They're about recognising that men aren't always the breadwinners and that women aren't always doing the majority of the caring. That families make their own decisions about the care arrangements and the work arrangements that will best suit them and their children. Acting Deputy President, this bill modernises the paid parental leave scheme to reflect how Australian families and their needs have changed since its establishment over a decade ago. It does so through a number of ways. The bill combines the two existing payments into a single scheme. It reserves a portion of the scheme for each parent to support them both to take time off after a birth or adoption. And it removes the notion of primary and secondary carers, making it easier for both parents to access the payment. The use it or lose it provisions while modest encourage shared care. And I hope these use it or lose it provisions are something that we see expanded in further iterations of the scheme and as the Women's Economic Equality Task Force continues its work. 
Acting Deputy President, this also expands access to the scheme for families where women are primary earners by introducing a $350,000 family income test. I personally know a number of families who have been locked out of taking full advantage of paid parental leave because of this issue and welcome that the bill better reflects the circumstances of more families in our community. But most importantly, the bill represents one part of a suite of broader policy reforms that our government has embarked upon that will support and the development and well-being of our littlest Australians. Because we know that in those first six months of life, those first six months are absolutely critical to a child's development and future well-being. They're critical to a child's sense of attachment to their carers, and they're critical to the growth of that child as well. Enabling families the opportunity to spend more time with their babies in these crucial early months is a worthy reform, and I welcome the broader policy intent of our government to bring this scheme to six months of paid leave by 2026. Because, Acting Deputy President, as so many of us in this room can appreciate, the first six months with a new baby are an absolutely amazing time, full of joy and delight as each little milestone is met. But my God, they can be a bloody tough challenge too, full of sleeplessness, stress on the family, for women who experience birth trauma or other physical challenges like mastitis, difficulties with pelvic floor damage, the impacts of recovering from caesarean wounds, so many things which can happen in a birth as you welcome a baby into the family. The mental health challenges which many families experience, both mums and dads, in these first six months can be really significant and at times really dangerous. A new baby changes family dynamics with other children. It can make your other caring responsibilities, including for elderly parents, more difficult. It affects the family dynamic. So whilst it can be a time and is a time of miracles and wonder and joy and awe, it can also be really tough. And it shouldn't be the case that the only families in our community who are given the time and the space and security to deal with all of these things which happen in those first six months of a child's life are those who can afford to do so. Bringing this scheme progressively to six months is a very, very significant reform. It's something that we can be proud of. It's something that I am sure proud of as a Labor senator, part of another Labor reforming government. Actually, it's why we joined the Labor Party. It's why we stand for Labor, because we want to be part of governments which do something, which deliver for families, which keep reforming. And that's what this bill does. I want to acknowledge the work of the many, many activists in our community, the union movement, the formidable women of our union movement, men and women of our union movement, actually, who have been calling for these reforms for many, many decades before they have been introduced and continue to lead the fight to greater equality. To the businesses as well in our community who stood up early and came out and said this makes good economic sense as well as good social sense. To those businesses who are at the forefront of many of these changes, I acknowledge their work too. As chair of the committee um, that looked into this legislation, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, I also just want to take a moment to thank everyone who contributed to our inquiry through submissions or through appearing before us and giving their evidence. Um, we were very happy to support this bill, to commend it to the Senate. I know there is more work to do in these reforms. There's much more work that we can do to make life better for Australian families, for mums and dads, and critically for their children. That's why I'm part of the Labor Party. That's why I'm proud to be part of a Labor government, because we will do that work. We will do that work from these benches. That's why we're here. So I commend the bill to the Senate. Oh, thank you, Senator O'Neill. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Smith, sorry. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Paid Parental Leave Amendment, Improvements of Fam for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022. This bill expands and improves the Paid Parental Leave Scheme legislated by the Rudd and Gillard Labor governments in 2010. This bill makes six key changes to the scheme. It combines the existing Paid Parental Leave and Dads and Partners Pay schemes into a single 20-week scheme which provides more flexibility for families to divide their leave as best suits them. It reserves a portion of the scheme for each parent, which ensures that fathers and partners take a fair share of leave and tackles the gen gender, gendered stigma around parental leave. 
It makes, easy, it makes it easier for both parents to access the payments by removing the notion of primary and secondary carers, and again ensuring that both parents are treated as equal partners under the scheme. It expands access to the scheme by introducing a family income test, which families can be assessed under it if they exceed the individual income test. It increases flexibility for parents to choose how they take their leave days. And it enables fathers and partners to access the payments regardless of whether the birth parent meets the income test or residency requirements. This bill delivers a fairer, stronger and more flexible paid parental leave scheme. It delivers a better paid parental leave scheme for 181,000 families around Australia. Like every meaningful workplace right and entitlement in this country, this bill reflects countless hours of work and advocacy by workers and their representatives in the trade union movement. No workplace right in this country was ever handed down freely by the Liberal National Party. It has taken the blood, sweat and tears of Australian workers and their families and unionists. Whether it's the 38-hour week, the weekend, the minimum wage, paid leave, superannuation, job security arrangements, which particularly supports uh, women in the workforce, or whether it be turning around and making sure that uh, pay equity is properly administered and equal pay for women in the workplace. With its aspects of workers' compensation of course, and, of course, paid parental leave, these are all examples of changes and importance in workplaces around our country. It also goes to arrangements like penalty rates, which particularly uh, women in, uh, and people in precarious work or temporary or casual work or part-time work, which is dominated by uh, women in the workforce. You know, those areas where people were going to be Slashed, uh, penalty rates were slashed and burned under the previous government. You know, so these areas are areas that the Labor government has been pushing to make sure are rectified. And examples, of course, the Liberals get back into the government, but they'll undermine and attack them again. But just in the last few years, we've seen the Liberal attack penalty rates. We saw the Liberals attack superannuation. We saw the Liberals happily stand by while gig companies like Amazon exploited workers and undermined basic workplace rights. We saw the Liberals abolish all minimum standards in the road transport industry. We saw the Liberals intervene in court cases on behalf of labour hire companies to strip paid leave entitlements from casual workers. And just a few months ago, we saw the Liberals in opposition oppose the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill. And what was in that bill? The Liberals opposed making gender equality an objective of the Fair Work Act. The Liberals oppose strengthening the right to request an extension of unpaid parental leave. The Liberals oppose strengthening the right to request flexible work arrangements. The Liberals opposed making it easier for workers in low-paid, feminised industries to bargain for pay rises. And the Liberals opposed prohibiting sexual harassment in the Fair Work Act. These are all protections introduced by this government at the end of last year. And the Liberals and their mates fought it tooth and nail in a few recalcitrant employer groups, employer unions. And every time the Liberals get in, workers go backwards. Because the Liberals have always been, and the Nationals have always been, the party of the bad business, not good business, that have made many of these changes in conjunction with its workforce, with their representatives, often represented by unions. And every time a Labor government is elected, we see the Australian middle class grow, whether it's workers or good employers who want to do the right thing by their workers. Labor is the party for the middle class. Now let's take pay, pay, paid parental leave as a case in point. In 1973, it was the Whitlam government that first introduced maternity leave for public sector employees and banned discrimination against employees who became pregnant. In 1979, unions successfully argued that maternity leave in the maternity leave test case, which extended that unpaid maternity leave to all permanent employees in the private sector. In 1985, unions won unpaid adoption leave. In 1990, the unions won the parental leave test case. And in 1993, 
the Keating government enshrined unpaid parental leave as a workplace entitlement in legislation. But during that long, dark years of the Howard government, while universal paid parental leave became common across the OECD, Australian workers went backwards. Rather than paid parental leave, they got, we got work choices. During this time, many unions fought for paid parental leave to be added to enterprise agreements. But while unions led the charge on parental leave, the Howard government was attacking the rights of workers to join unions and to be able to successfully argue for those changes across companies and across industry sectors. And in doing so, Howard attacked the rights of workers to access paid parental leave schemes. Now, I remember while I was a New South Wales Secretary of the Transport Workers Union, we were winning paid parental leave for truck drivers in agreements in the late 90s and early 2000s. And we were publicly attacked by people like TUE's John Law's host at the time for, being, for going soft. Well, thank goodness going soft is something that's recognised that we should all be doing as a community, not based on gender, hopefully, unfortunately, uh, not based on politics. By the time the Rudd and Gillard governments legislated paid parental leave in 2010, Australia was the only two OECD countries without a universal paid parental leave scheme. That is where the Howard government left Australian families. With one of the two most anti-family workplace relations systems in the developed world. And now, after another decade of Liberal government, another decade of Australian workers going backwards, this Labor government has inherited a parental leave scheme that has slid back being the second worst among comparable OECD and EU countries. And again, every time the Liberals nationals sneak in, they send workers backwards, they send families backwards. And every time a Labor government is elected, we repair the damage done to Australia's middle class. And of course, this bill is just the first step in strengthening our paid parental leave scheme. Later this year, the Albanese government will introduce legislation to expand paid parental leave from 20 weeks to 26 weeks. Another big step towards the Australian families. Another step forward. And we should aspire to and continue to improve the scheme. I note the submissions by the Australian Council of Trade Unions and the Shop Distributive Allied Employees Union calling for the scheme to gradually be extended to a full year of paid parental leave, 52 weeks, and increasing the rate of pay. They've also called for the scheme to be expanded to all workers, regardless of their length of service, including those on temporary or fixed-term contracts. Now, just as we've seen for a century, the trade union movement is always at the forefront of driving positive workplace reforms that benefit the entire community. And just as we see, have seen for a century, the advocacy and campaigning of the union movement is often so successful that even the Liberals are ashamed of supporting positive workplace reforms such as we're seeing today. That's why they're so, so hard to destroy unions and to stop workers and their representatives and working families coming together to have a representation at, and a voice at work. Now, they make workplaces in Australian society fairer in unions. They make our middle class stronger. And for the Liberals and Nationals, the party of the employers, the employers that want to rip people off, there is something that will, they will never support. But I'll tell you what, good companies do support it, good employers do it, and good politicians make a difference. We'll continue to drag the Liberals and Nationals kicking and screaming into the 21st century. And part of the way of doing this reform and, and bringing into the 21st century is making sure there's a programs that actually benefit, because this is actually also a productivity opportunity and an op assistance to employers as well. Because the employer's role can help parents in, in, uh, with regarding the mandatory nature of these benefits. The employer role helps parents stay connected to their workplace while on leave, leading to the benefits of business including increased retention and reduced training and recruitment costs. And crucially, the employer role also supports women's workforce participation. We know that time out of the workforce due to caring responsibility is a key driver of the differences between men and women's economic outcomes. Keeping women connected to their employer while on parental leave is intended to encourage women to return to the workforce 
have that productivity boost and opportunity across our community, but also reduce employee turnover and in turn reduce the lifetime earnings gap between men and women. And of course, part of that program is by also supporting employers of all sizes. Services Australia will ensure information available to employers is updated to reflect the changes in this bill. This includes Services Australia website for all employers, which provides information on what employers need to know about the paid parental leave scheme and detailed information about how to register and manage their role. Other resources available include the Parental Leave Employer Toolkit, which is a handbook maintained by Services Australia since the scheme's introduction. And of course, Services Australia also provides a dedicated phone service for employers who require assistance in registering their business online or to ask help about their obligation under the scheme. Services Australia staff who operate this phone line will receive training about the changes in this bill. This is a change for all Australians, a change that will boost productivity, participation and fairness in our workplace and an opportunity for employers to further advance a good workplace. Thanks, Senator Sheldon. Senator Polly. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Paid Parental Leave Amendment, Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022. Again, it gives me great pleasure to speak on a bill which is delivering on the Albanese Labor government's election commitments and a bill that advances women and gender equality in this country. This bill will make life better for over 180,000 families. It will ease the cost of living pressure being felt by all Australians because it's a bill which serves families first. And again, it's the Labor government that introduces these social changes. Businesses, unions, experts and economists all understand that one of the best ways to boost productivity and participation is to provide more choice and more support for families and more opportunity for women. We on this side of the chamber, we understand obviously so much better what the value of women are by those on the opposite benches. The Pay Parental Leave Amendment Improvements for Families Gender Equality Bill 2022 will support women's workforce participation while helping more dads and partners to take time off work to be with their children. I know the benefits firsthand when my husband and I had to, um, not by choice, but reverse the roles. And I understand the true benefits of the bonds that dads can have with their babies and with their children, which sets them in good stead for a fantastic life experience going forward. Now, we said during the last year's budget that we would deliver cost of living, um, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, expanding paid parental leave, more affordable housing, and we will get wages moving again. These changes take effect from July 2023 and will deliver a single paid parental leave scheme with a flexible 20-week entitlements for working parents. I'm delighted about what this will mean for mothers and parents in my home state of Tasmania. It means greater flexibility, efficiency for parents. It's a child-friendly and it empowers women and girls to be the best versions of themselves. Around 180,000 Australian families take up this benefit each year, and they will now be able to share the entitlement in a way that best suits their circumstances, what is in the best circumstances for their families. The changes will enable either parent to claim parental leave, pay first, and access the entitlements in multiple blocks as small as one day with periods of work in between. A new family income test of $350,000 per annum will also see nearly 3,000 parents become eligible for the expansion of paid parental leave. Pending passage through this place, the changes come into effect for parents whose children are born or adopted from July 1, 2023. Parents can pre-claim up to three months before the expected date of birth or adoption, so there is no delay in receiving payments. Pre-claims under the improved system will open from the end of this month. 
This legislation is an important first stage of our major reform of paid parental leave scheme and lays the foundation for expansion to 26 weeks by 2026. Not only will the government's reform help families better balance work and care, but will also support participation productivity over the longer term, providing a dividend for the Australian economy and communities across Australia, which in other words means that women can step out of the role as the uh, parent um, and re-enter well, they still got to be a parent, but having that full responsibility by going back into the workforce to enable them to continue developing the important skills, which will help them build uh, a stronger economic outcome for them through their working life. Crucially, the bill will give more families access to government payment, provides parents greater flexibility in how they take their leave, and encourages them to share that care responsibility. It's great for families right across this country. Therefore, the bill delivers six key changes, combining the two existing payments into a single 20-week scheme, reserving two weeks of the scheme for each parent to support them both to take time off work after the birth or the adoption. Simplifying the claims process by removing the categories of primary and secondary carers so it's easy for parents to access the payment. Expanding access by introducing $350,000 family income test under which people, including single parents, may qualify if they do not meet the 156,647 individual income test. And fifth, increased flexibility for parents to choose how they take their paid parental leave days and transition back to work. And sixth, allows eligible fathers and partners to access, access the payment irrespective of whether the mother or the birth parent meets the income test of residency responsibility. It is fundamental that this bill passes the parliament by the by this month, by the end of March, so the parents expecting to give birth or adopt on or after the 1st of July next year have the option of pre-claiming to receive their government entitlement as soon as they are eligible. Labor will introduce further legislation to progressively increase the pay parental leave scheme from July 2024 until it reaches 26 weeks in 2026 a full six months. This is the largest expansion since Labor established the scheme back in 2011, something that parents of my generation never had access to. This will be such a good fundamental change for families, for parents and for their children. I echo the Minister for Social Services, Amanda Wishworth's words, and I quote, we know what happens when both parents are not supported to take time off paid work to care for their babies. Usually mum works much less or leaves the workforce altogether to take on caring responsibilities while dad remains in full-time work. This pattern persists for years after the child's birth and is a key driver of gender gaps in workforce participation and earnings. I urge everyone in this place to support this bill. This bill will support women. It will help remove that uh, issue that many women face when they become mothers, having to choose between being the parent who's the full-time carer or giving up their opportunity in the workforce. So the reality of having both parents being able to share in that caring role is so important. It provides relief around the cost of living. It also strengthens the bond between the parents and provides women the opportunity to return to the workforce if they want to, earlier than they might otherwise have done so. And as I said earlier, the bond that is developed between parents in those first very important months and years cannot be underestimated in terms of setting the foundations for the relationship that children have 
with both parents. I think if I was um, frankly honest in this chamber, I'd say the fact that my husband became the, the carer and the homemaker meant that the children actually much preferred my husband to cook, and in fact they, they still do when I'm being blatantly honest about this. So those relationships are terribly important. But I think the other benefit is what it does for women in terms of being able to establish and maintain their skills and their place within the workforce. We know that there are too many women of my generation and beyond who don't have enough superannuation to be able to retire on. This will help solve that issue. It's not the only thing that we need to do because we still need to increase superannuation for all Australians. But I see such great benefits for the families in my home state of Tasmania, the relationships that are going to be stronger, the bonds are going to be better, productivity and the economy is going to be stronger, skills in our workplaces will continue to grow because women won't feel that they have to step away from paid employment. And again, it's a Labor government, a Labor government that steps up to introduce legislation to ensure that both parents get the support to develop the bonds and to share those caring responsibilities. Again, we've had 10 years, almost a decade, of inaction on behalf of the former Liberal government. And it's sad that you have to wait till there's a Labor government to ensure that these social changes are introduced. So I urge those on the crossbench and those on the opposite side in opposition to actually vote for this important legislation, and I commend this bill. Senator Farrell, please sum up the debate. Thank you, um, Deputy, uh, President. And I start my contribution by uh, seeking to uh, submit a correction to the explanatory uh, memorandum. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, I thank all those who have contributed uh, to this important debate on this bill, including uh, Senator Polly, and uh, uh, she gave a very personal account of the importance of this uh, legislation to her family. Um, improving paid parental leave is critical uh, nation-building reform. The Albanese uh, <coughs> government knows this, and we know that paid parental leave is vital for the health and the well-being of parents and their children. We know that investing in paid parental leave benefits our economy. And we know that, done right, paid parental leave can advance gender equality. We heard these messages loud and clear at our successful Jobs and Skills Summit in September, where gender equality and economic reform went hand in hand. Businesses, unions, experts and economists all understand that one of the best ways to boost productivity and participation is to provide more choice and more support for families and more opportunity for women. That's why paid parental leave reform was a centrepiece of our first budget with an additional half a billion dollar investment in the scheme. Paid parental leave is a proud Labor legacy and the Albanese government is building and expanding on that legacy. A number of government and non-government members who have spoken to these reforms over the course of this debate shows how important this issue is to many Australians. We have wasted no time delivering on our budget commitment. The changes in this bill modernise paid parental leave so that it's the right time uh, and uh, right uh, for the future. We know dads and partners want more time at home with their baby. <clears throat> My uh, oldest daughter is expecting our third grandchild in the uh, next week or so, so um, 
I can uh, fully uh, understand um, that dads and their partners do uh, do want to spend um, uh, more time with uh, particularly a new baby. And we know parents want flexibility in how they choose to take leave and trans transition back to work. We know the current eligibility rules are unfair to families where the mother is a higher income earner. Our bill fixes the, those problems. <clears throat> it gives more families access uh, to the payment, provides parents more flexibility in how they take leave and encourages them to share uh, care to support gender equality. From the 1st of July 2023, this bill will improve paid parental leave by combining the two existing payments into a single 20-week scheme, reserving two weeks of leave for each parent to support them both to take time off work, making it easier for both parents to access the payments by removing the notion of primary and secondary carers expanding access to around 3,000 more families each year by introducing a new $350,000 family income test, expanding access to around 1,500 more dads and partners each year through a new, simpler claiming process, and finally, increasing flexibility for parents to choose how they take government paid leave and transition back to work. It's critical that this bill passes both chambers by the 9th of March to ensure that parents expecting to give birth or adopt on or after the 1st of July uh, 2023 have the option of pre-claiming their entitlements three months in advance. This bill implements the first part of the government's budget measures. We will separately bring forward legislation to progressively increase the scheme uh, from July 2024 until it reaches 26 weeks in July 2026, a full six months of leave. This is the largest expansion of the paid parental leave since Labor established it in 2011. Our half a billion dollar investment reflects our government's commitment to improve the lives of working families, support better outcomes for children and advance women's economic equality. I'd like to take to, uh, this opportunity to thank uh, the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee for their work conducting the inquiry into the bill and preparing such a comprehensive report. And uh, special thanks to uh, Senator Marielle Smith from South Australia for her significant contribution as chair of that uh, committee. The inquiry heard <clears throat> from a diverse range of voices, including employer bodies, unions, family advocates and general equality experts. I'd also like to thank the many organisations and individuals uh, who took the time to prepare submissions on the bill and the witnesses who appeared before the committee to provide their evidence. As many of the submissions and witnesses noted, the bill is a crucial step towards a parental leave system that empowers the full and equal participation of women. We were pleased to see the submissions overwhelmingly supported uh, the measures contained within the bill. We were also pleased to see the committee's finding that the reforms proposed by the bill will deliver better outcomes for parents, children, employers and the economy, and the bill achieves its overarching objective to create a more, fle more accessible, flexible and gender-neutral paid parental leave scheme for Australian families. The Australian Human Rights Commission and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, amongst others, welcomed the move towards gender neutrality, removing the presumption that women are always primary caregivers. The National Foundation for Australian Women also endorses the changes, stating that they send an appropriate signal about the direct importance of the role of fathers and partners in the lives of newborn. Other submissions uh, welcomed uh, the expanded eligibility, especially through family income test, which uh, will uh, ensure families with equivalent incomes are treated the same regardless of which parent is the higher earner. 
the Diversity Council, AI Group and the Australian Institute for Family Studies welcomes this change, as well as the changes that enable eligible fathers and partners to claim parental leave uh, pay <coughs> even when the birth mother isn't eligible. I also want to uh, highlight the support for the increased flexibility under this bill. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, in particular, noted that these provisions will support parents to manage work and care, support gradual returns to work and help parents maintain an ongoing connection to the workplace. I note that there were additional comments from coalition senators. I acknowledge these points uh, uh, that they raised about ensuring businesses are supported to understand the changes to the scheme. And I'd like to assure senators that Services Australia will make sure information and support is available to those employers. I note uh, in the committee's report the Greens made uh, additional comments welcoming the changes and making further recommendations that the bill be amended to include superannuation on paid parental leave, expand the scheme to 26 weeks from 1 July uh, 2023 and ask the Women's Economic Equality Task Force to inve investigate uh, rates of payment. In response to these additional comments, I want to make it clear that the Albanese government is firmly committed to increasing the scheme to 26 weeks by 2026. The government committed half a billion dollars in the October budget and we will legislate it by July 2024. This is the largest investment in the scheme since Labor established it in 2011. Our approach to expansion allows us to make important uh, structural uh, reform in a difficult fiscal situation. We are responsible economic managers and we need to address the inflationary pressures in the economy and that requires us to be very prudent about any expenditure. We're also committed to getting the settings right to maximise women's economic equality. The government has asked the Women's Economic Equality Ta Task Force to, uh, for advice on the optimal model for a 26-week scheme. The task force, made up of independent experts and cha chaired by uh, Sam Moyston AO, is currently considering the right mix of use it or lose it weeks and flexible weeks. Following consideration of the task force advice, the government will bring forward legislation to expand the scheme to 26 weeks by 2026. Regarding payment uh, of superannuation on paid uh, parental leave, the Treasurer, the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance and the Minister for so Social Service have been very clear. When we can afford it, we would like to do it. Our first priority has been improving how PPL is structured and expanding uh, the number of weeks. That's our priority, but we will continue to work on issues around pay inequality. The key driver of the gender gap uh, in superannuation uh, is gender pay gaps in working life and the Albanese Labor government is investing in a range of policies that support women's workforce participation and earning potential. Regarding the rate of pay, the Productivity Commission recommended it be based on the national minimum wage rather than the, the proportion of previous earnings. This approach balances the need to provide support to parents with the cost of the scheme to taxpayers. Payment at national minimum wage also means that every family welcoming a new child receives the same financial support. And the government um, does not have plans to change that. It is worth noting that the changes in this bill mean that from the 1st of July this year, eligible parents will be able to cl um, claim government paid leave at the same time as any employer paid leave. This will make it easier for families to maintain their income while caring for their newborn. Under the current scheme, this option is already available to mums but not to dads. Uh, during the inquiry, we also heard some concerns <coughs> from the Greens about the current work test rules, including for people with short or inconsistent work histories uh, and full-time students. While there are no changes to the work test as part of this bill, the current rules are designed to be flexible and are accessible to casual workers, 
temporary workers and workers on short-term or fixed-term contra contracts. We have heard some questions uh, from senators about the potential for administrative burden on small business. I would like to assure the uh, senators that uh, in designing the changes, the government carefully considered impacts on business. This legislation does not change the employer role in any way. Evidence provided to the committee's inquiry demonstrated that the more flexible scheme will actually benefit employers and employees without any additional administration, uh, administrative burdens on businesses. Existing legislation requires employers to administer government-funded parental leave pay to eligible long-term employees. Services as Australia <coughs> provides the payment to employers in advance uh, of them uh, passing it on to their employee in accordance with the employer's normal pay cycle. This employer role helps parents stay connected to their workplace while on leave, leading uh, to benefits uh, for business, including increased retention and reduced training and uh, recruitment uh, costs. Crucially, it also supports women's workforce participation, and we know that uh, <clears throat> time out of the workforce due to caring responsibilities is a key driver of the gap between men and women's economic outcomes. I remind senators that to reduce administrative burden, employers are not required to administer the payments when employees take their government uh, paid leave days in continuous blocks of less than eight uh, weeks. Uh, I'm pleased to, uh, <coughs> that our changes have been warmly welcomed by business. In their submission uh, to the committee's inquiry, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry said that they strongly support uh, these changes which should deliver significant benefits to the economy by boosting women's workforce participation, improving flexibility <coughs> in the use of paid parental leave, enhancing gender um, equity outcomes and ensuring businesses continue to have access to our diverse, experienced, productive labour force. Again, I thank uh, all senators for their engagement on this important issue and I commend the bill to the Senate. There is a second reading amendment standing in the name of Senator Waters and Senator Pocock. I'm, I'm going to put the question. I put the question that the second reading amendment be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against? No. no. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
the doors. The question before the Senate is the second reading amendment standing in the name of Senator Waters and Senator Pocock. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator McKim and teller for the noes Senator Scar. Honourable Senators, there being 12 ayes and 31 noes, it's passed in the negative. I understand that there are amendments proposed. Oh, no, I must put the question in the second reading first. Uh, I put the question that this bill now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. I understand there are amendments to the bill. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to paid parental leave and for related purposes. We yes. will now proceed to committee. Honourable Senators, with the concurrence of the Senate, the statements of reasons accompanying the requests circulated for this bill will be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate. There being no objection, 
It is so ordered. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There be no objection. It is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Waters, you have the call. Thank you very much, Chair. And before moving to the Greens committee stage amendments, I'd just like to ask the representing minister a handful of questions. We just saw the chamber vote against paying superannuation on paid parental leave entitlements. Now, this used to be Labor policy, and the minister even quoted the relevant minister in his contribution, saying, "When we can afford it." We'd like to do it. So this is a government crying poor, and women are missing out because of that poor judgment call. So my first question to the representing minister at the table is, firstly, super used to be your policy on PPL. Why did you just vote against it? Minister. <coughs> Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator. Waters for um, her, uh, her question. Um, <clears throat> I can remember when <clears throat> superannuation was limited to a very small number of people, generally males, generally in uh, white collar occupations and uh, more specifically in managerial roles. Um, and it was under the leadership of um, Paul Keating, <coughs> uh, with, particularly with uh, Bill Kelty, um, as part of um, <coughs> the development of the accord uh, to deal with some of the economic problems that this country faced um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that they developed the concept of, of universal um, superannuation. Um, <clears throat> so, to be honest, Senator Waters, I'm not going to be lectured by the Greens um, about. I'm not. I'm not going to be lectured by the Greens uh, about um, the role that the Labor Party has played in creating um, the current superannuation scheme. Uh, in <clears throat> developing that scheme, in protecting uh, that scheme from all of the things uh, that uh, the Liberals and Nationals uh, would have done to it <clears throat> in, um, in government if they'd had their uh, chance. <clears throat> now, um, if we fast forward from the time where um, uh, Keating and uh, Kelty developed the concept of universal superannuation. It's now <clears throat> a scheme that is the envy of the entire world. There's no other country uh, that has a better superannuation scheme than, uh, than Australia. Uh, and that's been, <clears throat> that's been because that combination of Labor governments working in conjunction with the uh, uh, the union movement in, in this country to develop what is a world-class superannuation scheme. Um, and why are we here today? Well, we're here today because that terrific uh, minister, uh, Minister Rishworth, uh, has brought forward uh, this uh, uh, this bill to <coughs> expand to uh, expand the availability of. Um, uh, paid, uh, paid parental uh, leave, uh, and um, that's what we um, are, are doing here today. Now, unfortunately, when we came to unfortunately, unfortunately, when we came to office, what would we, what would, did we discover? Now, I want to put this into some perspective. Um, when the when the Gillard government lost in 2013. Um, we had a national debt of around $300 billion. Uh, when Anthony Albanese became Prime Minister um, nearing 12 months ago now, what, well, you asked the question, you asked, you, you asked the question Senator Ciccone. We, had, we, have, we have a debt of $1 trillion. Now, I'm not sure how, $1 trillion, $1 trillion worth of debt. So, in the nine years that the uh, Conservatives were running this country, 
uh, into the ground, we trebled our debt from $300 billion to a $1 trillion. Uh, and that's the economic circumstances. That's the economic circumstances in which uh, we, we find ourselves. Um, so what has the government done? Well, it took a policy to the last election in respect of paid parental leave. We took a policy and we told the Australian people what it was that we were going to do in terms of paid, paid parental leave. What was the first thing we did in our first budget to implement uh, that policy? We did exactly what we said we were going to do. We did exactly what we said we were going to do. Um, and that's what we're asking uh, the Senate to do on this occasion. The bill, the bill has passed the House of Representatives, um, and we're asking the um, Senate now to say, look, <coughs> we accept that you went to the last election with this uh, proposal. Um, here it is for you to vote on. No more, no less uh, than uh, what, we would, uh, what, what we said we would do. And we're asking all of the people in this place to support what we took to the Australian people uh, last year at the, uh, the, the, the election. Now, of course, <coughs> there's a whole lot of things a Labor government would like to do. Um, and this uh, proposal by the, the Greens is just one of the many things that Labor and government would like to do. Now, can I say this, Senator Waters? We intend to be a long-term Labor government. Not, not one term, not two terms, not three terms, but four terms. No, we intend, no, there's no arrogance there. There's no arrogance there, Senator um, Henderson. Um, we intend to be a long-term Labor government. Uh, and that's the way, long-term, long, long, no, no, no. No, no, not two more years not two more years, we intend to, uh, over, over time, uh, build on the terrific work that the Labor government has done in the past. <laughs> How many more years? Look, I can't tell you, I can't, I, I can't forecast, I can't forecast, I can't forecast just how many years, but I know that under Anthony Albanese, we intend to be a long-term Labor uh, government. A long term, a lo no, no broken promises. No, we, we have we we took our paid parental leave policy uh, to the people at the last election. They're endorsing it. We've put it into our budget. We've now put it through the House of Representatives. Our job as senators uh, is to say, well, okay, we're we're doing the final the final step. Um, if we could do everything we wanted to do, if we had an unlimited amount of money then there's a whole lot of other things that an Anthony Albanese uh, Labor government uh, would like to do. We're, at this point, doing what we said we would do. Uh, and as uh, I said in my um, uh, summing up speech, there are other things that we want to do, and there will be other things that we will do in the future. But, Senator Waters, we are the government. We were elected by the people uh, to govern this country. We took a set of policies uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the people. They endorse those policies, uh, and what we're here to do is to implement those policies. That's what we'd like this uh, Senate to do, and we'd like you to be part of that. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Chair. We're just sticking with super briefly before we uh, move to our other detailed amendments. The former government commissioned a uh, retirement income review, which costed paying superannuation on paid parental leave at a mere $200 million. Now, that was for 179,000 recipients. I understand that the, uh, we're up to about 181,000 recipients now, so it's possible that that $200 million cost might have increased by one or two million. So my question, uh, representing minister, given that you say um, you'd like to do it when you can afford to do it, did you recost how much it would cost the budget to pay superannuation on paid parental leave? Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, <coughs> uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Waters for 
uh, her uh, question. Um, we don't have an updated cost. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you. So from that, I can infer that it, you're relying on the $200 million cost and you're making the active decision that the women of Australia are not worth $200 million to pay superannuation on their paid parental leave, which, despite the fact that that was a 2019 election promise by the then Labor opposition. Um, I'll be moving some committee stage amendments in due course, and in fact, I might, um, I might move to do that now. Um, so I'm going to move uh, slightly out of order on the grey, and I'm going to move uh, uh, request one to five on sheet 1819 by leave together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. And I might just make some very brief remarks before asking a handful of questions. Um, Australia is the second worst country in the OECD for paid parental leave equity. That is an embarrassment, and today is an opportunity to redress that. International best practice for paid parental leave is 52 weeks. It's not a measly 20 weeks. It's not a three-year wait to get to 26 weeks. It's 52 weeks. And not only that, it's got structured use it or lose it provisions, and it's got higher rates of pay. That's international best practice. Now, if this government were to axe the unaffordable and unnecessary stage three tax cuts for the very wealthy, it could afford to fund a decent paid parental leave scheme that might even put Australia towards the front of the pack of the OECD, rather than being the second worst of comparable developed nations. Uh, I still don't understand why they're making that decision to not prioritise women. Um, and as uh, my colleague has said in another instance, they're uh, robbing Peter to pay Peter. Um, but in this case, they're just giving yet more money to Peter, and it is Peter that's benefiting because, of course, the men are the mostly uh, those who will be in favour and uh, benefiting from the stage three tax cuts. So rather than sticking with that, you could actually um, give some money to women, lift the minimum wage, you could pay super on PPL, and you could increase the number of weeks that paid parental leave is uh, given to new parents, and you could uh, ideally do it at replacement wage or at least look at different models that gets it close to replacement wage. Um, since none of that is happening, uh, the amendment today that I'm moving um, on sheet 1819 is to bring forward this promise of 26 weeks. Now, the, the minister, when speaking uh, in his closing speech, said that they're going to legislate that next year. 2024, and it's going to kick in in 2026. Why are you making women wait? This is good policy. It is a step along the way to, I hope, a 52-week uh, paid parental leave ultimate policy, which the ACTU and many other women's groups have been pushing for for years, a move that the Greens would support. Why are you making women wait three more years? Are you crying poor again? I mean, it just, it's just not plausible to cry poor when you're handing out those stage three tax cuts. People see right through that. They know you are making an active decision to make women wait for three more years. They're not going to like that, I can tell you. So our amendment would make sure that um, new parents, and women in particular, can get the benefit of that increase to 26 weeks right away from the 1st of July this year, not in three years' time. I commend the amendment to the chamber. Does any honourable member wish to make a contribution on the amendments moved by Senator Waters before I put the question? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Waters for her contribution. Well, I totally reject the proposition that uh, the Labor Party uh, doesn't think uh, women are worth um, $200 uh, million. Um, in fact, <clears throat> this proposal that we are bringing forward um, is significantly more than that amount of money. Um, and the government uh, has committed half a billion dollars in the October 22-23 budget to expand uh, the paid parental leave scheme to 26 weeks by July 2026. This is the largest investment in the scheme since Labor established it in 2011. <coughs> now, it's all very well. Senator Waters, all very well to grandstand and <clears throat> accept everything that the Labor Party does and say, oh, but that's not enough. You've got to go further. You've got to go further. Um, we, 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 took, we took a policy. We took a policy to the last election 
I accept that that was different than the policy we took at the previous election, but we all know, we all know what happened at the previous election uh, to a range of our policies. Um, and so we've taken this policy. Um, you want a grandstand. You want to say, look, <clears throat> I'm going to accept everything that the Labor Party is putting forward here, but to embarrass the Labor Party, we're going to say uh, we need to go further than that. Well, that's easy for you to do uh, with respect, uh, Senator Waters, but you don't have the responsibility of managing the, uh, the budget. This government does, and this government will be a responsible, long-term uh, Labor government. Now, um, <clears throat> through this bill, we are making immediate improvements. So, immediate improvements to the current scheme by increasing flexibility and fairness from the 1st of July 2023. Uh, we will legislate um, uh, a staged expansion with the scheme increasing by two weeks each year from July 2024, reaching uh, 26 weeks in July 2026. Our approach allows us to make important structural reform in a difficult fiscal situation. And I reported earlier the economic mess, the economic mess that we were left by the people over this side, where they trebled, trebled our national uh, debt. But we are making responsible economic uh, decisions, as we always will. Um, our approach uh, allows us to make important structural reforms uh, in this uh, difficult uh, situation by expanding this <coughs> scheme to 26 weeks from the 1st of July 2023 uh, would have obviously a significant impact on the budget and it would cost more than $1 billion over the forward estimates on top of uh, half a billion dollars we are already investing. We are responsible economic managers and we need to address the inflationary pressures uh, that in the economy that require us to be prudent uh, about any expenditure. The government has asked the Women's Economic Equality Task Force for advice on the optimal model of a 26-week scheme. The task force, made up of independent experts and chaired by uh, Sam Moyston, is considering the right mix of use it or lose it weeks and flexible, <coughs> flexible weeks to maximise women's economic e equality. They will provide advice to the government by mid-year. Following consideration of the task force advice, the government will bring forward legislation to expand the scheme to 26 weeks by 2026. So I'd urge all uh, senators, including Green senators, to focus on the bill in front of them and the benefits uh, to a uh, 180,000 families each year. Um, as I said before, it's critical that this uh, bill passes both houses by the 9th of March to ensure parents expecting to give birth or adopt on or after the 1st of July 2023 have the option of pre-claiming parental leave three months in advance. It's my intention to put the request to the committee. Any other contributions? I put the question. The question is that the request one to five on sheet 1819 by leave together in the name of Senator Waters be agreed to. Those with the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. No. I have a division required. Ring the bells.
The question before the chair uh, is at request one to five on sheet one eight one nine by leave to move together by Senator Waters that the request be agreed to, the request for amendments be agreed to. Those of the question passed to the right of the chair, noes left of the chair, I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Cadell for the noes. Senators, there being 12 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Chair, I um, seek leave to move amendments 1 to 11, Greens amendments 1 to 11 on sheet 1828 um, together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. You have the call. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, as I said earlier in my second reading speech, a key shortcoming of this bill is that PhD students are not included in the paid parental leave scheme, who despite often conducting research on a full-time basis cannot access the same parental leave entitlement as other working parents. Um, so currently the PhD students don't qualify for the scheme because their activity is counted as, as study through a scholarship or other award or financial aid and that blocks them out of this act as it stands currently. And there is no good reason for this, and this has to change. So the Greens amendments actually go towards changing this um, by including a new entitlement to paid parental leave for someone doing eligible postgraduate work. Um, so a person performs eligible postgraduate work, and this is what the amendment does, if the person is enrolled in a course of study or research for a doctoral degree and the person performs study or research for the purposes of that course. Whether the enrollment is within an institution or the study or research is performed with or outside Australia. The amendments also expand the work test in the Paid Parental Leave Act to include eligible postgraduate work. So if we are actually serious about achieving gender equity and promoting the health and well-being of all parents and children in Australia, then the, the scheme must extend to PhD students, because anything less will be a gaping oversight by the government. 
Um, I commend the amendment and move the amendment. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, uh, thank you uh, Chair, and thank Senator Faruqi for her um, contribution, uh, but indicate that the government uh, continues to uh, oppose uh, this uh, amendment. And um, uh, can I say this, that uh, I don't think there's ever been a government in the history of this country that's so committed to achieving uh, gender equity. I just look at my colleague here, <coughs> Senator Gallagher, uh, and the wonderful work that she's been doing um, in every aspect of this uh, government's uh, decision-making process. But um, <coughs> I guess I'd start by reiterating my, my, my earlier comments. Um, we went to the election with a, with a proposal. Um, that proposal was endorsed by the Australian people, and we're here today to, um, to implement that uh, proposal. Now, the work test supports the intent uh, of the scheme and provides financial support to working parents who have uh, an attachment to the workforce. Therefore, P PH, uh, PhD students who are not also engaged in paid employment are not eligible. The current work test is flexible enough to encompass workers in both full-time and part-time employment and workers on casual, temporary or fixed-term contracts. <clears throat> to meet the work test, a person must have uh, performed qualifying work uh, for 10 out of the uh, 13 months prior to the birth or the adoption of their child and work for at least uh, 330 hours in that 10-month period. Uh, with no more than a 12-week gap between consecutive working days. The hours work requirement equates to just over uh, one day a week. A person is also considered to be performing qualifying work on a day uh, if they have taken a period of paid uh, um, leave of at least one hour. Should a PhD student undertake paid work in addition to their studies, such as tutoring at university, this could count towards uh, the work test. Um, and just from my knowledge of this area, I'd say that there was a lot of uh, PhD students who uh, would fit into that uh, category. <coughs> PhD students uh, who are employed at the university may also uh, be eligible for the university's paid parental leave scheme for employees. Uh, many PhD scholarship programs offer paid parental leave to eligible students who have held their scholarship for at least 12 months. Of Australia's top 20 universities, 16 provide paid parental leave to students on PhD scholarships at an average of 12 weeks. A PhD student who is not eligible for um, paid parental leave may be eligible to receive the newborn supplement and the newborn upfront payment. The government also provides significant funding and support to students. Uh, in October 2022-23 budget, cost of expenditure on higher education at $44.63 billion over four years, including $485.5 million over four years for 20,000 additional Commonwealth supported places at universities and other higher education providers. Does any honourable member have a contribution, further contribution? Otherwise, I intend to put the request in the name, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. I will put the request. I put the, re the question that the request 1 to 11 on sheet 1821 by leave together, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Two eight. Uh, my eyesight. Uh, be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. no. I think the no's have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
I'll tell you what, this session there. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the request 1 to 11 on sheet 1828, moved by leave together by Senator Furuki, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the eye, Senator McKim, and teller for the nose, Senator Cadill. Senators, there being 12 ayes and 29 noes, it is passed in the negative. We have two further amendments on the grey sheet. 
uh, in the name of Senator Pocock. Uh, David. Senator Pocock, are you seeking the call? Senator Pocock, uh, Senator Pocock D, yeah, you have the call if you wish to move your amendment. Thank you, Chair. At, at this stage, I will not be moving uh, my amendments um, after some discussions with, with the government around. Can I make a brief statement? Or? Yeah. No, you, we were still in committee. You can. You okay. have uh, yeah. no, ten minutes to speak. Nine forty-four. Great. Um, be a proper politician. Um, I, I've raised the concerns around the burden that this is going to place on small businesses. I accept that there is an argument for medium and large businesses to maintain the interaction and the connection between the employer and the employee in administering PPL. But in my discussions with small businesses, small tweaks to payroll can result in not insignificant time. You know, even a half hour, an hour, two, two extra hours to do payroll adds up if you're a small business. In 2010, this was raised by small business groups and small businesses. 2014, there was a Senate uh, committee hearing on this and it was raised again. I don't understand why we can't address this. What I'm proposing to government is 12 months to set up a system where small businesses can opt in or can opt out of this requirement, to, to give them the flexibility. Should they be topping up PPL, as some small businesses are, and they want to administer it, they should be able to do that. But they shouldn't be forced into a situation where they have to take on this extra administrative burden, particularly as we begin to increase paid parental leave in Australia, which, I, which I'm fully supportive of. You know, the evidence is so clear uh, that this is a good thing for uh, children and for, for parents, for families and, and for, our, for our community. So this is something that I really would like uh, dealt with by the government. I would like small, small businesses um, to be heard and would, would really like to know from uh, the government and the department uh, in coming up with these changes which small businesses uh, and small business peak bodies were consulted. Senator Waters. Oh, sorry, was that a question? Uh, I've Senator got the call. Thank you. I'll just make a brief contribution. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Look, I'm pleased to hear that Senator D. Pocock um, will not be moving his amendments. We had some concerns that the effect of those amendments, whilst well-intentioned to, to try to relieve the administrative burden on small business, which we're you know, conscious of as well, we had concerns that the effect of those amendments would be to further sever the connection between the workplace and a new parent. Uh, so our concerns were uh, this is a workplace entitlement. We seek to strengthen that relationship and the whole point of having paid parental leave is to make sure that that connection to the workplace is maintained and that women's economic participation after the birth of a child can continue and that they are supported and encouraged to go back into the workforce um, when they so choose. So just placing on record that um, we would not have supported those amendments and we're pleased uh, that they're not being moved today. Senator Rustin, um, I intend to move um, amendment um, one. To, oh, sorry, amendments one to ten on sheet one eight three two together, and in doing so. Sorry, Senator Rustin, you need leave. Oh, I seek leave to move the amendment. Is leave granted. Yes. Mm -hmm. Leave granted. So Senator I, I um, seek, but sorry. So I move amendments one to ten on sheet one eight three two um, together, and. And I thank um, Senator Pocock for raising this really, really important issue um, in relation to the administrative burden on small businesses. Um, you know, this uh, you know, uh, pay clerk function of the PPL scheme is something that we have uh, long supported to 
remove the, uh, the unnecessary red tape that is associated with the administration of this really important initiative um, that has got the bipartisan support of or the multipartisan support of this place. Um, we certainly um, believe that you know, small businesses and stakeholders and industry groups um, generally don't support the um, employer role uh, in, the pay, in the administration of, of PPL payments um, because it actually adds a burden to what is already um, a, a very onerous um, life as a small business operator in this country. Um, so I also commend um, Senator Pocock for allowing the 12-month period um, to enable um, a lead-in, which should provide time for Services Australia to be able to arrange the necessary back-of-house processes uh, necessary to implement this change. Uh, so um, uh, the coalition want to put on the record that we will always support anything that reduces compliance burden placed on the engine room of our economy, which is small businesses. And accordingly, we will be supporting this amendment and thank Senator Pocock for moving it. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chair. Um, can I uh, say that I uh, thank uh, uh, Senator David Pocock for the constructive uh, discussions that have gone in the last uh, hour or so, uh, and that um, in terms of uh, uh, those discussions, we'll continue uh, those discussions uh, and uh, ensure that um, the basis of those uh, discussions uh, will, will be implemented. Um, it is remarkable that um, Senator Rustin <coughs> now jumps up to move Senator uh, Pocock's uh, amendments, because if this was such an important issue and the um, opposition was so concerned about small business, then why didn't they move these um, amendments themselves uh, in the first instance? And uh, I think that is the $64 question. I think I do have an answer to that because um, although Senator Rustin and her <coughs> um, colleagues in the coalition talk the talk on uh, small business, they never ever walk the walk. And we've only had to see what has happened, particularly, let's take the Bellarine Peninsula. What happened to small businesses in the tourism industry uh, during, during the pandemic? You didn't care an iota. You did not care one iota. You Anderson. never, ca you never cared one iota about those small businesses. So um, suddenly, suddenly, Senator even though. H Henderson. Senator Henderson, uh, the senator uh, should be heard in silence. Thank you for that protection, uh, <coughs> Chair. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I make the point that. Um, you can't believe the coalition when they say they are remotely interested in helping small business. There's only one party in this country that's going to help small business, uh, and that is the Australian Labor Party. We're the only party that is interested in helping small, small business. Small business. Well, listen, listen, Senator Henderson. I'll take this. I'll take. I'll take this inter <coughs> interjection. I, I talk Senator to businesses. Henderson. I talk to businesses every single day, day and night, every day, every weekday, and every weekend. And the message they're giving me, Senator Henderson, is they like what they see with the Anthony's, the Anthony Albanese Labor government. They like, they like what they see because they know, they know that not only are we, are we a pro worker government, but we're also a pro-business government. You can do both. You can do both. You can help workers in this country, Senator as we are doing with this legislation, and you can help businesses. And of course, uh, what we've done with this piece of legislation is do exactly that: help workers uh, and help businesses. Now, the role of employers in the uh, paid parental scheme uh, is not changing under this bill. <coughs> employers play an important role in maintaining a connection uh, to work for parents, uh, and particularly women, uh, taking time off to care for children. Roughly five million Australians work in small businesses with fewer than 20 employees. In designing the changes, the government carefully considered impacts on business. The government has made sure that with this bill, employers don't face any new regulatory burdens uh, when paying parental uh, paid paying paid parental leave. 
Evidence to the Senate committee inquiry on this bill demonstrate that our changes, particularly the increased flexibility, will benefit employers and employees without any additional administrative burden on businesses. Did you hear that, Senator Rustin? I'll repeat it for you because I know you weren't listening. <laughs> Evidence to the Senate inquiry uh, on this bill demonstrate that our changes, particularly the increased flexibility, will benefit employers and employees without any additional administrative burden on business. Throughout the Senate inquiry on the bill, no submissions or witnesses raised the mandatory employer role uh, as an area of significant concern. Not even by the peak body representing small businesses, the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia. We know that nearly 40 per cent of businesses who administer paid <coughs> um, parental uh, leave pay to their employees uh, cho choose to do so. They opt in even though they were not required under the legislation. Businesses uh, administer paid parental leave. Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, administer paid parental leave because it's a workforce entitlement, not a welfare payment. It was the Productivity Commission that recommended businesses uh, administer PPL payments so that mothers maintain a connection with their employee while on leave. Taking this approach means that women are more likely to return to work and employee turnover falls, which is obviously good for business, particularly small business. Clearly, concern about the employer role is not a unanimous viewpoint. The Minister for Social Service, who is doing a terrific job, <coughs> I have to say, has offered uh, to work with Senator Pocock to investigate the issue and see if there are um, a need to find solutions. Uh, and, um, uh, of course, today we have committed to uh, support uh, a, a reference uh, to a committee uh, and agree that uh, we consult with Senator David Pocock on the terms of reference for that uh, reference. Uh, we're bringing forward another bill on PPL prior to July 2024 to implement the expansion of the 26 uh, weeks. Uh, this provides an opportunity to consider findings from the consultation process. We are very willing to consider what improvements can be made, but we uh, don't agree uh, to a change that may have unintended negative consequence consequences including for mother's connection to work. Um, we need a clear understanding of the issue and the implications of uh, any change before it's enshrined in legislation. And of course, uh, our uh, reference will, uh, will do this. Uh, the Australian people and prospective parents deserve nothing less. Thank you. Any further uh, Senator David Pocock. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for, for that. I'd, if you could just briefly outline who the department consulted with from the small business community in, in drafting this, um, this bill. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Pocock, for his question. Uh, small businesses, and in particular <coughs> COSBOA, were made aware of the Community Affairs <laughs> Legislative uh, Committee. Because Boa did not. Uh... Senators, senators, can I just remind the chamber that interjections are disorderly. Senator Farrell uh, should be respected and heard in silence. Senator Farrell, please continue. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that protection. Because um, uh, Boa uh, did not, but we are happy um, to understand their concerns and work with Senator Pocock to understand their issues. Any further speakers? If not, the amendment is Amendment 1 to 10 on sheet 1832, that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. All of those against, no? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that amendments 1 to 10 on sheet 1832 moved together by leave by Senator Rustin be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the ayes, Senator Askew. Teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. Passed in the negative. Does any senator have a further contribution on the bill? Otherwise, it's my intention to move that the bill stand as printed. Senator Rice. Sorry. Your phone wasn't on. Oh, thank you, you, Senator Rice. It's my intent. Does any other senator have any further contribution on this bill? President. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Chair. Yep. Uh, the, when you called the division, your microphone oh, sorry, wasn't on. My apologies. On. My apologies. It being, it was passed in the negative. It being, being 29:34. Yeah, my apologies. Does any senator have a further contribution on this bill in committee stage? Otherwise, it's my intention to move that this bill stand as printed. No senator has indicated they wish to speak. I put the question that the bill stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. I put the question. Those the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Honourable Senators, the committee has considered the paid parental leave amendment improvements for families and gender equality bill 2022 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. The committee be adopted. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a third time. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to paid parental leave and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day No. 2, Higher Education Support Amendment, Australia's Economic Accelerator Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate. Uh, oh. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Deputy President. 
no acting Madam Deputy President. It is with great pleasure that I speak on this bill today as the Shadow Minister for Education. The Coalition Government supports this bill, which is the reintroduction of measures introduced by us which lapsed at the election. On behalf of the Coalition, I thank the Government for proceeding with our bill, which supports our world-class researchers, universities and our industries to deliver for our nation. My former colleague, the Honourable Alan Tudge, as the previous Minister for Education, undertook a review of the government's significant investment in research to identify ways in which we could drive greater benefits for our economy. This work looked at the research undertaken here in Australia by some of our brightest academic minds and the potential to support these ideas through the commercialisation phase. What we discovered was that whilst we undertake world-leading research and publish more than 100,000 academic papers, we don't do a lot with those beyond the initial exploration. The ideas generated at universities are incredible, and we are renowned around the globe for inventions like the electronic pacemaker invented by Dr Mark Lidwell and physicist Edgar Booth in the 1920s, the use of penicillin by Australian scientist Howard Florey in 1939, the black box flight recorder invented in the 1950s by Dr David Warren, which is now installed on every aircraft, and the cochlear implant by Professor Graham Clark developed in the 1970s, which to date has been used on about 750,000 people across the world, absolutely changing lives. The list goes on, but these inventions alone demonstrate how we can assist Australian researchers to translate their amazing ideas into commercial applications to meet Australia's and the world's greatest challenges. This will not only highlight Australia's incredible research on the world stage, but also provide a boost to our productivity, create jobs and the industries of our future. This translation element was a key component of the Coalition's $2.2 billion university research commercialisation package and is the subject of the bill before us today. Our university research commercialisation package outlined key initiatives to reform Australia's research commercialisation landscape across four key areas. These are by placing national priorities at the core of Australian government funded research, by using priority driven schemes to ramp up commercialisation activity, by delivering university research funding reform to strengthen incentives for genuine collaboration with industry and by investing in people who are skilled in university industry collaboration. Thank you, Senator Henderson. It is 1.30, so you will be in continuation. And we shall now proceed to two-minute statements, and I will call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I, I rise to provide a two-minute statement about Labor's proposed super changes. My speech will take no longer than two, year, two, two minutes, but somehow it will still be longer than Labor's so-called conversation about super reform. I've had conversations about the weather that have lasted longer than Labor's so-called conversation about, about super. Deputy President, the issue with this conversation and the whiplash that Australians are feeling from the announcement of this brain burp from the Labor government is the realisation that this is yet another broken promise by Labor. And not just a normal broken promise, promise, this is a supersized broken promise, and it is a raid on working Australians. A bit, a bit rich coming from those who don't support young Australians seeking the choice to access super to purchase their own homes. Labor's mindset is obvious. They think that your super, your money, they think that your money is their money. They think that your super is their money to spend when their pre-existing stash of other people's money runs out. 
the coalition will never shift the goalpost on Australians like this. Labor promised no new taxes before the last election. And yet, what do we get? A tax on your super. And Labor will continue to lower the threshold. The Grattan Institute, that well-known right-wing conservative think tank, said that within 30 years, one in 10 Australians will be hit with, with this new super tax. And this represents 200 times the number of people that Labor is fessing up to slogging with this tax. Sure. Labor are like some sort of demented, bewitched, balmy Robin Hood, going around people's bank accounts, robbing from normal Australians and giving it to their, to their crazy ideas and trying to stitch up this government, a government who are robbing Australians. Shame, Labor, shame. Thank you, Senator, for your contribution. Senator Stewart. Thank you. On Friday, I joined Jed County at Preston High School and got to speak to a bunch of students, mothers and grandmothers about International Women's Day. We discussed, we discussed equality and equity in the context of, context of International Women's Day and what it means for First Nations women. It's so fantastic to see the strength of these women and their intelligent considerations of equality. And great to be having conversations with a bunch of women about the difference between equality and equity. And I, I travel around Victoria, I get to speak to so many women across our great state. And I'm in awe of the calibre of women that we have. And I want to give a shout out to a couple of uh, women who I've had amazing conversations with recently. Gina Rushton, Izzy Oderberger, Karen Pickering, who I discussed the complexities about motherhood with on Friday at a panel and talked about uh, the, the range of considerations that women make before they decide to have a baby and all the challenges that we experience uh, once we do. I want to give a shout out to Daphne Yaram at Uwinna Wernalong Hearing Ser a Healing Service in East Gippsland, who does incredible work. Her service does incredible work with the Aboriginal community out that way, um, with domestic violence, with sexual assault, with a whole bunch of things um, to support the healing of the community out there. The team at the Bouvery Centre, campus of La Trobe University, um, Annie Dyker, Jen McIntosh, Barney Maloney, Robin Latham, Fiona McElwain and Kerry Proctor. And to the to the fantastic young women I met on Friday, while I am so absolutely um, you know, cup full talking to these incredible women, we still have a, a, a long way to go when it comes to equity in our country. And we must continue to work to make sure that First Nations women and women of colour in our country are treated uh, with care and the respect Thank they deserve. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the absolute shame and horror of what is unfolding in the uh, Fox News court case in America right now. We know for a long time that the Murdoch machine has not been trustworthy in this country, but now we see through confidential uh, court files just how much power this corporation wields, just how much power this Murdoch empire is willing to use against their political opponents. Last week we saw shocking revelations that showed Fox News knew that claims that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump was plainly false, untrue. Yet time and time and time again, Fox News presenters continued to peddle and platform the lie. And if that wasn't bad enough, Madam Acting Deputy President, there was also confirmation in these documents that Fox News was acting as part of Trump's own campaign when confidential information involving and about the Biden campaign's ads were directly handed to Trump's people. What is going on at Fox News, Madam Acting Deputy President? What is going on inside the Murdoch machine? is not journalism. It is political propaganda. It is the promotion of lies, the promotion of conspiracy theories, and all in the pursuit of power. Australians in this country have known for a long time that this rag of, or collection of Murdoch rags, the rubbish that is spewed out on 
Fox News and indeed on Sky News is false, and that's why we need a royal Thank commission. You, Senator. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, with this government, the devil is always in the detail, and that's what we'll find as we dig into their broken promise on superannuation. Already, once the guidance has come out on how this is going to be applied, we see how the devil in that detail will have a devastating impact on farmers and small business people. The Self-Managed Super Fund Associ uh, uh, Advisors Association has warned that the new rules undermine the long-standing principle that capital gains are not taxed until after they are realised. RSM, a leading accounting firm for the bush, has said that the impact on asset-rich, catch-poor businesses such as farms and small regional businesses will be particularly hard. We're taxing income that's not yet been earned. Everyone out there should think about that for a moment. We're taxing income that has not yet been earned. For farmers, for small businesses, particularly in outer metro and regional areas, self-managed super funds are a logical and completely legal place to put property assets, to put the assets of their business, such as farming land, such as the premises which a professional might work out of, such as uh, a retailer's uh, 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 office space uh, or a manufacturing business in the bush. These are often held completely legitimately in super funds, and they are the businesses that are going to be hit by Labor's broken promise. Thank you. Senator Smith, Mario, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 28 February marked Rare Disease Day. In Australia, approximately 8 per cent of Australians are currently living with a rare disease. That's about 2 million Australians. There are some 7,000 rare diseases that we know about. And according to the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, about 75 per cent of these diseases affect children too. Up to one in 12 babies are born with a rare disease. Now, anyone with a rare disease or who cares for or loves someone with a rare disease knows that late diagnosis or inappropriate treatment are two frequent consequences of how little is known about many of these diseases. Often a family's doctor will be ill-equipped to deal with the specifics of a particular rare disease. Rare diseases are often not well understood by workplaces or by schools, leaving those suffering without adequate and necessary supports. Structural issues are also significant, including in getting the right support services from government and the NDIS. And often there are not enough established support networks for those who have received a diagnosis. I want to commend today all those in Australia working to support those in our community suffering from rare disease and the people who love them. In particular, I want to acknowledge the incredible advocacy of the Rare Fine Foundation, of which I am proud to be patron, which is fighting for children with Tay-Sachs and Sandoff diseases and their families. Acting Deputy President, those suffering from rare disease in Australia need our support. Too often, they feel unseen and overlooked, and this has to change. Thank you. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Last month, we welcomed our first grandchild, a boy. And I thank the Senate for that leave of absence. Observing the world that my grandson has been born into, he will need to fight the same battle for female equality that his grandparents fought two generations ago. The world has turned full circle, seeking now to limit and erase the concept of biological women with the perverse argument that this is gender equality. It is not. In 2021, the Senate passed my motion banning use of anti-woman hate speech, including chest feeder and uterus owner. The public service blatantly ignored the Senate's will and kept using hate speech anyway. No surprise. The ongoing robo-debt Royal Commission shows our bureaucrats are now a Soviet-style nomenclature. The self-appointed former Soviet-era elites, self-interested, unaccountable and willfully ignorant of the cruelty they dispense. Last November, bioethicist Anna Smender of the University of Oslo proposed in the journal Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics to keep women alive who are medically brain dead and use them as baby incubators for women who choose not to carry their own child.
Colombian politician Jennifer Pedraza responded, quote, women are not utensils to be thrown away after use. Women have human rights. Why do we have to remind the left that biological women have human rights? This is the second time that university academics have raised this idea. Sick minds in academia are now degrading women from uterus owner to uterus custodian. The Australian's list of 25 top LGBTQ influencers include 12 biological men, plus six biological men, now something else, and only seven biological females, 18 to seven. Scotland allowed biological men identifying as women to be housed in women's prisons. Biological women identifying as men were not given the same right. Women have less rights today than do men identifying as women. One Nation will continue working to stop biological women being erased. We are one community, one Thank nation you, of two equal agendas. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Today I want to raise the plight of thousands of Australians who became severely ill or died after being infected with blood-containing hepatitis C or HIV between, between the 1970s and early 1990s, before proper screening procedures were introduced. To quote Charles Mackenzie, himself a victim of the scandal and who has led a 30-year fight for justice on behalf of Australian victims, this is the worst public health scandal in Australian history. People have died. Children have died. This was not an accident at all. End of quote. Charles is sick of burying his mates and watch others suffer. Victims say they are yet to receive targeted financial assistance or an apology from the federal government despite those measures being recommended by a Senate inquiry in 2004. Many of the victims uh, were infected through contaminated blood transfusions, including a baby from Melbourne that acquired HIV. An estimated 1,750 were haemophiliacs, a condition which hampers clotting of the blood, treated with contaminated blood products manufactured by CSL before it was privatised by the then Labor federal government. Substantial compensation schemes are operating in a string of countries, including Scotland, Ireland and Canada. The UK infected blood inquiry began in 2018 and is being led by former High Court Judge Sir Brian Langstaff. He is examining thousands of documents, including those that relate to Australia's response to the disaster. I call on the Australian government to apologise to the victims of this scandal and provide proper compensation to them. Senator Ayres, you Thanks, have the call. Uh, um, Acting Deputy President, um, koalas uh, were declared endangered uh, in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT, but regional communities are working hard, uh, particularly uh, in New South Wales, to, to uh, deliver change and to deliver assistance. The Mid-North Coast is home uh, to some incredibly industrious and important environmental groups, and I was lucky enough to be able to announce support to them in my last trip to Port Macquarie. The federal government proudly provided over half a million dollars in funding to the Yalagir Biodiversity Alliance Incorporated, the Dorigo Community Nursery Incorporated and to Nambucca Land Care's Coordinating Committee, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, land care organisations and community environment groups working together to map endangered communities, restore critical koala corridors and plant over 5,000 habitat trees. These projects are run almost entirely by volunteers. It was terrific to spend the morning talking to representatives, including Sally Hunter, Nadia Kamada, Ainsley Ashton and Sue Salvin, uh, from those organisations. And it was also wonderful to meet with uh, Sue Ashton and the whole team at the Port Macquarie Koala Hospital, who kindly hosted us. You know, following uh, the last period of uh, significant infections that have damaged uh, koalas. Habitat, uh, habitats being destroyed, uh, the bushfires. Uh, there are severely depleted uh, koala populations uh, in those eastern states, and it is wonderful to see the commitment of those communities to restoring koala habitat. It's pretty hard to imagine our grandkids uh, and their kids are facing a future without the koala, uh, and I'm very pleased that the federal government's been able to put its shoulder behind the wheel uh, behind this important endeavour. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wish Wilson. Nearly 20 years ago, in March 2003, I was the most angry I've ever been in my life when I realised my country was participating in an illegal, immoral, 
war of aggression on another nation. I wasn't alone. Hundreds of thousands of Australians and millions of people around the world marched in some of the biggest protests ever recorded in history to stop the illegal invasion of Iraq by the so-called coalition of the willing. Well, the 20th anniversary of that shameful and catastrophic invasion is the weekend after next. And I will be speaking at a call for peace rally in Melbourne at the State Library at 1 p.m. on Saturday, the 15th of March, and then again on Sunday, the next day, on Parliament Hound lawns at 11 a.m. in Hobart. There will be other rallies around the country. And while we rightly condemn the Russian government for their ongoing invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine, let's not forget that only 20 years ago we did exactly the same thing to another nation. The United Nations at the time said it was an illegal war, a contravention of the UN Charter. It was, by any definition, a war of aggression that led to the loss of millions of lives, not just directly from that conflict, from the rise of ISIS and global terrorism, to the Syrian civil war, to the flood of refugees, the, human, the wave of human misery that washed across Europe as people fled an in unstable Middle East. It's time to reflect on that, because I wonder what we've learned, and there's a lot of things we need to do to change the way we approach Thank war you, powers Senator, in this country. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Barrett. For three years, we have been censored, cancelled, ridiculed for simply questioning the science. The truth always comes out one way or another, and the floodgates, well, they have opened. We're now being exposed to so much truth that it makes one wonder how many lies from authorities were ignorant, how many lies from authorities were ill-advised, how many lies were deliberate. This week, the, the uh, Murdoch-owned news.com.au published a damning article titled 10 Myths Told by COVID Experts Now Debunked. One, natural immunity offers little protection compared to the vaccinated immunity. Lie. Masks prevent COVID transmission. Lie. School closures reduce COVID transmission. Lie. Myocarditis from the vaccine is less common than from the infection. Lie. Myocarditis is in fact six to 28 times more common after the COVID vaccine than after infection in young males. Young people benefit from a vaccine booster. Lie. Vaccine mandates increase vaccination rates. Lie. They are human rights abuses. COVID did not originate from a Wuhan lab. It's a conspiracy theory. Lie. It was important to get the second vaccine dose three or four weeks after the first. Lie. Data on the bivalent vaccine is crystal clear. Lie. It was tested on eight mice. Well, at least it wasn't seven mice. So that's a win, I guess. One in five people get long COVID. Lie. Now tell me why the Prime Minister has not yet called for a royal commission into our pandemic response, our authorities have caused damage. They've made errors on a scale that is impossible to comprehend. We must learn from these mistakes. We must not repeat them. Justice must be served. We need a royal commission. The UAP calls for one now. Thank you, yeah. Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Little. Thank you. Everyone here would have slept with a roof over their heads last night. I share with you now, with the permission of this family, a story of a family who didn't. This is a cruel, eye-watering example of a family being invisible but living in plain sight in Alice Springs. In Alice Springs, for around two years, a family has endured living on a concrete slab where temperatures are either 40 degrees in summer or minus figures in winter. No roof, no toilet, no running water. In those conditions is a young woman with renal failure requiring dialysis three times a week. It's the reason they went to Alice Springs. There are also nine children. The school-aged children actually go to school. I watched them get on the school bus. They are visited too by a family member with profound disability in a wheelchair. The family does not drink or gamble. They are not a consequence of the grog war in the NT. But like the Swiss cheese model, they are a casualty of what in this case is a seemingly unaccountable service delivery model. 
This family's terrible, unsafe, cruel predicament must inform future responses, especially in light of the hundreds of millions in financial and resource investment intended for Central Australia. There are lessons here for service delivery, accountability, responsibility, transparency in other areas across Australia. It's not always about the money. It's about how that money is managed. They didn't need a voice. They needed bureaucrats, service providers to not drive on, but to take action necessary to end their terrible predicament. Meanwhile, today, yes, today, they remain on that slab. This is not their shame. The shame is that every single night that passes, they are still on that slab, and we, as Australians, haven't seen the necessity to act to ameliorate Thank this you, situation. Senator. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Walters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Last year, at least 61 women were killed by violence in Australia. That's more than one woman per week. Already in 2023, at least six women have been killed. We've all heard these figures, but we need to keep saying it out loud. The government does not maintain a real-time record. That work falls to volunteer organisations like Counting Dead Women. But it is work that must be done. Acknowledging these murders is essential to keep this epidemic of violence at the forefront of the minds of the people in this place, people who have the power to do something about it. We welcomed the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children, and we're keen to see those detailed action plans, including a standalone, self-determined plan for First Nations women. Those plans must be fully funded if we are to see real change. We need frontline services to support women experiencing violence. We need more prevention programs, more crisis accommodation, more resources for legal advice and counselling services, more recovery programs. We know that frontline services need $1 billion each year to meet demand and help all women who need them. We know this because they keep telling us, and yet the sector remains underfunded and the violence persists. If this government is genuine about ending gendered violence in a generation, action needs to start now. The upcoming budget is a critical opportunity to invest in women's safety, commensurate with the scale of the problem. This government must fund, fully fund frontline services so no woman is turned away. What better spend could there be? The sector has said time and time again they need $1 billion a year to meet demand. They are not able to help everyone who reaches out for help, and that is why these numbers of murders are so stratospherically high. We need to fix this problem. It starts with investment in prevention programs, in education and in making sure those frontline services are fully funded. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise in solidarity with the Bangala traditional owners who are in the federal court today to overturn the decision to construct a nuclear waste dump on their lands at Nupundi near Kimba on South Australia's Eyre Peninsula. The Bangala have spent years fighting the ministerial declaration from the former coalition government to place the nuclear waste dump on their land. Despite saying that the decision for a radioactive waste dump location will not go against the wishes of the local community, that's exactly what the government is doing. First former coalition governments and now the Labor government. The Bangala weren't even consulted on the nuclear waste dump on their land. The government only conducted a survey of residents in the Kimber Council area, but not all traditional owners live there. Those who have taken care of the lands for thousands of years were not even consulted. You say that you're our mates you don't, and you're ignoring traditional owners about what they want and don't want on their country, Labor. Shame, shame. The Bangala were even refused access to their land to undertake a proper heritage survey at Nupundi and the former coalition government tried to remove their right to a judicial review. If this government is serious about First Nations rights, which we, you say that you are, you say that you want a voice, well, what about the TOs who, are, who have tried to tell you that they don't want this dump there? What about their voice? What about their voice, Labor? 
You're not serious. It needs to adhere. You need to adhere to the rights of the thank Bungala you, Senator, people. Your time's expired, Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Now we know there's always a healthy competition between Australia and our, our friends across the Dutch in New Zealand. And uh, one such competition is shearing. Shearing is a massive sport in New Zealand and they are very good at it. Um, in six decades of competition and over 460 competition, individual competitions, only 11 people who were not from New Zealand have won. And this year, a teenager from Gaduga in the Brewarrina Shire was the first Australian winner in more than 50 years. Tyron Cochran, good on you, mate. Uh, Tyron went to New Zealand with the support of the First Nations Development Program based out of Dubbo, known as Ready, and has been honing his skills over five weeks, working with a New Zealand contractor as well as competing. Uh, before going to New Zealand, Tyron had barely ever travelled further than the 450-odd kilometres from Gaduga to Dubbo. Uh, the Ready Deputy Chief Executive Michael Cooper is rightly proud of Tyron and uh, said for him to qualify just for the final was a major achievement, but for him to win was an absolute cherry on top. But Tyron wasn't the only winner from Team Ready over in New Zealand. While Maringal teenager Jolie Orcher came third in the junior wool handling final, and she is also a gun shearer. These two Indigenous teenagers have done us, their nation and their communities so proud. Keep beating the Kiwis at their own game. Keep uh, going strong for it, Team Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Thank you. The COVID pandemic highlighted Australia's vulnerability at the end of global supply chains and put on display the consequences of a decade of coalition government neglect for Australian manufacturing. This neglect was one of the key things that people in Queensland and across Australia raised with me throughout the last couple of years. Australians want to be a country that makes things. In a resource-rich country, Australians want us to be making more things onshore. They want Australian-made ideas and products to be recognised and sought after all over the world. And they want Australia to see the economic benefit that comes with supporting our manufacturing sector. That's why Australians turfed out the decade-old coalition government and voted for an Albanese government that was committed to rebuilding our manufacturing sector. Right. Starting with the establishment of the National Reconstruction Fund, a significant investment in manufacturing capability in our country. My home state of Queensland has always played a significant role in manufacturing capacity on the back of the resources industry, and this creates good, secure jobs in many parts of the state. The National Reconstruction Fund will see more investment in projects in regional Queensland across areas like critical minerals, transport, agriculture and renewables. It is so disappointing that this opposition have sought to oppose this important legislation. Incapable of vision, incapable of nation building, they have learnt nothing from the last election result. But the Albanese government is committing to a future made in Australia and one that we are committed to delivering on as well because we know the jobs and economic benefits that come from investment in manufacturing and it is an Albanese uh, Labor you, government Senator that will Chisholm. deliver. The time for this debate has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement uh, regarding shadow ministerial arrangements. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, I advise the Senate that, following the resignations of the member for Clare and the member for Aston from the uh, front bench and uh, the Parliament, respectively, and the Honourable Darren Chester has been appointed shadow minister for regional education, shadow minister for regional development, and the shadow minister for local government and territories. Senator the Honourable Sarah Henderson has been appointed Shadow Minister for Education. The Honourable David Coleman, MP, has been appointed Shadow Minister for Communications. And that Dr Anne Webster, MP, has had the role as Assistant Shadow Minister for Regional Health added to her responsibilities. I seek leave to table the revised Shadow Ministry list and representing arrangements and to have them incorporated into Hansard. This leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank, thank you, Senator Senate. Birmingham. We now move to question time and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer. 
Will superannuation account holders affected by Labor's new doubling of the super tax be able to withdraw funds that are above the new threshold without penalty? Good question. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, 64, actually. Uh, Madam President, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about Labor's uh, changes to superannuation and well to the. Um, Very well supported to the changes that we announced last week, making a modest adjustment to superannuation tax breaks for earnings on balances above $3 million, uh, a change that won't come into effect until after the next election, meaning that uh, for those people who are in the fortunate position, the 0.5 per cent of people who are in the fortunate position to have uh, super balances over $3 million, the changes will not come into effect uh, for another three years, uh, depending, obviously, of where they are up to, uh, what stage they are up to, whether they are below the, um, the age where you can withdraw super. Um, that will depend. But there is three years before this policy comes into effect, Senator Birmingham. If people want to make arrangements to their, to their affairs uh, before that time comes into effect, depending on where they're at uh, in the super cycle, um, then that's a decision that obviously individual superannuation account holders will make. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Uh, President, uh, I ask the minister, given her answer, will Australians who have not reached preservation age by the time this policy takes effect be able to withdraw excess funds from their superannuation accounts that are above Labor's new threshold without penalty. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, you didn't say that in your first question. Um, well, oh, sorry. If you did, I, I didn't hear. But prior to um, uh, preservation age, um, well, there is rules about um, withdrawing super prior to preservation age. Uh, as Senator Birmingham well knows. But this is a very modest change to the superannuation system. 0.5 per cent of superannuation uh, of people will be affected. Um, they have, on average, account balances in the order of $5.8 million, which good, that is good for them, obviously, but we are in charge of having to repair a budget that is in structural deficit of $50 billion a year. That is what you left us. We are making very modest changes to begin the hard work of budget repair. This is a very modest change. It affects a, a tiny amount of people compared to the Thank changes you, Minister, the that you brought in in 2016. Expired, as Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. The rules around preservation age the minister refers to limit the ability of Australians to be able to access their own funds. How does the minister justify legally preventing Australians from changing their investment profile when the government is changing the taxes on those investments? despite having made promises not to do so immediately before the last election. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Thank you. Because, um, as I said, it's a very small amount of uh, Australians who are affected by this change. It's a very modest change. It's Order. still concessional Order. arrangements. Let us not forget this. It is still concessional arrangements for those who are in the fortunate position. Let's remember that the average super balance is in the order of $150,000. Uh, so that's the average of the super balance. So for those that are fortunate to have uh, super balances over and above that, there are still concessional tax arrangements available even with this change. We are making this very modest change to superannuation to help repair the budget that is in structural deficit because of the mess that you left it in. You didn't fund things properly. You didn't fund things uh, in an ongoing basis. You ignored pressures coming to the budget, hoping that someone else would fix it. And that is the work that we are currently doing with this uh, modest thank you, change. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Stewart. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline the, to the Senate the challenges facing the budget following a decade of wasteful spending and economic mismanagement under the former coalition government? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Stewart for the question. Uh, we inherited, we inherited President, 
Please continue, Minister. We inherited, uh, President, a budget stuck in structural deficit. Yep. The Liberals and Nationals were the most wasteful government since Federation. Yep. They not only oversaw consecutive budgets riddled with rorts and slush funds, they also failed to deal with the policy challenges and the pressures impacting on the budget, which are now increasing, not decreasing. Those opposite delivered more consecutive deficits than any government since the 1920s. And remember those back in black mugs? That were printed just that little bit too soon. Remember that? We remember Senator Hume flashing her back in black mug around. They doubled the deficit before the pandemic hit. They left us with a trillion dollars in debt with very little to show for it. And they also propped up their budget numbers with a whole range of terminating measures, funding cliffs, and a long list of zombie measures going back to 2016. 2016 that you had those zombie measures there trying to make your budget bottom line look better than it was. We had to spend $4.1 billion in October to resolve some of these legacy issues inherited from the previous government, including providing funding certainty for programs that were underfunded or had expiring funding but were ongoing in nature, such as environmental approval processes. What, how do you know? They continue on the 1st of July in a new financial year. Information technology uh, programs such as modernising business registers. Again, let's have a look at the total price of that program once it's finalised. And this budget, President, we are continuing to do that. We are continuing to find funding cliffs, adult public dental services, MyGov platform, the My Health record, the high risk terror offender program. Not funded. Thank you, Not Minister. Funded. Your time has expired. Senator Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the Minister provide an update? on the work being done to repair the budget after the mess left behind by the former coalition government. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you, President. Yes, indeed. I'll take that interjection, Senator Watt. I am running out of time because there is a list of things here that we are uncovering and will continue to work on from October and now into the May um, budget. But we are looking at how we can limit the growth in spending, especially when inflation is high, how we support modest revenue increases for example, this, uh, to support our budget repair, which was the announcement we made last week, and focusing new spending on investments that grow the capacity of the economy, like the National Reconstruction Fund, which the Noalition are opposed to, opposed to manufacturing jobs, opposed to jobs in the region, opposed to Australia getting their fair share of support from a government for those important industries that we're going to rely on in years to come. The October budget also included um, savings, and we will continue to look at sensible savings areas where we can as we commit to the ongoing role of budget repair. Thank you, Minister. Senator Stewart, a second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for outlining the uh, repair responses that are underway. Can you please uh, update the Senate uh, on why budget repair is crucial to supporting the Australian economy and individuals and businesses? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you. Well, we must improve the state of our budget. We need to make those responsible decisions that will ensure the budget is able to withstand and respond to future shocks when they come. And they will come. But we have to make room in the budget to repair the mess that we inherited. And we also have to make room for sensible spending for those areas where we're seeing increased pressure for Medicare, for hospitals, for aged care, for the NDIS, for other social services, for defence and national security, all of these areas where the pressures on the budget are increasing, they're accelerating, they're not decreasing, and our budget has to be in a position where we are able to, to deal with that. So we will go through and deal with the legacy of um, poor budgeting, the budget vandals that we saw opposite. We will fix up those areas where we can and we will make room for Australians' priorities in those areas I've just outlined. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Uh, Madam President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, how will the government's new doubling of the super tax treat unrealised capital gains? Thank you, uh, Senator Hume. Minister. Thank you. And I I, um, I am surprised that the, those opposite have decided to oppose this modest increase um, in, in, um, or a reduction in, in tax concessions. A modest $2 billion. I know you'd like to flag it as something other than it is, but 0.5 per cent of Australians who are fortunate enough 
to have balances over $3 million will pay a still a concessional rate of tax at 30 per cent on their earnings in a year, and it will raise $2, million, uh, $2 billion when fully operational in three years' time after we've had another election. But on the, on the question, thank you, Senator Scar, for shouting across the chamber. The simplest, least cost approach is to apply the tax on the growth of an individual's balance over the year. This approach, recommended by Treasury, includes assessing unrealised ca capital gains. It applies prospectively. Alternative approaches would be very costly for super funds, which would come at the expense of members, not just all members, not just those with high balances. Trustees already calculate the value of their fund each year and submit to the tax office. Which, which will enable the Order. ATO to determine liability. We believe this, this approach strikes the right balance between simplicity and ensuring that the tax can be applied Order. across the system to improve the sustainability of this system. And see, this is what's different between when you were in government and we are now in government as the responsible economic and fiscal managers of this budget. You went after robo debt. You went after people with nothing. You went after people who didn't even owe you money. That's what you did. That was the approach. You knew it was illegal. You went after them. You went after Order. them. They didn't even owe Order. you money. This is a modest change to 0.5 per cent of Australians uh, who have you, a Minister. high the time three has million. Expired. Senator Scar, I haven't called you yet, Senator Hume. Interjections are disorderly, and continuing to repeat them and yelling out across the chamber and from the back of the chamber is incredibly disorderly. Senator Hume. Minister, how will the government's new doubling of the super tax apply to a self-funded retiree in the drawdown phase with a self-managed super fund that owns a commercial property that was valued at $2.5 million in 2024-25 and then valued at $3.1 million in 2025-26? but they received a commercial rent of 80000 also in that year. Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I might take the detail of that question on notice. Well, I mean, if you're, seri oh. if you're serious oh. about an answer right, on that, I can, I can take— if, you, if you're serious about getting an answer Order. on that— I mean, if I'm going to come in here and give individual superannuation advice to individual accounts that are given to me, is that's where we're going. It is a modest change. The, the tax will be paid on earnings in a year. Uh, it will be taxed on earnings in a year. The tax office will undertake those assessments, as they currently do. And as Senator uh, Hume knows— Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume. Can I just clarify that answer, please, Madam President? Uh, Senator Hume, why are you on your feet? Do you have I, a point of order? Point of order. I'd just like a clarification from the minister. Uh, that's that's a, not a point of order. Thank you, Senator I Hume. I don't understand. Senator Hume, the minister. Senator Hume, this is not a. Please resume your seat. Order on my right. When senators get to their feet to ask a point of order, and I rule it either in order or out of order, that is the end of the matter. It's not an option to continue to argue with me. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, I've taken the um, substantive question on notice because of the detail of the question, um, and I'm not here to give individual superannuation advice. Uh, well, I'm not. I mean, you, you've, you've given me a cameo. I've taken that on notice. I will come back to you. I will come back to you with an answer on it. There are liquidity requirements for those in uh, thank SMSFs. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hume, second supplementary. Can the minister point to any other example of unrealised capital gains being used in the Commonwealth tax system, or indeed in any other jurisdiction? And can you rule out applying taxes to unrealised capital gains elsewhere in the tax system, such as onto the family home, or to any other assets currently subject to capital gains tax? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, we've made clear what the change is. We've been upfront with the Australian people about what that change is, uh, and it, it relates to high-income uh, superannuation accounts with, uh, with more than $3 million in it. That is the government's announcement. So don't try and don't try and run your, your fear campaign, your scare campaign, saying it's everything other than it is. 
saying it is everything other than Order. it is. The Prime Minister Order. has made it clear what the, super and what the changes are and the limit to that, those changes. That was the policy that we announced last year. But it is, last week, sorry. But it is a but it is seat. a Minister, modest... please resume your seat. Order on my left and right. Thank you. Uh, Minister, please continue. This is the hill you're going to die on after you pursued thousands of Australians for robo-debt. That is how you tried to repair the budget. That is the hill you're going to die on, is this, while you are the party of robo-debt and those vulnerable Thank Australians you, that you harassed. Order. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Order on my left. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Today, a report was released by Reputex, the modellers who modelled the Labor Party's climate policy for their election. Their report forecasts 56 million tonnes of pollution from just 13 new coal and gas projects. That's an 11 per cent increase on Australia's current emissions. Can you guarantee that the safeguard mechanism will see actual pollution from coal and gas go down, not up? Thank you, uh, Senator Waters, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thanks to Senator Waters for her question. And you know, the government uh, uh, has put forward a safeguard mechanism the purpose of which is to provide a predictable and orderly pathway to net zero uh, by 2050 for the 215 biggest emitters in our economy. Uh, and I would make the point, and I understand this is an issue of uh, negotiation and discussion, but this is the only chance that the parliament will have to reduce emissions from all big emitters. Now, the safeguard changes are expected to reduce 250 million tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions to 2030. That is the equivalent of taking uh, two-thirds of Australia's uh, cars off the roads. Uh, so uh, I, I think that the proposition in the question seems to suggest or imply you know, this is not the way we should go about reducing our emissions. Uh, that, that, that may be the Greens' view. Uh, we don't share it. We, we see benefit. We, 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 we see benefit in a predictable pathway to actually deliver the 2030 and 2050 targets. And uh, in uh, government, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Yes, reluctantly. Point of order on relevance. I specifically asked whether actual pollution from coal and gas would go up or down under the safeguard mechanism. There was uh, also a number of other. Uh, there was context before that, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. But I'll continue to listen carefully. Minister, please continue. Well, I understand that the uh, Greens political party uh, are more interested in particular sectors of the economy and targeting them. Uh, we believe that you, an economy-wide approach based on who are the largest emitters with a predictable pathway to achieving the, uh, the targets. Senator Wish Wilson, would you like to stand up and give a speech? Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, please come to order. Minister, please continue. <laughs> if he wants to ask and answer his own questions, he's got opportunities to do that. But I'm trying to answer. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I've just called you to order, and I have the minister on her feet. Minister, please continue. Leader, apparently too. No, I, I agree with you. He can't. I agree. Um, the, the, the point we make is that uh, an economy-wide predictable pathway is the, is the lowest cost way. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. On. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks very much, uh, President. These new coal and gas projects could force industries that can actually adapt and survive in a net zero world, like cement, steel and aluminium, to have to cut more pollution uh, by almost double. Why is your climate policy pushing the costs of new coal and gas onto everyone else? Good uh, thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. I, I don't accept the characterisation. Uh, this is a mechanism which is about making sure the largest emitters have a pathway to contribute to net zero by 2050. Uh, and I know that uh, you know, there are those who would like uh, governments to pick and choose sectors. Uh, uh, 
in terms of making a contribution. I know that you know there's a particular political political views that the Greens political party have on these issues. Uh, we think the best approach is to ta is to ensure that the market can see a predictable pathway to achieving these reductions, because it's all very well to talk about targets, but the, the most important thing is to have policy mechanisms which actually— Order. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I've just called you to order. Uh, Minister, please continue. Minister Wong, I've called you back to continue answering the question if you have anything further to uh, add. I, 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 the point I'm making is we want, we want a mechanism that actually ensures these targets are delivered because there's no point in talking about action on climate change if we can't deliver it. And we are determined to deliver it, something that this country has not been able to do because of the attitude of those Thank opposite you, for too the many years. The time has expired. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. These 13 new coal and gas projects would see coal and gas pollution rise in the critical decade for climate action. And there is another 100 new proposals for coal and gas in the pipeline. Why does Labor want to open more coal and gas in the middle of a climate crisis? Uh, Minister. Uh, as I explained, the safeguard mechanism will target 205 million tonnes of net emissions reductions to 2030 overall Order. through the safeguard. It is, it is correct we are not looking to pick one sector over another. If you emit in excess of 100,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, you will be covered. Uh, so it's agnostic in the sense of where, where the emissions occur, other than Order. to say, if you're a big emitter, you should have a pathway to reducing your emissions. Now, I would have thought that those, that those at the end of the chamber might actually think it's a good thing to get those industries that, and, and individual firms who are emitting a very large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to reduce their emissions so we can all meet the net zero target that everybody uh, with, uh, with some exceptions that most of this chamber have signed up to. Uh, thank you. Senator Still. Order. Senator Still. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister uh, representing the Minister for Industry and Science, Senator Farrell. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's plans to ensure that Australia adds value to our critical minerals like lithium, nickel, cobalt? Manganese, sorry, manganese, and rare earths that we mine in that fantastic part of the nation, WA, and develops a domestic battery manufacturing capability. Minister, what are the opportunities for Australia from developing a domestic industry? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, can I thank uh, Senator Stirl for that very insightful question? And I know for his support of the mining uh, industry generally in uh, in Western Australia, but in particularly. In particular, this uh, area of critical minerals, of course, um, Cabinet was up your way last week at uh, Port Hedland. First time ever, first time ever a Cabinet been into uh, that part of uh, beautiful Western Australia. But uh, as Senators uh, are no doubt aware, Australia is rich in a number of the critical minerals on which the renewable energy economy will be based. We're very good at extracting minerals. But we've not always been good at capturing their true value, and that's what this government is trying to change, uh, <laughs> Senator Stirl. If we look at lithium batteries, the global market for minerals uh, will grow from a current $2 billion to $11 billion by 2035. But if we take one more step up the value chain and uh, refine those minerals, that market grows from $2 billion to $44 billion, some 20 uh, two times uh, larger. Then, if we uh, uh, take it all the way uh, to manufacturing the battery cells, that market—listen to this, uh, Senator uh, Stirl—that market will grow from $31 billion to $387 billion. How many, how I'll, I'll repeat now? that for you, um, <coughs> Senator uh, uh, Watt. Uh, that market will grow from $31 billion to $387 billion, and battery pack assembly will then grow. Battery pack assembly—remember, this is the mob over here who closed down Holden's. Uh, battery pack assembly will grow from $156 billion to $1.1 trillion. Madam President, if we mine it here, if we mine it here. 
we should make it here. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Searle, first supplementary. Thank you, President. I am absolutely in awe, Minister. Other than our access to critical minerals, what other advantage does Australia have when it comes to developing a domestic battery industry? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator Stirl again for his extremely in insightful question once again. Um, the resources that Australia has been blessed with um, are human as well as mineral. Across Australia, there are scientists, researchers, uh, business leaders who are leading the world when it comes to battery technology. From the Future Battery Industry CRC at Curtin University, to the National Battery Testing Centre at QUT. We are at the cutting edge of this technology. Modern batteries are built uh, not just on smart chemistry, but smart technology as well, uh, and this is a vital capacity that we must foster, and your state of Western Australia is leading the way in that regard. Senator Searle, second supplementary. What is the government doing, Minister, to make sure that we can take advantage of these opportunities and provide jobs in our regions and in our suburbs? Uh, Minister Farrell. Well, I, I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. That is an extremely insightful uh, question, and uh, I have an answer for you, uh, Senator Stirl. Uh, and the National Battery Strategy is our government's plan to build a battery manufacturing industry. We're not closing down industries like you did with, uh, with Holdens. We're building it up. This strategy will ensure that we capture the true value of our natural resources and put our international capital to work, delivering products that will be in high demand right around the world and support the global transition to net zero. If we mine here, we should make it here, because that will deliver high skill high-wage jobs, uh, not only in the cities but particularly in the regions and the suburbs right around Australia. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. In February Senate Estimates hearings, Adjunct Professor Skerritt, Deputy Secretary, Health Products Regulation Group, made the following statement, and I quote, there is only one regulator in the world, the US FDA, that actually looks at individual patient data. The rest of the regulators, like us, take statistically validated analyses of patient data. If there are issues with the individual patient data, the FDA will raise those issues. We do not get, in, we do not get individual patient data." End of quote. In estimates hearings on 10 November 2022, Professor Skerritt said, quote, We did check the phase two and phase three clinical trial data from Pfizer. Minister. Please confirm that the TGA simply checked what Pfizer and the FDA sent to them without checking that back to the source material, patient records, meaning they took Pfizer's word for it. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. <laughs> uh, thank you, President. And, um, I thank Senator Roberts for his question. And I was there at I think, both of those hearings uh, with Professor Skerritt, um, who has, has since um, retired from that role, and I just take this opportunity to acknowledge his contribution, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the role of the TGA. Um, I w on, the, on the substantive part of your question, Senator Roberts, I will go back, because I, I, I obviously wasn't in, in um, the position I'm in now when those comments were made um, about what was done with the phase one and phase two trials and the data that was available. But my understanding of the TGA process is that they don't just um, necessarily look at one set of data. They are looking at a whole range of data as they're making approvals for uh, particular uh, vaccines. But I will come back and, and if I have anything further to add on that. Um, I would also say that uh, it's very clear that uh, the vaccination program, uh, the, success, you know, the rollout of the vaccination program has saved lives and it has, particularly for those who are vulnerable uh, to COVID-19, um, reduced the chance that they would pass away or have very severe uh, disease from COVID-19. And that data is well and truly established and evidence-based and you can see that 
in um, the hospitalisations data um, and other data that's collected about the impact of the vaccination program. So the vaccine program has been very successful and we're very fortunate to have been in a position, I think, to have all been vaccinated against this uh, virus over the last couple of years. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, can you assure the Senate that the US FDA did actually check the Pfizer analysis of patient data back to the actual patient data? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't think I'm in a position or the government's in a position to, um, to say what the um, FDA did or didn't do. Um, I can certainly see if there's any further information I can provide uh, to the senator. I acknowledge his ongoing interest in this area, um, and if there are f uh, further advice I can provide to assure you that um, very strong and thorough and rigorous processes were followed before the TGA approved uh, any of the vaccines that were use, used to vaccinate against COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. If that is the case, Minister, why then does that same data, when independent leading virologists examine it properly in a peer-reviewed published paper, show the 400,000 patient records actually prove the vaccine was unsafe and should not have been approved? I ask you again, Minister, did our bureaucrats approve a dangerous product because they trusted Pfizer and in so doing, they failed to act in Australia's best interests. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister uh, Gallagher. Thank you. Well, no, no, I don't think that's a cor correct assertion to put. And I do have, and I would expect uh, that most senators in this place uh, would have complete and total faith in the processes used by the TGA when they were going through the approvals for the vaccine against COVID-19. I know there are some in this place, and I've, I've certainly sat in estimates uh, listening to the questions that a number of senators have asked that have a different view, but I would say the overwhelming view of senators in this place is that the TGA undertook rigorous examination in a compressed time frame because of the situation we were facing. And I think it's easy to forget that we were facing a pandemic where it was predicted that we would see significant loss of life if we were not able to protect citizens. And we've been, again, very fortunate to have relied on the science to have rolled out the vaccine. And the data is very clear around the, the impact the vaccines had on reducing serious disease and death from COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Given Labor's new doubling of the super tax, we'll see earnings in some superannuation accounts paying twice the tax rate as currently applies. Will there be any changes to the tax rate supplied to those accounts when they are distributed following an account holder's death? Good question. Thank you, Senator Askew. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And uh, I welcome the opportunity to um, talk about the government's policy, which well, I will, I, I will answer the question, so hold your horses. Um, no, I'm not wasting time here. It's an important question, and I'm making sure that I get the answer exactly correct for you. Um, well, I do my homework, Senator Scar. Um, <laughs> I do my homework. But I welcome the opportunity to talk about this very modest change that we are making to the, um, to the arrangements for uh, superannuation for those on uh, higher incomes, $3 million or more, uh, raising a modest uh, $2 billion once fully operational in, in three years' time. Uh, and I would make the point that those opposite have failed to, to understand is that at the moment the budget is in structural deficit. We are borrowing to keep services going, okay? And we are saying that it's not fair Order. to, to Minister, borrow please more. Resume your by... seat. Please resume your seat, uh, Senator Askew. Just a point of relevance, uh, point of order on relevance. I did ask about the act specifically in the case of death. Thank you. I'll direct the uh, minister to the question. Thank you. But just to finish that point, I will come to the to the issue that was raised by Senator Askew. Is that Senator Askew and those opposite the Noalition are arguing that others with much lower superannuation balances should be paying the interest on the debt that we are borrowing to keep the services of government going, rather than make this modest change. For those that are fortunate enough to have three million and more in their accounts, an average of 5.8 million. 
Generally, death benefits are able to be withdrawn from the Order. superannuation system. Members will have this option so they do not face additional tax. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Askew, first supplementary. Thank you. Will Labor's new doubling of the super tax mean that a widow or widower would be penalised with a higher tax rate if the retention of their late spouse's superannuation within superannuation saw their savings now exceed Labor's new and unindexed threshold? Uh, thank you, Senator Askew. Minister. Uh, the death benefit will not count as earnings in the year that it is received by the surviving spouse. Uh, Senator Askew, second supplementary. Okay. So how is the application on deceased estates of Labor's new doubling of the super tax, which Mr Albanese promised not to do, anything other than a creeping march towards new forms of death duties that penalise Australians at their most vulnerable time? Order. 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 Order across the chamber. I have the minister on her feet waiting to answer the question. Order on my right. Order. Senator Wong. Minister. Thank you. Classic example there of not being able to amend your final question based on the answers to the first two. I would say, I would say for those that are arguing to maintain these arrangements, these concessional arrangements, which will remain concessional for the 0.5% who are fortunate enough to have Ruffin. more than three million in their superannuation account to contribute or to have less concessional arrangements in place that contributes to budget repair. And that 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 is your core group now. The 0.5 per cent who have who are in that in back. and when we have a look when we have a look, just remember those words. Remember the words of RoboDebt. We will find you. We will track you down, and you will have to repay those debts. And you may end up in prison. You may end up in prison. That is the approach you took to budget repair. That is the approach. Thank you, Scra Minister. Senator Rice. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Minister, on the 21st of February, the Fair Work Commission said that the 15% increase for aged care workers should be paid in full. From the 1st of July 2023. Minister, will the Commonwealth commit to funding that 15 per cent increase in full from the 1st of July 2023, and will that include on costs such as funding for leave and superannuation? Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Uh, the government has said that we will fund that aged care case, and I think again, and thank you, Senator uh, Rice, for the opportunity to again contrast the, the approach that we're taking as in government as opposed to them uh, when they were in where they pursued vulnerable um, low-income Australians and threatened them with prison for an illegal scheme that they knew was illegal. That's right. they down. That is the approach. They down. We are making room in our budget to fund priorities like aged care wages. We had asked for a phased-in approach um, just again to smooth um, our budget situation because of the impact. It's, uh, the, the cost to the budget is um, in a multi-billion dollars. Um, we've made some provision for that. We'll have a look at how much we have to adjust that uh, for the budget going forward. But we, yes, we have said we will fully fund it because we value the work of aged care workers. We understand they are underpaid. And unlike those opposite, whose deliberate design feature of their economic architecture was keeping wages suppressed, uh, we do believe that those are on low wages um, like aged care and other workers deserve the support of their government, uh, and you will see a significant commitment in this budget um, to go to fund the costs of that case. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, um, Minister. And look, I just want clarification that when you say you will fully fund it, you are now talking about fully funding it in that first financial year, not spreading it out over two financial years as. Um, originally proposed. I mean that's good news. So I'm wondering whether you would be actually willing to go further, because the health services union, of course, had asked called for a 25% increase in wages. And as we know, the aged care workforce is really low paid. Why would the government continue with the stage three tax cuts rather than fund the full amount that aged care workers really need? 
Thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Um, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. Uh, there is a further stage to the Fair Work Commission case. Um, this is just this is, I think, the culmination of stages one and two on the aged care case that has come up uh, with this um, the initial uh, increase of 15 per cent. That was the stage one decision. Stage two has come back saying that we that the Commission thinks it should be paid on uh, the 1st of July and to include some other workers in that um, arrangement. Uh, and now there's a subsequent process uh, to consider the rest of the case. Um, we I think you can see from the commitments we have made to date and the room that I am currently trying to find in the budget to fund this, while against these crazy attacks uh, from the opposition who prefer a head-in-their-sand approach to uh, funding aged care things, like I don't fund them or argue against them, uh, we are making the, the difficult decisions to be able to fund uh, aged care Thank workers you, appropriately. Uh, Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. I mean, the Royal Commission estimated that implementing their recommendations in full would cost on the order of $10 billion a year annually. And the latest official figures show that aged care providers are operating at an average loss of $28 per resident per day. So in terms of finding room in the budget, abandoning the stage three tax cuts would free up an extra $25 billion per year on average. So will the government find room in the budget by you, abandoning Rice. the Your Scott Morrison tax cut? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, in answer to that question, our policy on those tax cuts haven't changed. Um, we are focused on making sure multinationals can pay their fair share of tax, and of course, uh, we'll look to uh, legislate uh, the arrangements for uh, the superannuation changes that we announced last week. Um, so that they are the areas that we have been focused on. Um, but we are also going through the budget line by line. It is my job and the Treasurer's job and the ERC's job to look at ways that we can make room for all of the priorities and for all of the services that the Australian people value. We know they value aged care. We know they value Medicare. We know they value um, hospital care. And, um, you know, that, that is the difficult job and it requires at times some difficult decisions. But we are responsible. We are fiscally responsible. We are dealing with the decade of um, budget vandalism that went on uh, over, um, from those opposite, and Thank we are you, making Minister, those difficult decisions. Expired. Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is delivering a better future for all Australians after a decade of failed policies? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister. Thank you very much to Senator Grogan from my own wonderful state that I haven't got to see in a little while uh, of South Australia. I appreciate the question. and I'm very pleased to uh, in talk to the Senate about what this government is seeking to do after a decade of division, of denial, of waste and rorts, secret ministries and deliberate yep. neglect, well? uh, uh, which went so well, uh, about what the Albanese government is delivering. This government, since the election, has supported a, an increase in the minimum wage and secured a pay rise for aged care workers. Yeah. And I just want to remind everybody, after the many questions which Senator Gallagher has answered so well, that just recall that those opposite desperately opposed a dollar per hour for the That's lowest right. paid workers in Australia, but they are prepared to go to the wall. Over 0.5 per cent of yeah. pe people in Australia who have $3 million in their superannuation accounts. And Australians will look at that and they will understand which side of this chamber is actually about families and working people, which side of this chamber is actually about a better future for all Australians, and which side are too busy focusing on scare campaigns such as the, some of the pathetic attempts of those opposite. This government has made childcare cheaper. We've made medicines cheaper. We've created 180,000 new fee-free TAFE places. That we've delivered 20,000 university places. Established 10 days paid to the family and domestic violence leave. The government is expanding paid parental leave. The government is acting to make workplaces safe from sexual harassment with the passage of the Respect at Work Bill. We've established Jobs and Skills Australia. We've passed a historic climate change bill and updated our climate 
climate targets. We are repairing our international relations and making Australia stronger and more influential in the world. We've expanded the Commonwealth Seniors Health Card and made it easier for pensioners to earn more without losing their pension. We've invested in affordable housing and Thank we've you, delivered Minister, the first time buyers expired. guarantee. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. That's an impressive list of items that you've run through there, and it's very pleasing to see. Um, I wonder if you could now tell us how these achievements are going to ease the cost of living for Australians. Minister Wong. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Grogan. Well, the, the, this government and the senators on this side understand that it's important that government actually put in place measures to help address the cost of living challenges created under the Liberals and the Nationals. And let's just remember that those opposite presided over increases to out-of-pocket childcare costs of 47 per cent. Yep. Let's remember those opposite who wanted to introduce a GP tax, yep. tried to increase the cost of medicines by $5. Opposed, never increased the number of paid parental leave weeks, said no to social and affordable housing, including for women and children, yeah. uh, and, as I said before, most importantly, opposed a dollar an hour. Unbelievable. Increase to the minimum wage for the lowest paid in our country. Everyone will remember the way in which those opposite refused to back that wage increase. And which leader was prepared to stand up and say, "I Thank back Thank you, it. Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, uh, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you could now step out for us how the Albanese government will continue to deliver for Australians this year. Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Grogan, for the second supplementary. Well, we, we know we can't fix a decade of neglect, incompetence and bad policies overnight, but we will keep working to deliver on our commitments to provide greater economic security, relief for families, security in energy, manufacturing, jobs and wages. And those opposite, as much as they yell, as much as they yell, everyone will remember who is the party that voted against energy price relief. Over there. Yeah. Who is the party that doesn't want to support manufacturing in this country? Yeah. Oh, the reality Order. is those opposite, Order. those opposite have no plan, Order. no plan Senator to address Ricard. cost of living, no Senator plan Drew. to address the future. And what we've seen in this question time already, Order. already is that they have not learned from a decade of division and pathetic scare campaigns. But if they think that that is what Australians are after now, I have a message Senator to them. McKenzie. We are about building a better future for Australians, and that's Thank what Australians you, Minister. want. Your time has expired. Senators, when you are called to order, specifically when I call you by name, I expect you to stop interjecting. Uh, Senator Bragg. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, President, for that. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Watt. And uh, my question is how will the new super tax apply to defined benefit schemes? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, Minister. Thank you. From, uh, from the Senator that uh, so positive about super. <laughs> so positive about super, who has a long lifelong interest in super. Yeah, I will. And we're doing it exactly the same way that you did it when you announced your, um, your 2016 changes. There are a couple of areas that we need to consult upon um, further, uh, which we will do. Um, but there isn't, uh, because of the nature of, of um, defined benefit, that we will, they will be included in the scheme, and we announced that when we announced the measure, and our and our announcement accounted for that. Um, it was clear, and again in the announcement by the treasurer, that we would consult with the sector, which is the same process because I remember it when you introduced it in your 2016, 20, 2017 changes, which of course went much further than the changes that we are talking about today. So um, we expect that the changes um, will, well, they definitely will cover defined benefits scheme, and there are a couple of areas that we are going to consult on. 
um, and we want Hume. some industry advice on. As people know, that the um, defined benefit schemes work differently to accumulation schemes, and they are complex. Uh, and so there is some uh, further consultations we would like to do, as as the Morrison government did back in 2016-2017. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, first supplementary. Oh, thanks very much uh, for that, Minister. Uh, can you guarantee that there will be equitable treatment between the ordinary superannuation schemes and the generous defined benefit schemes? Thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we are including them in the, um, in, under the same arrangements. So, yes, they will be treated equitably. Um, and we, as I said, there are two areas where we will like to consult industry on the valuation of a defined benefit scheme for the purposes of assessing a person's superannuation balance against the $3 million threshold and um, approach to taxing the equivalent of earnings in relation to balances above $3 million. We will consult closely with funds that have defined benefit schemes on this. Um, this is exactly the same arrangements that you put in place when you lowered uh, the 300,000 Division 293 um, threshold to 250,000, when you made those changes, which weren't indexed, by the way, just throw that in. Um, when you put those arrangements in place, you also undertook a process around defined benefits scheme. We are doing exactly the same thing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bragg, second supplementary. Thanks, thanks very much. Minister, did the five cabinet ministers, including the Prime Minister, who will have access to generous defined benefit schemes, declare their personal interest before or during the cabinet deliberation on Labor's new doubling of the super tax? Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister. Uh, all, uh, the cabinet handbook uh, was followed, and I can assure the senator. Uh, we are an orderly, adult, responsible government. We take th we take matters of integrity and honesty very seriously. Um, we don't introduce illegal schemes like robo-debt, which pursued vulnerable people in the name of budget repair. Remember that? It was going to raise $4 billion and repair the budget. What you didn't say was it's illegal. We're going to hound vulnerable people that don't owe us money. We're going to threaten to send them to jail. We're going to threaten to send them to jail. That's what happened over here. We are not that type of government. All, all arrangements, as set out in the Cabinet handbook, including declarations of relevant conflicts, are done uh, are followed in accordance with those arrangements. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Good my question is to the Minister for Emergency uh, Management, Senator Watt. Last February, New South Wales and Queensland faced devastating flooding in one of the uh, costliest and most devastating global natural disasters of 2022. As we pass the one-year anniversary, can the Minister please update the Senate on what support has been provided to these very important communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon, for your ongoing work uh, as the government's disaster envoy, as well envoy for disaster recovery, uh, supporting me and all flood victims uh, in the ongoing task of recovery. Uh, I'd, of course, like to acknowledge again uh, that this one-year anniversary has been a very difficult time for many Australians. The flooding event that we saw in February 2022 devastated communities across the east coast of Australia and it has been and will be a long road towards recovery. As a government, we've been working very hard, along with those affected communities in New South Wales and Queensland, to ensure that they are able to not just recover from those floods back in February last year, but to build back in a more resilient way. Financial recovery that's now been provided totals in the billions of dollars for a range of programs across a range of floods last year, and those programs assist primary producers, small businesses, homeowners, charities, landlords, councils and many others. In the northern rivers of New South Wales alone, more than $1 billion has been provided jointly with the New South Wales government in support payments directly to residents, but we know that there's a long way yet to go. While the Albanese government is focused on recovery, we're also focused on being better prepared for future disasters. That's why we've rolled out resilience and betterment projects in disaster-prone regions, passed legislation and opened applications for our flagship Disaster Ready Fund, unified the two arms of federal emergency management to create a new national emergency management agency, 
provided pathways out of harm's way for people through investment in voluntary home buybacks and taking action on future floodplain builds. We have invested in Disaster Relief Australia to provide recovery and clean-up support after disasters. We have commissioned an independent review into national disaster funding arrangements to ensure funding is hitting the right areas. We have invested in flood research and many other things. The Albanese government knows that the job is not over and will continue to support communities impacting by natural disasters. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. In my home state of New South Wales, the Northern Rivers was particularly hard hit. What is the Albanese government doing to ensure the Northern Rivers are being prepared for the future flooding? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you again, Senator Sheldon. Uh, the 2022 February floods were the worst floods the Northern Rivers has ever seen, uh, and I know Senator McAllister has also spent a significant amount of time uh, there hailing from the Northern Rivers of New South Wales. Last week I was back in Lismore with local state member Janelle Saffin, Mayor Steve Krieg, Senator Sheldon, Senator McKenzie and the federal member Mr Hogan to commemorate the one-year anniversary and reflect on the past 12 months. I was honoured to meet and thank locals in the Tinney Army as they were presented with medals for their courageous efforts helping to rescue strangers trapped by floodwaters. Recently, I announced $50 million of flood resilience projects to be delivered under Tranche 1 of the Northern Rivers Recovery and Resilience Program, fully funded by the Albanese government. This includes things like road raising, flood pumps, drains and community resilience projects. And the remaining $100 million of projects will be announced within the next six months, but we know that more support will be needed. We're also cost-sharing two major resilience programs, including the Resilient Homes Program and the Regional Thank Roads you, and Minister. Transport the Recovery time has Package. Expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Uh, right now, communities in the Northern Territory are facing flooding. Can the minister please provide an update on what support is being provided to assist these important communities? Minister. I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. Uh, the Albanese government has acted swiftly to support the Northern Territory through multiple dangerous weather events already this year. Uh, we were there after Tropical Cyclone Ellie and we're there again now. On Wednesday evening last week, I approved a request for Australian Defence Force support from the Northern Territory government, and that support includes three aircraft to assist with the evacuation of residents from remote Indigenous communities. I'd like to thank the personnel involved for their proactive and fast action. I understand that around 570 people are currently residing in Howard Springs, uh, having been evacuated from those communities. We know there's heavy rainfall forecast in these communities for the next week, and so it may be some time before impact assessments can be undertaken and people return to their communities. A liaison officer from the National Emergency Management Agency is on the ground and we remain in close contact with the Northern Territory Government. And that's in addition to services Australia personnel being based out of Howard Springs. We'll continue to work with the New South Northern Thank Territory you, Government to ensure Senator people Canavan. get um, Madam President, uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Will an increasing number of Australians be subjected to Labor's new doubling of the super tax due to the government's refusal to index its new threshold? Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I welcome the question on the government's modest change to the superannuation arrangements that uh, we announced last week. Uh, uh, for the thank you very much for the opportunity, because it is important that we explain it. Uh, and the $3 million threshold strikes the right balance between incentives to stay, save for retirement and strengthening the super system by making it more sustainable over time. I think the evidence is uh, from the superannuation sector themselves that uh, ASFA estimates for a comfortable re retirement at 67, you need 545,000 if you're a single person and 640,000 if you are a couple. Um, a $3 million balance will be more than sufficient for an adequate retirement for most people for many years to come. And many parts of the tax system aren't indexed, for example, personal income tax levels and, as I said, the former government lowered the contribution tax threshold, Division 293, Minister, without indexation. Thank you. Uh, Senator Canavan. Point of order on relevance. It was a very simple question about indexing the threshold. The minister hasn't got anywhere near that topic uh, um, the, after the a minute. Min uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, as the senator got to his feet to enter to uh, raise the point of order, the senator minister was in fact talking about precisely that. Uh, thank so you. I think there is Minister no point Wong. of order. The, the senator has uh, gone to the issue of your question, Senator Canavan, and I'll continue to listen carefully. Minister. 
thank you, um, President. Um, in 30 years, Treasury projects that roughly only the top 10 per cent of earners will retire with superannuation balances of around three million or more. In 30 years, in in 30 years, in 30 years' time, uh, that that only uh, that that is the estimation of Treasury. And I would say that this this is this is Order. a modest change Order. to 0.5% of people that are coming in. Of the 80,000 affected, uh, the average balance is $5.8 million. And I would say, again, this is a modest change we are making in response to having to deal with the budget repair that is required from the economic vandalism of your decade in government. Uh, Senator Canavan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, given the government obviously has done modelling, why didn't you tell the Australian people last week that, in fact, 10 per cent of Australians could be affected by your change, not the modest half per cent you're, you're telling lies about today? Our Minister. In 30 years' time, in 30 years time Senator Canavan. Our Minister, please resume your seat. Order. 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 Thank you. Senator Ayres, when I call order, that's what I expect. At the same on my left, Senator Mackenzie. Minister, please continue. Thank you. As I answered the question earlier, many parts of the taxation system aren't indexed. The income tax thresholds aren't indexed. The Division 293 threshold, which you set, which affected a lot more people, uh, isn't indexed. Now, we are being very upfront with we are being very upfront about the policy that we took that we announced last week we are being very clear about it it affects a very small amount of people in this country 18 million people are unaffected listen to it it raises a very modest amount by tightening a concession that remains concessional for those who are fortunate enough to have three million, and I would say this to you: the average Australian has 150,000 in their superannuation Thank you, Minister. account. The time so, how about you think about them? For has expired. Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. I have Senator Canavan on his feet. Second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Given the government has revealed this secret modelling today, how much extra tax, on average, will those 10 per cent of Australians pay over their lifetime? because of your doubling of the super tax. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Minister. It's a concessional rate of tax. Let's not forget this, that for those fortunate to have three million or more in their superannuation account, mindful of the fact, mindful of the fact that uh, that the estimates are you need in the order of five hundred to six hundred thousand for a decent retirement, and mindful of the fact that average Australians have 150,000 in their super. How about you have the same level of concern for them? How about Senator you have a, the same level of concern for them as you are feigning at this point in time? Uh, Minister, please resume I've, your seat. Senator, I've got Senator Canavan on his. Well, I need to hit Senator Wong. Please resume your seat. I need to hear the senator first. Oh. 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 Order. <laughs> You're doing a great Order. job. Order. Order on my left. Order on my left. Order on my left. I have Senator Birmingham on his feet. Senator Birmingham. Pre President, 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 on a point of order, and in defence of your position as President, Senator Wong is the first in this chamber to ask for respect to be shown to you Correct. as chair. You said, while Senator Wong was attempting to make her statement, that you had to give the call to Senator Canavan because he was on his feet with a point of order first, and yet Senator Wong chose to ignore what you had said, President, and move ahead with her motion. I ask you to call the point of order, please, President. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong? Mr. Madam President, Madam President, I'm in your hands. I thought you were calling me. Uh, and I, Senator, sen order! 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 
Order. I thought you were calling me because of the precedence issue, and I, I understood that Senator Gallagher had finished, so that he is not entitled. Senator Canavan is not entitled to take a point of order after the minister has finished. Um, Senator Wong, I saw. Uh, I'm not sure whether the minister had uh, finished, but I did see Senator Canavan on his feet. I did go to him, and then you stood. But I will seek advice on where we're up to. Uh, Senator Canavan, I am going to go to your point of order. Okay. So um, the point of order was on relevance. Uh, uh, the question uh, only went to the average extra tax paid for by this secret modelling that Labor has done. And in the 36 seconds the minister was speaking, there was not even an attempt to answer that question. Uh, thank you, Senator Canavan. The minister has been expansive in her answers, and I believe she was being relevant. Senator Wong. Yeah. yeah. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Chandler. Mr Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of answers provided by government ministers in response to questions asked by senators from the opposition during question time today. Um, well, another day, another broken promise. After both the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have consistently assured Australians that they wouldn't make changes to superannuation during the election campaign just last year. Last week, we saw the government confirm that it will be increasing taxes on the savings of an ever-increasing number of Australians. They have deliberately chosen to do this in a way that means each and every year more and more Australians will be hit by these tax increases in the years and decades ahead. The mixed messages the government are pushing with this change are extraordinary, as were the responses that were provided to questions asked by the opposition in question time today. The point of superannuation was supposed to be to ensure that people can be self-sufficient in their retirement, making sure that they aren't reliant on the aged pension. But now the government is saying to people that when you've worked for 50 years and had 11 per cent of your wage taken away every year and put into superannuation, well, that just makes you rich. So the Labor government is going to take a bigger handful of that money to prop up their own budget line. Does the Labor Party want people to fund their own retirement? or punish them for doing so. As the years go on and more and more people will be captured by this tax grab, small business owners, teachers and public servants, why would people trust the superannuation system in the future when they can just see that this government over here will be using it as a big pot of money just waiting to be raided? Not even 12 months into this government, Mr Deputy President, and Labor's broken promises are starting to pile up. We have seen Labor backtrack on a number of major policy announcements since the election, most notably their pledge to save Australians an average of $275 on their power bills. Labor was adamant that they were going to pass this saving on to households, but only a few months on from their guarantee, they were forced to admit that the only thing they could guarantee Australians in relation to electricity prices is that households could expect to see power bills go up. And after promising that Labor will cut the cost of living, instead of this, cost of living is going through the roof. Hard-working Australian families are having to spend more and more of their income on groceries and energy bills and mortgage payments and rent. It is clear to anyone paying attention that Labor told Australians what they, wanted to, what they thought they wanted to hear to win an election, and now they are desperately trying to find excuses to break the promises that they made. You can guarantee that Labor's broken, policy, uh, broken promise rather, on superannuation will be followed by many more broken promises and more tactics to get their hands on the incomes of Australian workers through higher taxes. We saw the Treasurer uh, just last week desperately trying to keep his options open on other ways to hike taxes and plug his budget holes. He didn't even want to rule out capital gains tax on the family home. And yet 
Less than an hour after that radio interview, we had the oh, less than an after, uh, hour after that interview, rather, we had the Prime Minister appearing on radio, clearing up the Treasurer's mess, attempting to clarify exactly what was meant. We can see how desperate the government is to plug the holes in its budget. By the way, it wants to break its promise and legislate these tax increases straight away. If there is one thing we've learned over the years, Mr Deputy President, it is that Labor cannot be trusted with money. They will always try and get their hands on more money of hard more of the money that hardworking Australians earn, and that is certainly what they are seeking to do with this most recent policy announcement. So, like I say, uh, another day in this place, another broken promise from the Labor government. I think Australians deserve more, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australians deserve a government that sticks to the commitments that it made at the election last year. Uh, and I recognise that during an election campaign, parties will always put uh, commitments to the public and will always seek to um, put their case to the public uh, in order to uh, gain election, and, and, and that's part of the contest of ideas. That's part of what having an election is all about, to enable people uh, to look at the ideas that are on um, offer from both political parties and make an informed decision. The Australian people made an informed decision based on the information that this government put on the record in May last year, and yet everything we have seen since, whether it's out in the community, whether it's in this place here, demonstrates time and time again that this government was willing to say whatever they like to get into get their. Uh, uh, be able to get access to the uh, government benches over here. They said whatever they like, and now since then all we have seen is broken promise after broken promise after broken promise. Australians, quite frankly, Mr. Acting Deputy, uh, Mr. Deputy President, rather deserve more. Thank you. Thank you. President, I rise to make my contribution, and look, I honestly believe I, I think I'm in a parallel universe, and I, I don't like to go down the path of history lessons. But I think it's important for some of us that have been around in the workforce uh, for a little while. I was a recipient of the uh, the, um, the Hawke uh, Keating's uh, push to have workers to get superannuation. I remember the Accords. I remember being in wage negotiations in the 80s and 90s when we traded off our pay rises so we could get an increase in super. And I remember as a young union official. Uh, at that little transport company called TNT when we received superannuation. And may I say, Mr Deputy President, uh, it wasn't 11 per cent of our wages, it was $1.87 a week. And I remember saying to my union organiser and my fellow workers in the site, what are we going to do with $1.87? To which I was told, stick it in your bank account, think about it, in your superannuation account. And got, lo and behold, the whole idea was that we, we, the workers, would not be a burden, and when I say workers, I mean all workers, I'm not even a class warfare here, that we would not be a burden upon the taxpayers when we retire. I also remember being privileged to be with an employer that gave me an opportunity in later life at the Transport Workers Union where I could increase my superannuation through the benefits that were available through, I can't remember what they used to call it, but you could offset your taxation, put it into your super. And Fiona and I made that decision in the 90s that we wanted to up our super because we didn't want to be a burden on the taxpayers, but we, were the, we, were, we, we believe we were privileged enough to have good paying union jobs that we could afford to put a bit aside for super at the same time while putting our kids through school and while building a house. Now, Mr Deputy President, I have tried all my working life to look after my superannuation, and I'm proud to say that I'm quite happy with how it's been going. But I've got to tell you, Mr Deputy President, it ain't nowhere near three million dollars. And I've also got to tell you, Mr Deputy President, much to my Sad, my, my hurt and heart. It ain't going to be anywhere near three million dollars unless I win super. If I win lotto and happen to chuck a, a fair bit, a big chunk in, but it just baffles me. People out on the streets thinking about what is this mob over there going on about? Why are they looking after people, or they're so concerned about people who have three million dollars plus in their super? And can I say to all of those that have more, and even that one person who's got five hundred forty-four million, I'm jealous. I wish I had $544 million, because I tell you what, I'd be able to pay an accountant a lot of money to tell me how I can get around it and do other things and start buying the kids luxury yachts and holiday homes and I don't know, places in Turak or wherever they live. But, Mr Deputy President, for crying out loud, they're still going to get access to 15 per cent tax on their super up to $3 million. Think about that. 
Think of all those people out there in Struggle Street. Think of all those people out there that have had to contend with rising inflation, which we all know in this building has meant there has been a huge impost and a cost to them on their housing payments. Think about the squeeze on our supply chains. Think about this, the price of diesel going through the roof. Guess who's paying for it? Not, not, not all the trucking companies. Some of the smaller ones are. It's coming back through the supermarket lines. Think about that. Now, they don't stand up and fight and argue about the cost of living. They don't stand up and fight because of the mess that they left the Albanese government, the debts that they left us, and yet, for some strange, weird, out there reason, they want to protect, I don't know, they all donors, everyone who's got $3 million plus in their super. What could be the logical argument? I really, really would like to get into the heads of some of those on the crossbench, because I honestly think, oh, sorry, on the, on the opposition benches, because I honestly think that they must be totally baffled or absolutely embarrassed or just uh, uh, gobsmacked that their leader's going to charge them back into government by standing up for people that have more than $3 million. And when I say standing up for people with more than $3 million, they'll pay that extra 15 per cent tax on money above $3 million. If you listen to that side over there, you would think that we are putting our hands into the pockets of people who have more than $3, $3 million or more and taking it all off them in some massive great tax grab. For crying out loud, Senator Van, I'm looking forward to your contribution. I, I really am. I, I'm trying to give you an out because you, you, you're not all dodos over that side. You notice I did say not all of you. Some of you are pretty intelligent people. Some of you have built a good life because you've got out and done the hard yards, like some of us over this, or a lot of us over this side have done. But seriously, you think this is great economics? You think this is great politics while people are struggling with rising inflation, rising housing costs, rising supply chain costs, rising food costs, rising fuel costs? You think you're on the side of the angels? <laughs> Can't wait for the blue. Senator Van. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I thank my good friend Senator Stirl for reminding us of the Hawke Keating years, where that Labor government took interest rates to 18 per cent, when their treasurer, Paul Keating said we went into a recession that we had to have. So when are we going to hear Dr Chalmers say we're having another recession that we had to have? We're, going to, we're seeing history repeat out itself with this government, although it looks more like the Whitlam government than it does the Hawke Keating government. And I also thank the Treasurer for reminding Australians that Labor will always go after their money. How can the Australian people trust anything this government says after, yet again, we're seeing another broken promise? They said before the election many, many times that they wouldn't make any changes to super. Well, it didn't take them long to change that, did they? And it's clear now that the Labor government do not see superannuation as a vehicle for Australians to support themselves in their retirement. But it's a piggy bank to bankroll their election campaigns. You know, this money, this $3 million, Senator Stirl said he put money aside. He super sacrificed. I almost guarantee you that most of those people with $3 million made decisions to, to sacrifice some of their salary and put it into superannuation because there was always a pact with the Australian people and the Australian governments that the rules for super would stay as they are and they could have some faith in how they invested. Then the assistant treasurer grotesquely referred to people's super as honey from a hive. It's truly a sick joke to think that people can go to work their entire lives, work hard, sacrifice some of their salary, save money, and then the Labor government looks at that money and instead of thinking, well, good on you, mate. Well done. Go enjoy your retirement. Stephen Jones looks at it and says, how much of that can I get my hands on? And this is not the first time for Assistant Minister Jones, who's been caught out trying to pull the, the wool over Australians' eyes over super changes. Let's not forget that within weeks of coming to government, one of Assistant Minister Jones' first acts was to direct the Treasury to look at how it could support industry super funds, get away with poor performance and mismanagement, trying to underdo the important transparency mechanisms 
that we put in place in government under the Your Future, Your Super legislation. Despite going to the election promising lower taxes and no change to super, this government have decided to make changes to super but by doubling the tax on those higher thresholds. And this is just a long list of election promises and lies that this government have made. Let's not forget the Prime Minister promised 97 times that he would reduce Australians' power bills by $275. Instead, he's delivered the most expensive average wholesale electricity on record. They promised cheaper mortgages, and almost every home-owning Australian knows that Labor outright lied on that one, with mortgages going through the roof after the ninth consecutive rate rise. And that is since May 2022, when the election was. They even promised to lower inflation, but in January we saw inflation at 7.8 per cent for the December, which is the highest it's been since 1990. They also promised higher wages, but we've just seen the biggest drop in real wages in recorded history. So we know that this government will not deliver on its promises. We know that this government will change its mind on things. So every Australian out there listening to this must remember that when they're saying it's only 0.5 per cent of uh, people who hold super funds and it's only a modest increase, modest, my backside, 50 per cent increase is not modest in anyone's books. When they say they're not going to change this, you cannot believe them. You cannot believe a word that comes out of their mouth. They will lower that threshold. They're telling you now that they won't, but mark my words, they will. They'll lower that threshold. They'll increase that, that concessional rate such that Australians who have worked hard, saved hard, are going to be paying more and more and more under this government. They lie. Do not trust them. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Well, it's fascinating listening to this debate um, that has raged through question time. And I'm left scratching my head somewhat at the deep and abiding concern for a modest change in the amount of tax that people pay if they have more than $3 million in their account. Yeah, come on. Um, so let's just be clear. What is this about? The change that we are putting forward is about a very modest change to ensure that the superannuation system does what it is supposed to do. And that is not about having a tax offset for people with deep wealth to use for whatever inheritance or further uh, opportunities that they might be using them for. This is about changing it. There are many other financial vehicles that they can use. But $3 million in your super account, that's where the tax breaks reduce. Not stop, but reduce. Let's be clear, the highest tax threshold is 47, and this is still 30 per cent if you're over 3 million. So all of this hoo-ha and beat up is just completely ridiculous. Completely ridiculous. Particularly when we look at the kind of legacy that's been left by this government. The legacy of rorts, waste, a trillion dollars in debt, not to mention the laundry list of terminating measures hidden in the budget out into the future that the people of this country know nothing about. Yet you want to protect the millionaires. Well done. Good call. Excellent. You opposed a $1 pay rise a year for the lowest paid workers. But no, no, let's go in and fight for the millionaires. Ignore the people who are struggling. You've got this ridiculous narrative about how much you care about cost of living, yet nothing you did when you were in government, nothing the coalition while in government did to look after those people who are now feeling the cost of living pressures the most. So it's laughable to hear you out there protecting the millionaires on one hand, 
Oh no, our friends with $3 million can't possibly cope. Well, I don't think so. This is a sensible change. Superannuation was built in this country to enable people to have a dignified retirement. It's not the investment vehicle for your next purchase. It's not the investment vehicle for your deep inheritance. Go and find another investment vehicle. This is a small number of people with a large amount of money, and good on them. Don't begrudge them a penny of it. Not a penny of it. If they've worked hard for that, well done. But no, they should not get a tax break from the Australian people in which to allow them to keep more than $3 million in their superannuation account without paying a more reasonable amount of tax for it. So if we can just be clear, because some of the ridiculous conversations I've heard roll out through this, um, through this period, it is 15 per cent tax for every penny under $3 million, and it is 30 per cent tax for the pennies over $3 million. So let's just be really clear about that. No one's robbing anyone. And the beat-up and the scare campaign, obviously you're very excited about that on the opposition benches over there, but it is completely ridiculous. Yes, cost of living is a critical issue in this country at the moment. It is the thing that, that we over on this side, the Albanese Labor government, are deeply, deeply concerned about and working very hard for those solutions. But that's all right. You over there, the coalition, you keep fighting for the millionaires while, on the other hand, just chatting about cost of living. Well, it's easy now you're in opposition because you did absolutely nothing, nothing when you were in government. So you should be ashamed of yourselves for the behaviour over this last couple of hours. It's been ridiculous to listen to, totally ridiculous. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, this uh, question time showed quite clearly that the government has not been upfront with the Australian people over the past week. Obviously, the talking points went out this morning that they wanted to use the word modest uh, an immodest amount of time during question time. It was modest this, modest that, modest everything, until, until uh, the finance minister was a little too immodest and revealed, in fact, uh, that the amount of people that are going to be hit by Labor's doubling of the super tax is 20 times what they've been telling Australians over the past week. Over the past week, this government has been trying to tell fibs to the Australian people that only half a percent of you, only half a percent, don't worry about it, less than a percent of people are going to be impacted by our tax grab that we didn't, that is directly against what we promised you only a year ago at the election, but only, only those half a percent. You don't have to worry about that. Well, actually, it was revealed today that because of inflation, in fact, 10 per cent of Australians will pay this tax over their lifetime. That's what, this tax is a lifetime tax. It's about taxing you for saving for your own retirement. So it's not really about how many people have more than $3 million today. That doesn't raise a lot of money because there's not a lot of them. This is actually about taxing you in the future, taxing your future self, the self that you are trying to work hard for and uh, save for so you can have a dignified retirement. Now, the government's refusal to index that $3 million shows that, this is, that there is a hidden secret agenda here. The hidden agenda is to tax you more so that they can spend more, waste more on the various things uh, that the Labor Party, with their friends in the Greens, love to waste your money on. Because 10 per cent of people is a lot of Australians. It might be you. You don't know how your life's going to turn out. You might work hard and, and do well for yourself. You could very easily be, look around at yourselves, that only one in ten of you are going to be hit by this tax. This is the decimation of the Roman Legion. One in ten will be hit by this tax, thanks to the revelation of this secret modelling. Because not only has the government been keeping this secret from the Australian people, they have actual modelling we know now that they told no one about. In fact, I've been, I've been uh, uh, messaging some journalists uh, just now, and the journalists have been asking the government for these figures over the last few days. They've been asking for them, but surprise, surprise, no one has given them to them. Well, now we know there is a bunch of secret modelling there, and I would have thought this place, in this house, in this chamber, we should be holding the government to account and getting the full details of that secret modelling from the government. 
We need all of those details, not just the 10 per cent. We know 10 per cent are going to be hit, but then, then, then after being a little immodest, the finance minister went back to being uh, modest again, and she wouldn't tell us how much. Okay, this modelling, how much extra tax over their lifetime will those 10 per cent of Australians have to pay? That's surely in their modelling. It's not that hard to work out. And, and so where is that figure? We, need, we should, as a Senate, demand those figures before signing off on these changes. All of this modelling should be revealed. Because it doesn't take too hard to do some sums. If you do some sums, do some rough sums, say there's a 30-year-old there today, out there today with 200000 bucks in super, and if they're only earning 100000 a year, which is just over the average full-time wage now, $100,000 a year, and they make their normal mandated reg contributions, uh, their, their salary goes up with inflation, and, and they make they make uh, uh, the average returns on super, they will be over the $3 million threshold by the time of their retirement. That's someone on an average wage will be over the $3 million threshold if they start off with a bit of money. That's the power of compound interest. And if they do end up in this category, they will end up over their lifetime, if they, they live to just over 80 years old, average age once you retire, they will, they will pay an extra $700,000 in tax in their lifetime, thanks to this change. $700,000 of tax, because this tax hits you every year. It, it, it hurts the growth of your fund. It's a tax on saving, a tax on capital accumulation. It's the worst kind of tax because it hurts our overall economic strength. And, and, uh, so if the government is going to be fair dinkum with Australians, it should now do two things at a minimum. If they're going to be fair dinkum, they broke, already broke a promise to the Australian people. But to be fair dinkum, they should release this modelling so we all know, people know how much extra tax they're due uh, thanks to this broken promise from this government. And, and, and the government should commit to index this threshold, because if they really only want to hit half per cent of Australians, just index the threshold, and that argument will be taken away from me. The fact they're not doing that shows that they're actually not fair dinkum about this change. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, we still have, uh, Senator Rice, we still have 30 seconds to go before I put the motion. I assume you're sharing? No. I want to speak. So, Senator Roberts, are you on this one? No, I'm, I'm seeking the next spot. He's finished. Oh, I've haven't, I haven't put the question. It's a, diff it's a different question, Senator Roberts. I have, to put the, I have to put the question to the chamber. So I put, I put the question uh, to the motion moved by Senator Chan uh, Chandler. Those who question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Now, it's tradition, it has been in the past, the call gets given to the Greens because it's their question, Senator, Senator Roberts. No. To the crossbench. No. Senator Roberts was on his feet first. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm to, in the hands down, I'm of the happy to sit down with the Greens and negotiate a roster yeah, in the I would prefer, I I would rarely... prefer the, the whip, because the, pra the practice has been, since I've been the chair, has been that the, the, the party that asks the question generally, not that it's, it's not about, thank you for the commentary, Senator Canavan. So uh, today, today I'll give the call to the, to the Greens to they ask the questions and I'll see if you can negotiate something. If not, well then we'll, I will reflect on that and Discuss the behaviours with the uh, discuss going forward with the whips. Well, I'm not I'm not conversant with what conversations I've had with the whips, so I'll give the call to Senator Rice, and I'm happy to take remonstrations outside of the cha chamber. Thanks, President. I seek to take note of Senator Gallagher's answer to my question. Um, it was very good to hear that the government has committed to funding the increase in wages for aged care workers by the 15% as the Fair Work Commission told them they needed to in full in the coming financial year. This 15 per cent increase in the coming financial year is the least that the government needed to commit to. And, you know, we were outraged at their attempts to spread it out over two years. I'm glad that they have come to their senses and have committed to funding it over one year. Aged care workers are some of the most poorly paid workers in the country. They are generally women and that they are generally inc struggling incredibly with the cost of living. That 15 per cent increase is going to actually make it slightly more possible that they'll be able to pay the rent, to put food on the table, to pay for their own bills whilst working incredibly hard, caring for some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And increasing the wages and conditions of aged care workers is fundamental to increasing the quality of care 
for our older Australians, whether they are in residential care, whether they are receiving home care. We know that when aged care workers are paid better, when they've got better conditions, when they are not being rushed off their feet, that older Australians get better care. And that's what all Australians want to see. They want to know that our older people in residential care who are being cared for in home care are actually getting the care that they deserve, having worked all of their lives so hard and now reliant on other people to help care for them. It's the least that we can do. Um, but we also know that we're in a situation that, yep, we are paying those, we have now got this commitment for that 15 per cent increase. But aged care providers are losing, on average, $28 per resident per day. And we know that the health sector union, they called not just for a 15 per cent increase, but a 25 per cent increase to bring the wages of aged care workers up to a reasonable level. And by bringing them up to that level, it means that more people are going to feel that they can afford to work in aged care. There are so many people. I know the home care workers that help care for my mum. There's a churn of workers, and for a lot of them it's not because they don't like the work, but because the wages that they have been paid are so low that they can't afford to keep working in that work, and that they will keep their eyes open for anything that will pay them more money, and then they will go. And they, you know, so the, the churn of workers uh, people then don't have the continuity of care. They don't get the care that they need as you, you get a new worker coming in every month. I heard Senator Gallagher say that you know, the government needed to be fiscally responsible, that she was working very hard to try and find room in the budget so that we could pay the money that was needed to inc improve the conditions in aged care. The Royal Commission they were very clear that in order to fund all of their recommendations now two years ago, there was about an extra $10 billion a year that was needed. And so we heard you know, Senator Gallagher wringing her hand saying, yep, we're doing our best to try and find where we can find money in the budget. Well, there's an easy answer for the government. Here they are, trying to find out how they can wring little bits more out of the budget to try and support some of the lowest paid workers in the country to support older Australians, we know $10 billion a year is needed. There's an easy answer. The stage three tax cuts, the Morrison government stage three tax cuts are going to cost the budget bottom line $254 billion over the next 10 years, a quarter of a trillion dollars, on average $25 billion a year. It's actually quite easy to find that extra $10 billion and have change left over for all sorts of other things, for investing in, in affordable housing, for increasing income support. Abandon the stage three tax cuts. It's the obvious thing to do. Yes, the other side, they will scream and carry on like they have been doing about the minuscule changes that you're currently making to super tax concessions, but we know that the average Australian will thank you for it. Abandon the stage three tax cuts, which are going to mean billions of dollars going to the ultra wealthy to billionaires, to millionaires, people who have already got so much, and instead invest that money where it's needed in improving wages and conditions for low-paid workers Thank and you, increasing the— I put, I put the question. Those of the questions say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts says 30 seconds remaining that hasn't been used. Would you like to move a motion to take note? Yes, I would, Chair. Please Thank go. you. The Labor Party thinks it's easy to just fob off this debate about broken political promises. This is about something far bigger. This is about the future of our country and this very parliament. We have got people dying in their thousands from the injections, and it has not been passed, not been approved by United States authorities, bypassed by the Department of Defence. So what we want is a proper, fair, royal commission into the COVID injections uh, and Senator, the whole treatment of COVID. Uh, Senator Roberts, which question were you taking note of, moving to take note of? Number six. Number six, uh, you've moved that. I put the question. Those the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, Senator Hanson Young. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that one, the Senate rejects the Minister's claim of public interest immunity over documents and modelling that would demonstrate the forecast and use of Australian carbon credit units. This information would not in any way disclose the deliberations of Cabinet Ministers. And two, that there be laid on the table by the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong, by 4 p.m. this Thursday, the 9th of March. The documents and modelling relied on for the forecast usage of Australian credit, carbon credit units over the decade to 2030. Thank you. Are there any other notice of motion to be given another day? Uh, Senator Hanson Young, I have on my list uh, a possibility of a withdrawal. It, yes, it's the Sarah five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, pursuant to notice of intention given on the 9th of February 2023, I withdraw business of the Senate. Notice of motion number one, standing in my name for today, proposing a disallowance. Thank you, Senator. Uh, are there any other senators which to make a have any notice of motion to be given another day? Otherwise, I'll move on. I shall now proceed with the to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. I move, I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senator Brown from the 6th to the 9th of March 2023 for personal reasons; Senator Dodson for the 9th of March 2023 on account of parliamentary business; Senator Farrell for the 8th and 9th of March 2023 on account of ministerial business, and Senator McCarthy from the 6th to the 9th of March 2023 on account of ministerial business. Thank you. Senator Askew, and then I'll come to you, <laughs> Senator McKim. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. It's leave gr granted. Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senator O'Sullivan for the 6th of March for personal reasons; Senator Chandler for the 9th of March for personal reasons; Senator Dean Smith for the 6th to the 9th of March for personal reasons; and Senator McLaughlin for the 8th and 9th of March for a parliamentary delegation. Senator McKim. Uh, do you need to put the question on those? Uh, I do, but since I have neglected, thanks for your care, I might do it. I might put all three together. Oh, uh, indeed, uh, Deputy President. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators: Senator Cox for the sixth and seventh of March for personal reasons, and Senator Faruqi for the eighth of March for personal reasons. I put the question for all the leaves of leaves of absence. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck and others, uh, postponed from today to the 8th of March. Committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 10 on today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Question. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Uh, Senator Roberts, I have on my list, but yes, are you ready for that? Right, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am ready. Great. <laughs> Always ready. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 124 before it's asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The amendment changes the return date from 9th of February to 9th of March this year. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? I, there is no objection. Senator. I move the motion as amended. I put the. You, Minister. I take leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, the, government, 
The government will be opposing this motion. The cost described in Senator Roberts' motion will be disclosed in the normal process through public expenditure reporting when PEMS functionality resumes. As Senator Roberts would know, during routine public expenditure reporting, parliamentarians and their officers have an opportunity to examine their expenditure to ensure all costs are true and correct. Officers have not yet had a chance to properly examine this expenditure. Accurate reporting of parliamentary expenses is a key pillar of our transparent democratic system and is essential to ensure the proper use of Commonwealth funds. I put, I'll put the question. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
The question uh, before the chamber is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts, number 124, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left of the chair. I appoint a teller for the ayes, Senator Askew, teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 37 ayes and 15 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. We now come to motion 125, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 125 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? I move the motion. There was no objection. I put, I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. So division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
the doors. The question before the Senate is that the motion moved by Senator Roberts, number 125, be agreed to. Those the question passed to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. The result of the division is 27 ayes and 28 noes. It's passed in the negative. Senator Shoebridge, may I suggest a, a wander to your seat? Senator Shoebridge, you have the oh, call. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that General Business notice of motion number 158 proposing the int introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is no objection. Senator. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Governor-General Act 1974 and for related purposes. I put the, I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Uh, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Uh, I move uh, that this. No, uh, the clerk. Act 1974 and for related purposes. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. If leave granted. Leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave. To have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thanks. Honourable Senators, Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Can you wave your arm around, Jordan? Thank you. I note the requisite support has been indicated. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, we are witnessing something extraordinary and devastating unfolding in this country. The lives of the poorest Australians, those can least, who can least afford to be made worse off, are being degraded in the relentless and dogmatic pursuit of a self-defeating economic goal. Renters and mortgage holders are being smashed by a reserve bank stuck in the past and in denial of reality. Tomorrow will be just the latest chapter of this unfolding ruination of the poorest Australians when the RBA does what it shouldn't do and lifts interest rates 
for the tenth consecutive time. And meanwhile, the government is more interested in ashen-faced commentary rather than doing what it was elected to do, which is actually to help people. We find ourselves, and we will find ourselves tomorrow, at the dead end of neoliberal economics. And at that dead end lies the inherent flaw in one of the hallmarks of this corrupt ideology, so-called independent central banking. Independent central banking is fundamentally undemocratic. The justification for one of the most important economic tools not being in the hands of elected government is that monetary policy is too important to be left to politics. We are told that interest rate decisions are best left to those who really understand the economy and that inflation is always and everywhere a function of excessive demand, that the RBA alone should be left to get under control. It's on this reductive logic that the RBA's nine consecutive rate rises have been based and gone unchallenged by the government. And it's on this reductive logic that tomorrow's tenth interest rate rise will again be based. But the logic is flawed. How do we know it's flawed? Well, because the RBA have told us so. Last month, the RBA said that between half and three quarters of the increase in inflation is a result of supply shocks. And the chair of the board of the RBA, Mr Lowe, said that, and I quote, there is very little that monetary policy can do to offset supply shocks. And again, he said, and I quote again, our models are not well suited for supply shocks. So there it is. Our glorious, technocratic, wise above all others, independent central bank, responding to a problem it can't understand with a solution that doesn't suit. And that's the great travesty happening before our eyes. We know interest rates are not the right tool to deal with the current inflation spike, but we are stuck in this bizarre Pavlovian state where the RBA raises interest rates to squash a non-existent price wage spiral and the government goes through its oh, nothing we can do about it routine and the poorest Australians, the renters and mortgage holders of this country who did nothing to create the problem of spiking inflation are paying the price. And we're supposed to believe that this is the best we can do while the wealthiest in this country continue to make off like bandits. Well, it's not good enough. And I say to Labor, people's lives are being destroyed. So wake up and do something about it. Tax corporate super profits. Tax the wealthy. Freeze rents. Make childcare free. Put dental and mental health into Medicare and raise income support. These are meaningful actions that Labor could do if they would just take their heads out of their centrist fundaments and look to the light on the hill. Please do something. Don't just sit there and pretend you Senator can't. Rennick. Acting Madam Deputy President, and it must be a blue moon tonight because it's not often I uh, agree with Senator McKim uh, on most of his motion. I'm not too keen on the uh, national freeze on rents, uh, even though I accept it's a genuine problem there in regards to the rents. Um, but much, much more needs to be done than just allowing an unelected and an unaccountable uh, RBA to run right and destroy the economy, destroy the economy through this blunt instrument known as qualitative easing. For too long, Western governments have relied on these central bankers who are unaccountable, 
who are all reported to, uh, all report to the International Bank of Settlements, and we've had that confirmed by Michelle Bullock in the last set of estimates, where she admitted she wouldn't release the minutes uh, of those meetings with the International Bank of Settlements because they wouldn't be allowed back at the table. I mean, that's not what I call accountability. But I'll address that issue on another day. I want to go back to the crux of this, which, of course, is the cost of living and the crisis that is going to be caused by the RBA's reckless behaviour. Reckless behaviour. And the problem with the RBA is that they are all lifers. The last four RBA governors all started work at the RBA. They've all had careers in the RBA, and they have no idea of what goes on in the real world. They are theor uh, uh, you know, theoretically, uh, they base everything on theory and very, very little on practice. And uh, I think that we need to look at, and I know that Simon Kim was touching on this, I didn't quite pick up all of it, but I think I'm on the same path as him. You know, they only deal with, and I've asked the RBA this myself, they only deal with the demand side. Right? What we've got here in Australia at the moment is, is that we've had supply shocks. So people often think that inflation is caused only by too much demand. That's not the case. And you know, if too much demand is trying to make ends meet, well, I'm sorry, but that's not too much demand. That's a lack of productivity in our own economy because we don't build enough nation-building infrastructure to actually provide essential services at affordable rates. And what we really need to do in this country is stop being afraid of building infrastructure, in particular what I call the Sovereign Seven, which are dams, uh, rail, road, power stations, telecommunications, um, and airports and ports. And those are the things that if we supply more of those things through quantitative easing, through quantitative easing, and now everyone, you know, I was brainwashed. It took me 30 years to unbrainwash myself because I had this rubbish forced down my throat at university. There is nothing wrong. We see companies do it all the time. They issue shares, they issue equity, they issue new equity to build a new mine. As a country, we can issue new equity to build infrastructure. It's debit asset, credit equity. Or if you want to call it, you can create an infrastructure banks uh, here at the federal government level, and they can lend to the state governments, and then the state governments pay interest back interest back to the National Infrastructure Bank and then the National Infrastructure Bank can pay dividends back through to the federal government, which will basically be a form of raising revenue, adding more infrastructure and more supply to the economy, which will push down the prices of essential services. And that's not just good for the cost of living, that will make it more competitive for our businesses to compete with other businesses in the world. Now, if you look at China, for example, they didn't go out and borrow billions and billions of dollars or trillions and trillions of dollars in US dollars. They actually did all that infrastructure building in China on the back of their own central bank. And should I add, we have a history here in Australia of doing the same thing. Uh, one of Australia's first governors, and he was the first governor to issue his own, our own currency, was Lachlan Macquarie. He built the Sydney Hospital, the Sydney Barracks, he, with our own currency the holy dollar. That was Australia's first currency. Unfortunately, today, that holy dollar is used as the logo for Macquarie Bank, who happened to actually act on, because of superannuation, and this is what people don't want to admit about superannuation, is the fact that that facilitated the privatisation of our infrastructure assets, so that now that they're in the hands of unelected uh, superannuation board me uh, members. But can I just say, though, there's other things we can do to ease demand uh, in, on inflation, and that is we should look at lowering the immigration rate. Now, most of our immigration, two thirds of our immigration rate, is driven by foreign students, and these foreign students, the universities, don't actually have to pay tax on the income derived by foreign students. So, if you want to talk about a super profits tax, let's make universities uh, pay tax on the profits they derive from foreign students that will reduce the demand caused by over-immigration. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I, too, rise to speak on the urgency motion uh, moved by Senator McKim. Uh, and the Albanese government is talking to Australians every day, uh, and we know that Australians are facing cost-of-living challenges. Um, we know that families are doing it tough. Um, we hear it every day. Uh, and after a decade of waste and rorts uh, and stagnant low wages, a pandemic and the war in Ukraine, 
Um, inflation is quite appropriately the top issue on our agenda. The Reserve Bank makes its decisions independently uh, in its response to addressing inflation, um, and uh, it should stay independent. Uh, and I think today's debate really shows exactly how important it is that the RBA sets rates, not politicians and not the politicians in this chamber. Um, our role as the government is to deliver a responsible economic plan uh, and to deliver relief to those who need it most, um, because it is a responsible plan that will help drive down inflation. Uh, and because of a decade of the former coalition government's wasted opportunities and their questionable priorities, um, we have a lot of work to do. We're dealing with a trillion dollars of debt uh, with absolutely nothing to show for it. So our response to inflation um, is our three-point plan, and our plan is about relief, repair and, importantly, restraint as well. We're providing cost of living relief that doesn't add to inflation. Um, this year, we've successfully argued for a minimum wage increase, and we're proud of that increase. Yeah. We've delivered cheaper medicines, which has seen Australians saving more than 36 million in the last two months. We know energy bills are a stress point for households, so we're working with the states and territories to provide energy bill relief, uh, and this will be a key policy in the May budget. Last December, we introduced emergency caps on gas prices, uh, and it's been confirmed in Senate estimates that this will push down future prices significantly. Um, according to Dr Kennedy, over the year to June 2024, our price caps will continue to reduce inflation by half a per cent. Uh, and this is also a point acknowledged by Mr Lowe, who cited in estimates our energy policy as a key downward force on inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we know people need relief from the rise of rising cost of living today as well, right now, today. So we're delivering cheaper childcare, we're delivering free TAFE, we're expanding paid parental leave, we're building more homes. Uh, and at the same time, we're repairing our economy. Uh, and Senator McKim does raise an important point. Um, it is supply shocks that, that have contributed to inflation. Uh, and the coalition did nothing in government to strengthen our supply chains, uh, and that's only made things worse for Australian families. Um, we have plans to repair our broken supply chains. We're doing that by investing in the long run of our economy. Our $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund will diversify our economy. It will bring manufacturing back to our shores. It will create secure, well-paid jobs. And we're investing in the renewables that will bring down energy prices as well and help us reach our emission targets too. So what is important right now is that as a government we make quality investments, quality investments that strengthen and diversify our economy, that secure our energy uh, and our supply chains and create new jobs across the economy. Now, notably, our plans don't add to inflation. Uh, and that's because we're being responsible and restraining our spending. Uh, we're returning 99 per cent of revenue upgrades to the budget over the next two years. The average of the last government was just 40 per cent. So the last thing that we want to be doing is contributing to inflation pressures. The plan is working and we need to stick to it. We know that Australians are doing it tough and we're taking responsibility for uh, addressing inflation. It is the defining challenge that we face right now this year, but we're prepared to face it with sensible plans. We're working every day to make Australians' lives better by delivering secure jobs, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines and investing in the long run of our nation with more housing, cleaner energy and bringing back manufacturing. This is what we were elected to do and we're getting on with the job. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, sorry, I, I, you Thank didn't you. hear me give you the call. I had done so. As a servant to the many different people making our amazing Queensland community, rental prices are a savage problem. Interest rate rises are increasing mortgage repayments and forcing more investment property owners to dip into their own pockets to pay their mortgage. If owners do not have that extra money, then negative gearing is not going to help. 
Inflation of 7.8 per cent means council rates, water rates, maintenance costs and insurance are making it harder and harder to hang on to investment properties. And now the Greens propose a rent freeze, which is really a 7.8 per cent rent reduction each year that it goes on. The only effect of a rental freeze will be to drive investment property owners out of the market. Australia needs investment property owners to provide a home to people who are renting. Driving them out of the market will hurt the 400,000 new Australians who arrived last year and the one million likely to arrive during the course of this government. Rising rentals are a product of too many people chasing too few rentals. We know 10 per cent of Australian homes are owned by investors who are, who are renting them, not renting them out. Their investment strategy is to buy a new home and keep it locked up while it appreciates in value. Having a tenant in there is a complication they don't want and lowers the resale value because the home is no longer new. Most of these properties are foreign owners. One nation would give these owners 12 months to sell those properties to Australians. Bringing that number of homes onto the market will do more to bring prices down than a price cap. And one nation will reduce immigration to net zero, meaning only enough arrivals arrive each year to replace those that leave. This will allow time for the housing construction industry to catch up with demand. It is about supply and demand. These are sensible, honest policies that are one nation solutions to high rents that will protect real estate values from the chaos a rental cap will introduce. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Dep Deputy President. I rise today to speak to the urgency motion put forward by Senator McKimmon. Once we have, again, we have to contend with the Greens political party uh, range of fantasies about the way in which the economy operates. Uh, Labor believes in real solutions for all Australians, not dramatic and impractical action. We need to use an evidence base, and evidence shows that rental freezes simply don't work. Uh, yet that is uh, one of the profferings from Senator McKim here for consideration by the Senate, and it should be rejected. To Australians, I say the Reserve Bank is independent, and it's at arm's length from government. There's a reason it was constructed that way, and it remains so. But that doesn't mean that, as a government, we don't understand what's happening for real Australians. We understand that both renters and mortgage holders are feeling the pain right now. They're feeling it, absolutely. And that's why we'll focus on real solutions, not fantasies in another world that doesn't exist, real solutions to address the real concerns of Australia in a fiscally responsible way. Re regulation of residential tenancies is frankly not a matter for federal governments, it's a matter for state and territory governments. And the Commonwealth can't actually even require those governments to freeze rents. So the motion falls over completely on its face just with that one point. In contrast, Labor is absolutely focusing on increasing the supply of new houses in the market, helping to increase supply through our $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund which will deliver 30,000 new homes in the first five years alone. Now, the Future Fund is only one part of our very ambitious and much-needed reform agenda to make up for nine lost years under the Liberal National Party. We're striking a new national housing accord between all levels of government, investors and industry, to build affordable homes our country really, really needs. We need to boost the supply of new houses. We're widening the National Housing Infrastructure Facility with up to $575 million available to invest in more social and affordable homes right across the country, with many projects already announced. The Regional First Home Buyer Guarantee was brought forward by three months. More than 2,000 places have already been taken up with hundreds of Australian families now in their new homes. Practical outcomes. That's what people need, not pie in the sky, muck it up as you go, see if you can get a headline on the way through. Help to Buy, a new program brought forward by the Albanese government, is here to help Australians get their own home sooner, establishing a permanent national housing supply and affordability council. Hard to believe that there wasn't one, but there wasn't for nine long years. This whole space has been profoundly neglected. Now, the interim council that we've established as a Labor government coming in under Prime Minister Albanese, has been operating uh, as an interim council since the 1st of January, providing independent expert advice to government. We're also developing a national housing and homelessness plan because everybody knows that that 
is at crisis point in our country. Now, the gentrified greens over there in the corner um, so often appear to be NIMBYs. Never seen an affordable housing or social project that they haven't opposed. Now, in my very own home state of New South Wales, the Greens candidate for Balmain outgoing MP campaigned against a plan for a mere six apartments. Six apartments. And the Greens opposed it. Three of them were designated as affordable housing. This, uh, the side of it is 180 Darling Street in Balmain. To the Greens, one new affordable housing built apartment is like a disaster. One new home to a middle or working class family is one entirely too many. Well, I come in here with ideas that are absolutely implausible and impractical. They're out of touch. Now, the Greens political party need to understand that increased supply will drive down prices. And if that political party with a Green in front of it was actually caring about reducing rents and prices for councillors, uh, they, they'd actually cared about reducing rents and prices, their councillors and candidates across Australia would stop opposing reasonable new property developments. They have to be reasonable, but there's got to be new stock built. You can't just stop everything. You just can't do it. Inflation is a worldwide problem caused by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Supply chains are strained by war and global pandemics. We've got to get inflation under control. And we're helping with cost of living, childcare, medicines, direct energy bill relief, minimum wage rise and fee-free TAFE. That's real. That's practical. That's Labor. That's Australia's government. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Every single day that goes by without subsidising skyrocketing energy bills, without raising wages, without effectively dealing with the housing crisis, without stabilising interest rates, this government from the Labor political party is choosing poverty for millions of people across the country. Poverty is a political choice, and it's a choice that this government, the Labor political party, is making each day. While corporate profits hit record numbers, there are more than half a million people languishing on the social housing waitlist across the country. And while there are five and a half million people relying on Centrelink payments below the poverty line, and this government is deciding to give $240 -odd billion in tax breaks to the super wealthy. And while even, 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 even standing up while people in this place are about to pocket an extra $9,000 a year in tax cuts. What, and, and they accept that wages for ordinary people and, and ordinary people's living standards are going backwards. And tomorrow, when the RBA raises interest rates again, the Labor political party will cry crocodile tears and say there's nothing they can do. That is a surrender of political leadership, and it's entrenching intergenerational disadvantage. And in, in my hometown of Sydney, we've seen property and rental prices at historic highs. Young people in particular are suffering, and we've seen the Labor Party get into bed with property developers every time they're in government and never address affordable housing. There's never been a property developer that the New South Wales Labor Party hasn't loved, and it's never, ever succeeded in providing housing for the people who need it. And the data shows that in Sydney, from Palm Beach to Cronulla, across the Balkan Hills, you actually need to earn $100,000 a year just to avoid housing stress. And it's obscenely common for people to be getting $100, $200 or $300 a week rental increases. No one, no one is getting a pay rise of that magnitude. But of course, some uber-rich people are going to be offered tax breaks even greater than that by the Labor political party. We should step in and support much-needed rent freezes. It's a simple, achievable and meaning step to hit pause on the cost of living crisis. Just press pause on it. I've been out at Addison Road Food Pantry in Marrickville in the heart of Sydney and seen just how many people are coming in asking for help with putting food on the table right now. It's going to get worse tomorrow. They know, those people know that they can rely on their community to pitch in and they should expect their government to do, to, to do the same. I've joined with Turbans for Australia out in Clyde at their warehouse where they provide food for those who need it because of the policy failures of federal and state governments. They are taking the time to understand the real cost of living crisis. And if you say you care about support, supporting those who are doing it tough, then you need to step up on delivering that. And this Labor political party needs to deliver policies that help the people most in need. Senator Ormond Payne. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Australians continue to suffer in a cost of living crisis caused by corporate profits. Yet the RBA, aided and abetted by the Labor political party, continue to kick the teeth of workers by jacking up interest rates. Right. We now have fresh evidence that inflation above the target rate is being driven largely by corporate profiteering. The RBA knows this, and the government knows this too. And yet again, working Australians are being pummeled by the blunt tool of monetary policy being forced to suffer for the inflation that they are not causing. The government is delighted to be able to keep the RBA's interest rate rises at arm's length, but the government is also to blame for the cost of living crisis Australians have found themselves in through no fault of their own. We've seen time and time again a government unwilling to take meaningful action on cost of living relief. What we don't need are useless platitudes. What we need is a government brave enough to actually make policy decisions. We need to reverse the atrocious quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts for the super rich. We need an immediate rent freeze and we need public education that is truly free. If Labor scrapped their stage three tax cuts, we could fund real cost of living relief. We could have a two-year freeze on rents, and then we could cap rent hikes at 2 per cent for 24 months. It's been done in Victoria, British Columbia, New York and Germany. Let's do that here too and give real meaningful cost of living relief to Australians. We could make public education truly, fit, truly free. We've seen the exorbitant costs that even parents of students in public schools are having to pay for their child's education. And we're hearing how high university students are getting smashed by student debt and people trying to pay off hex bills are having that eat into their income. Of the $243.5 billion of Labor's stage three tax cuts, $188 billion, or 77 per cent of the benefit, will go to the wealthiest 20 per cent of the population. Even worse, you're giving the richest 1 per cent as much as the bottom 65 per cent. Australians deserve a government that's serious about cost of living, that abolishes tax cuts for the rich. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Well, we are in the midst of the cost of living crisis in this country, and we hear day after day after day of the struggles of everyday people to afford rent to afford their hike in mortgage repayments, to put food on their table and to buy uniforms at the beginning of the year for their kids. And yet here uh, in Canberra, the government is overseeing two of the government's biggest government-owned corporations, Australia Post and NBN Co., whose executives, who this year alone have banked over half a million dollars in bonuses. The CEO of Australia Post, $2 million salary, over half a million dollars in bonuses. We know that the CEO of MBN Co, Stephen Rao, was paid nearly $700,000 in bonuses that pushed his salary up to nearly three million bucks. Now, I ask the everyday Australian out there, how is your MBN going? Good? Is it worth nearly $3 million by the guy who's running the gig? I don't think so. So while everyday people are struggling, these fat cat executives on the public payroll in government-owned corporations are raking it in. Now, we've seen the polite letters written by the ministers, uh, the shareholder ministers to both Australia Post and MBN Co. But I say this, put the pen down and take some actual action. We actually need caps on these bonuses and salaries and to start installing public expectations of the wages, you, salaries Senator and bonuses. Hanson Young. 
Your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. All of that's opinion say aye. Those against? I'll put it again. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Oh, sorry, we're past that part. <laughs> So I'm going to appoint Senator, um, Senator Scar for the nose, and it looks like Senator McKim.
for the eyes. The result of the division is eyes 10, nose 25. The question is resolved in the negative. Thank you, Clark. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Hume, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. And with the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the times according, the clock accordingly. Uh, I call Senator McGrath to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Hume, I move the motion. And the motion is the need for Prime Minister Albanese to not break his promise to Australians when he said on 2 May 2022, we've said we have no intention on making any super changes by committing to not hitting Australians with more taxes on their super and to rule out any new taxes on the family home, negatively geared assets, trust and retirees' incomes. In the last two weeks, Acting Deputy President, we have seen this Labor government break faith with the Australian people with unprece unprecedented candour and shamelessness. Prime Minister Albanese doesn't take his past promises to the Australian people as rules, he doesn't even take them as guidelines. How else can you ca characterise a Prime Minister who looked Australians in the eye and said, and I quote, we've said we have no intention on making any super changes, end of quote, then skips, strides, wombles into the Prime Minister's courtyard and announces that super taxes will be doubled. And it's not just the Prime Minister who thinks commitments to the Australian people are simply campaign tactics to be discarded once you make it onto the blue carpet and into the ministerial limo. Labor's Treasurer had the gall to say to the Australian people in April 2022, and I quote, we've made it very clear that we don't have any proposals for tax increases, end of quote. There are there's a pretty obvious reason why Labor wasn't up front about this before the election, because they knew Australians would not vote for it. The more Australians learn about this super tax, the more we can see how shifty this Labor government has been. First of all, they would say, they'd said it would impact about 80,000 Australians. And now we know, we learned in question time today, that 10 per cent of Australians are going to be impacted by this super tax. And unlike the super transfer balance cap, they have ruled out indexing the $3 million cap. Now, what Labor here are making a massive mistake because a lot of people I know don't have 
Actually, I don't know anyone who's got $3 million in, in their super account, but I know lots of people who do want to have $3 million in their super account. And I spent last week driving from Cairns down to Townsville, going along talking to people, and people were pretty angry about this. No one I spoke to has $3 million in their super account, and they probably never will. But they say to the people who do, good on you. You worked hard for it. Good on you, mate. Get out there. I'm pretty happy for you. And so what Labor are doing, what they're saying to people out there who've worked hard is, we're going to tax you. But what the people out there are also concerned about is, Labor have broken this promise. What other promises are going to break? But they know that Labor will decrease the threshold. So if the threshold is set at $3 million, the next budget will be two and a half, and then it'll be two, and then suddenly all all your super accounts will fall into Labor's trap. And this comes, Acting Deputy President, to the central tenet of why we are so upset at Labor's breaking this election promise. Because we're on the side of Australians and their money. Because it is their money. Labor think the people's super accounts is the money that Labor can go and raid. Labor can be like one of those little uh, little bugs that gets into, into electronic systems and goes in there and empties out people's super accounts. I say shame on Labor for what you are going to do to, to the confidence in Australia's financial services system. But there are so many questions that need to be answered about this proposal. How will it deal with unrealised capital gains? How will real assets be valued? How exactly does this impact defined benefit schemes? which? the Prime Minister is on. How will valuation increases be calculated? Labor is quite happy to mislead the Australian people, willingly break election promises and make false statements prior to the election in pursuit of electoral success, and then doesn't even have the decency to be transparent with the Australian people. Now, we should have expected this from the Treasurer, as we know that Dr Chalmers did his PhD on Paul Keating. Paul Keating, you know, the guy who said, Australia, we've got to have a recession. Come on, this is the recession we had to have. So we can see where this government's going down, can't we, ladies and gentlemen? We can see where this government is heading. Now Dr Chalmers' new super tax hike is alongside his idol Paul Keating's LAW law tax hikes in the pantheon of historic broken promises by Labor treasurers. I'm sure the Treasurer is proud of being in such distinguished company as Paul Keating, who sent so many people bankrupt. So, many pe so much hardship was caused by him, by what he did to the Australian economy, and now we see Labor with their secret taxes that they didn't want to tell the Australian people before the election coming out and going after people's super accounts. Time's Shame expired. on Labor. Senator McGrath. I call Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I take a great deal of delight actually getting up and speaking on this because you know, we heard um, in, in the last number of weeks that you know, we've heard about Dutton's, you know, uh, sorry, the opposition leader, um, saying that um, he's the campaigner for the middle class, the working class. But actually, what he's a campaigner for is the billionaires. Because what we saw with the Liberal Party, we've seen them actually change. We saw the, the Liberals that were under Howard's battlers. Now we've got Dutton's battlers, the billionaires. We Dutton's billionaires need to be looked after. We have to make sure that those billionaires that have squirrelled away $543 million in superannuation concessions have to be looked after. So Dutton's billionaires can be looked after. So what we've seen is and the reason we're in this position about why we need to make sure these changes are fair and equitable is that the concessions that are paid, which will still be concessions for those billionaires and those millionaires and those $100,000 and those $50,000 people in this community, will still be making sure that there is a proper incentives to make sure that superannuation is continues in this economy. Because what's quite clearly happened is that we've got a situation where we have a trillion dollars worth of debt. We have to work out how we make sure that the books are balanced. And the people that can turn around and assist in that balancing of the books are the ones that also receive benefit. This is about a progressive approach to tax. This is about making sure that those people in superannuation, which was set up to make sure that it's properly amount of money when people retire, a proper amount of money for people to be able to turn around and retire on, 
is properly protected. But it's also about making sure that those concessions are for those people that superannuation was first initially geared up for. Because what we've seen from the Liberal Party, this isn't just about Dutton's billionaires. This is actually about an attack on super, because we all know they hate superannuation. They actually hate the whole concept of superannuation. They hate poorer people receiving super, because they're the ones, whilst complaining about the billionaires getting a, still a tax concession, those people with more than $3 million in their super still getting a tax concession but making sure they pay a fairer level of tax. At the same time, they've turned around and the same people that have deferred increases for superannuation on the superannuation guarantee for those struggling people that are working class people in this country, that are the middle class in this country. They're the ones that stood by and saw young people missing out on the multiplier of that minimum increase in superannuation over 10 years from this uh, previous government. They're the same people that have turned around and made sure that the amount of money that people can take home at the end of the day is not the same amount of money they need to be taking home that was foreshadowed in increases as a matter of intergenerational change for matters of increases for the both working class people and middle class people in this country. Now, we have to clearly turn around and make a decision. If we are going to fix the trillion dollars worth of debt, if we want to make sure we have the money and resources to put into aged care, to put back into our society, to put back into those areas where we need to have price relief, those areas that we need to be able to deal with the sorts of issues with uh, energy pressures and also relief with, um, uh, on price relief on energy, that we need to be turning around and making sure that we make the right decisions in the right policy areas. Now, I know we've got Dutton's billionaires on one side. We've got Howard's battlers now deserted, if they're ever actually on side with them. We know the reality of that. They're never really on side. They're never really Howard's battlers. They're people being used. They're sort of like the Trump battlers, trying to use and abuse people by giving missed policy direction. But at least he pretended he was representing the broad cross-section of the community. At least he had the, had, the, had the capacity to pretend he was representing the vast majority of Australians, unlike Dutton and the, the opposition minister, uh, the opposition leader, in the sort of approach he's taken on this question about superannuation. But you know what really what's really striking is the number of economists, academics, and my goodness, I never thought I'd be agreeing on, on this aspect, but even the CEO of the NAB says it's a fair thing. But don't worry, person after person after person from the opposite side gets up and says, our billionaires need to be protected. Let's all stand together. Let's make sure those billionaires Sheldon, get the sort of protection they deserve. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Well, uh, thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. <laughs> Won't someone please think? of the multi-millionaire superannuants. I mean, who is going to go into bat for these battlers? These battlers who are going to go from uh, one high-class grade of champagne down to the next level, oh. one, uh, one brand of luxury car down to the next luxury car. I mean, who is going to think of these multi-millionaire battlers in this place? That's right. The, the Liberal National Party. It is emblematic of the malaise in Australian politics that this extremely modest proposal and extreme fiddling at the margins by the Labor Party is getting this level of attention from the Liberal National Party. I'll tell you what, Australians are sick and tired of a political system that caters to the interests of the wealthy elite while too many people are struggling to put food on the table in this country. Even under Labor's minimalistic plan, multimillionaires will be able to pay a lower marginal tax rate on their superannuation earnings than someone on the average wage. Now that just goes to show you how far the Labor Party has fallen from its origins. And that's why the Australian Greens have put forward a proposal to tax more people twice as hard as Labor and cut in earlier than Labor's proposal, and that will ensure 
that the wealthiest Australians pay closer to their fair share of tax and help the government fund measures that will genuinely help with the cost of living crisis and genuinely help lift people out of poverty. Our plan would raise about $55 billion over the next decade, which could be used to help lift people out of poverty by increasing social security payments or doubling rent assistance. Labor is proposing to fiddle at the margins on superannuation tax concessions while proceeding with the stage three tax cuts for the wealthy. That is just a money-go-round scheme for the rich and it is robbing Peter to pay Peter. People with $1.9 million or more in their superannuation funds do not need assistance from the taxpaying public. It's time for the government to prioritise the needs of all Australians and invest in measures that will actually benefit the many, not just the few. I urge the Labor Party to accept the Greens' constructive suggestion to remove all tax concessions from super funds with balances of over $1.9 million from 1 July this year. That would make Senator Australia Bikin, a fairer place to live. Senator your time has expired. Senator Babette. Nine months, nine short months in power for this Labor government. That is all it took them to start raiding the retirement funds of hard-working Australians. Their official position has seamlessly moved from no changes to super to a conversation around super and now doubling your tax rate. But don't worry, don't worry. It's only going to impact a small percentage of Australians. But for how long? For how long? How long is that going to last? Probably not very long. Typical labour class warfare, another broken promise, but are you surprised? I can just imagine retirees grinding their teeth at the very concept of Super Jim's proposal. Treasurer Jim Chalmers clearly seems, sees himself as a modern-day Robin Hood, taking from the rich and giving to the, not the poor, no, no, giving to himself, giving to the federal government. Our nation, we are trapped in a cycle of debt and deficits for which both sides of government are responsible. Now, it appears to be politically inconvenient for any government to attempt to balance the budget or repay our debt. You know what? As bad as each other. I guess everyone here just loves their political careers just a bit too much. Now, whatever happened to courage? What happened to that? What happened to the greater good? The Australian people, they are hurting. Their budgets are being smashed, smashed by unchecked inflation and they're cutting costs wherever they can. Forget eating out, forget family holidays, a mortgage comes first. Our Treasurer must emulate the actions of the Australian people. Tighten your fiscal belt. Produce a lean budget that is suitable for tough times. Raiding superannuation like a thief in the night is not the answer. It is not. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bibet. to call Senator Scarf. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The heart of this motion which we're discussing this afternoon is a broken promise. It is a broken promise. So those on the other side of the chamber can get up in this place and accuse those of us sitting on the other side of various nefarious things. But it was their Prime Minister. Their Prime Minister gave a guarantee to the Australian people before the election, before the election that there would be no changes to the superannuation system. That's what we're debating here, a broken promise. And when we reflect on how the public perceives us as politicians, as representatives in this place, we just all, all of us, collectively got a little bit hurt when the Prime Minister, when the Prime Minister made an ironclad promise, and I'll quote, this is what our Prime Minister said on 2 May 2022, less than 12 months ago. Less than 12 months ago, this is what he said. We've said we have no intention to make any super changes." End quote. It's not qualified. It's not, we'll consider it. We'll look at the budget position. Everyone knew what the budget position was before the last federal election. In fact, it's improved. It's improved through the forecast, but the Prime Minister made an ironclad guarantee. We've said we have no intention 
to make any super changes. End quote. And he's broken his promise. He's broken his promise. The Australian people have a right, have a legitimate expectation that all of us, from whatever party, when before an election we say we're going to do something, we do it. And if we say we're not going to do something, we don't go ahead and do it anyway. That's the issue. That is the fundamental issue that we're debating here today. That is the fundamental issue. And people of Australia will reflect upon this. They will reflect upon it, a broken promise, an ironclad guarantee less than 12 months ago, and then a broken promise. And they'll also reflect upon how this has been done. And there were questions asked today of the finance minister, and I note she did take a number of questions on notice, as she's entitled to two. But I must say, I read the Treasury Better Targeted Superannuation Concessions paper, the five pages, and the way I read it, the way I read it, it's quite clear. It's quite clear that unrealised capital gains will be treated and taxed as if they're earnings. Now, this is a problem in terms of people's superannuation funds. Let me tell you why. If, for example, you had a share in BHP, and there'd be many, many superannuation funds with shares in BHP, one July, I should say 30 June 2008, the share price of BHP was $43.76. 30 June 2012, it was $31.45. The next year it was $35.90. So at the end of each year, between each year, year on year capital increases, the way Treasury's guidance says that would be treated, any increase in the value of those shares, even if you haven't disposed of them, will be taxed. And that is clearly inappropriate. It is clearly inappropriate for superannuation funds, where you want to maintain the assets and stability over a cycle. It is clearly inappropriate. And I really it, it baffles me how our Treasury came up with this, uh, and, and the, the reason they give is they think it's actually going to be easier for superannuation funds to administer. I don't understand how anyone who has any working knowledge of what long-term investment strategies mean in practice could actually promote an idea where people are going to be liquidating their assets on the short term to fund tax liabilities. It doesn't make any sense. And I call upon the finance minister to liaise with the Treasury Department, or with the Treasurer's Treasury Department, and consult with them on this because it does not make sense. And it particularly doesn't make sense for especially our farming communities, where many fa farming families put the family property into a self-managed super fund. At times of drought, the value of the farm goes through the floor. But when we do have good seasons, beef prices are high, wheat prices are high. The value of the farm goes up. But if it's unrealised, if that value is unrealised, it should not be taxed. It should be not taxed. That is a simple proposition. And I do call upon those opposite to reflect deeply on that, because it would be a travesty if that system was introduced. Thank you, Senator Scar. I call Senator Polly. Well, this motion from Senator Hume is so predictable. It's extraordinary to see the Liberal Party of Australia, who gave the Australian people one trillion dollars, one trillion dollars of national debt, and wants to borrow even more money to subsidise people with more than three million dollars in their superannuation accounts. But that's the Liberal Party of Australia today, a political party with all the wrong priorities. As a government, we have to make tough decisions, and we have to make, we have to make decisions to help pay down the almost trillion dollars of debt left by the Morrison Liberal government. This is a practical change that will improve the budget bottom line by $2 billion a year. Now, let's not forget that the average Australian, the average Australian worker, would have $120,000 on average in their superannuation account. But they're the people that those opposite don't care about. They don't care about them. They want them to continue with their superannuation at that low level, and they're worried about that percentage of people that have over $3 million. And let's not forget, 
even above that three million dollars, they will still get a taxation um, that is still lower than what they would pay uh, normally. So it is still a concessional rate of taxation that they're going to be asked to pay. So if those opposite want to come in here and fight for a person that has $400 million in their superannuation, then let's have the fight at the next election, because these changes will not come into effect until after the next election. But I really think that somebody who has $400 million in their superannuation account can pay, can pay more tax and should be paying more tax than someone who has $120,000 in their superannuation. These changes will only affect about 80,000 people, or 0.5 per cent of okay, Australians. This is new policy, which does not take effect, as I said, until the, after the next federal election. The increase the tax on superannuation earnings to 30 per cent for superannuation balances over $3 million. This means that for the 99.5 per cent of Australians who have a superannuation balance under the $3 million, there will be no change in their circumstances. So no matter how desperate those opposite are to actually run a scare campaign, the reality is that Australians are able to see through those on the opposition benches now because they saw through them at the last election. But the Albanese Labor government is committed to ensuring that the superannuation system is protected but is sustainable. This change will ensure that the system is fairer for all Australians. So I put it to those opposite. If you don't agree with this change, you need to nominate where the money will come from instead. The last time they were in government, that's those opposite, they came after Medicare and sent debt letters to pensioners. They rorted grants and schemes here. Or, I take, Sorry, I take a, a point of order in relation— If you could resume your seat. Uh, I, I'm Order. I'm willing for, to put up with a little bit of banter across the chamber, but when it descends into yelling, no matter how passionately you might feel that the, the views that you're putting, Senator uh, Hughes, it's not appropriate. So it would be best for the chamber if Senator Polly was allowed to continue her remarks with people listening, uh, in agreement or disagreement, it doesn't matter, just listening. Um, Senator Polly, you have the call. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. The last time they were in government, they came after Medicare, and we know that they sent the debt into overdrive. We also know that they sent out debt letters to pensioners and other people who owed nothing to the government, absolutely nothing. And we want to go on about the rorts of the other schemes that they were involved in. Do we want to uh, try and whitewash what robo debt was really all about? Because you know, with the ministers that have been uh, giving evidence into the royal commission, they can't seem to recall very much. But the Australian people do recall. They recall that the Morrison government was known and will go down in history as the most rorting government that we have seen in since Federation. We had Mr Stuart Robert giving evidence last week and said that cabinet solidarity trumps the ministerial standards. What a joke he is. What a joke. And those people here now come into this place bleating about a change in superannuation that will affect 0.5 per cent of the Australian population. Those people were—you're a joke. You are an absolute joke. Senator, they want to try and rewrite your time history has this by. I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I really want to talk about Labor's broken promise around superannuation, but I feel like we need to correct on the record a few things here. Uh, with regards to Medicare and who has actually taken the knife to it, because we know it's those opposite who have decided to remove mental health uh, access for Australians, particularly as we continue to recover from COVID. So whilst we know they break promises, we know they can't tell the truth either. 
And that's what this is. This is a series of lies to the Australian people that started with the now Prime Minister before the last election saying there would be no changes to superannuation. But then, of course, Dr Chalmers, as he pumped out his essay over the summer, then decided that, you know, there won't be any major changes to superannuation. It's something that we might consider, we'll have a conversation about. And as the kite flew higher again, Prime Minister Albanese was out there denying that there would be changes to superannuation. But at this stage of the game, they realised all too late that the kite flying hadn't worked and they quickly raced through a cabinet decision that we learned today isn't going to impact the 0.5 per cent of Australians that was bleated so loudly from those opposite, but that in effect it is actually 10 per cent of Australians who are going to see their superannuation impacted. But not that we're ever shown any modelling, or in fact most of the time, and you'll go back through the safeguard mechanism inquiry and learn that we don't actually do modelling anymore under this government, uh, but there is no indexation to this $3 million. And, you know, we know what houses cost 20 years ago versus what they cost today. We know what inflation is doing as of this very moment. We know what's happening with CPI. We know that $3 million today is not going to be the same as $3 million in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time. And for every Australian who's out there embarking on their career, starting their working life now, by the time they get to retirement age in 40 years, 50 years, they very well may have $3 million plus in superannuation. But now we know as this will not be indexed, that Labor is going to continue to come for their money. And what we need to remember here, this is Australians' money, not, as apparently the great ABBA fan, uh, Stephen, oh gosh, what's the, Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones, the Assistant Minister, <laughs> Mr Jones, uh, you know, honey, honey, oh, you kill me. That's how he refers to your money. Oh, he can't wait to dip his fingers in your honey and get to spend all that wonderful superannuation that everyday Australians work so hard for that they put away for their retirement. And we learn also today that questions cannot be answered whether or not those Australians who will be impacted, that have invested in their superannuation under long-term rules that have been in place encouraging Australians to put more away for their retirement, we don't know if those Australians can make alternate arrangements now without penalty because those opposite don't have the details of their own policy. We don't know. We potentially could also see introduced into this country for the first time, or perhaps if there was one, I think I heard a rumour, African country that wasn't going too well when they tried it, but to tax unrealised profits. So then what means if you invest in a commercial property or other sort of property for your self-managed super fund, into shares, into anything that you may invest in, which the purpose of investment is for that to increase in value, you will now be slugged with twice the rate of tax for an unrealised asset. What that will mean, you may have to sell the very property or investment that you had invested and put money into and worked hard to achieve, you may have to liquefy, li liquidate that to pay a tax bill. How that is ensuring Australians are able to retire in the way that they work so hard to do so is absolutely outrageous and, quite frankly, it's un-Australian. And we've just heard from a number of those opposite that it's going to happen after the election. They're not taking it to the election. It's just being implemented after the election. Well, if you're being honest and if you're being upfront with the Australian people, take it to an election. Take it to an election with details. Tell them how much money you want to take. Tell them when negative gearing's next. Tell them when you're paying ta they'll be paying tax on their family home. Take it to an election and be honest with the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Propose the, pro um, the question is that the proposal moved by Senator McGrath on senators. Order. I can't even hear myself. The, propose, the question is that the motion moved by Senator McGrath on the proposal of Senator Hume be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. There's only one voice. 
I'll put it again. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The, the noes have it. Um, is there a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. <clears throat> so the question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller. Oh, there you are. Sorry. 
I appoint Senator Scar as teller for the eyes and Senator Pratt as teller for the nose. Order, there being 24 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents uh, which are listed on the Senate Order of Business at page four. Uh, does anybody wish to speak, speak to documents presented by the President? Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to document eight listed today an OPD relating to the Bunbury Outer Ring Road project in Western Australia. This project uh, has Senator been— Senator Young, can you just hold for a moment? I just want to work my way through and make sure that we've got it all covered. So um, documents presented by the president. Are there any people who wish to speak to that? No. Thank you. Order to general reports. No one's seeking the call. We're into documents in response to orders of, for the production of documents. And Senator Hanson Young, you were speaking the call on item eight in that section on page four. Yes, I am. Sorry. Uh, Please continue. No, I just wanted to be clear. Madam, that I haven't acting, cut somebody out. Uh, no, no worries. I could see no one else was jumping, so I just jumped in. Jumped in. You have um, call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to document eight listed today, an OPD relating to the Bunbury 
Outer Ring Road project in Western Australia. Now, this project has been a disaster for our environment. The documents detail terrible management, which has resulted in the death of at least four adult and two joey Western ringtail possums, who, which are, of course, a critically endangered and a critically endangered species in that area. This species simply cannot afford any more deaths. We know we have to be doing everything we can to protect our critically endangered wildlife, and this road project is killing them. The clearing of the Jalorup corridor recommenced last Wednesday, despite the fact uh, that a revised plan on how to protect these species is still missing. How is this possibly allowed? How do they continue a project that is killing critically endangered species without making a plan to make sure this doesn't happen again? Under the approval, uh, an approval I might point out, Madam Acting Deputy President, that was given by the current Environment Minister uh, and her department, uh, Tanya Plibersek, on, in June 2022, under this proposal, under this approval, the proponent is required to provide an environmental offset plan. Yet, despite clearing having commenced in August this year and recommenced again last week, this document, this plan to protect uh, these critically endangered animals is still not available to the public um, and isn't, I might add, in this uh, has not been provided in response to this order of production of documents um, is not good enough. The federal court challenge in relation to this project uh, found that uh, the minister's delegate deemed that the plan that did exist, that was put forward, was deemed inappropriate. So where is the new plan and why on earth has the minister allowed clearing to commence again without having that plan on the table? Without this document, we will, never, we will not even know whether the damage done through land clearing would be sufficiently offset before it's all gone. How can the minister say she wants to halt, she wants to halt zero extinction by 2030 while signing off and allowing these types of devastating animal-killing projects to go ahead? This project has been a disaster too in terms of benefit uh, cost uh, uh, benefit for uh, the taxpayer and the economy. The costs have already blown out to at least $1.25 billion, uh, despite cuts to the scope of the project. I mean, this is a disaster economically, environmentally, and it is becoming an environmental disaster, a political environmental disaster for this government. I would like to note that despite a request for the final independent cost assessment for this project, the associated minister, the Minister for Infrastructure, is yet to provide uh, this detail, despite the deadline having passed. And I, put on the I put on notice the government and the minister today that unless we get this documentation, we will be taking action in this chamber when the time comes. You can't keep approving these types of projects that are devastating the environment, that are putting our native species at risk, are killing our endangered species, and not cough up the sheer information that exists. It is not good enough. It is the environment minister's job in this place to protect the environment and to save our wildlife. And on this account, she is failing. It's the environment minister's job, and yet rather than looking after the environment, uh, the environment minister and the infrastructure minister are looking after the road corporation. That is who and the big developers, not the environment and certainly not the poor old western uh, ring-tailed possum. Thank you, Senator Hanson-Young. Uh, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Uh, I will seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Uh, if we can move on to page five now, senators. Uh, anyone wishing to speak to items 9 to 13? Anyone seeking to speak to government documents 14 and 15? Is there anyone seeking to speak to documents pursuant to continuing orders 16 through to 24 on page 7?
Thank you. I don't. Thank you. So we will now move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? I call the minister. Thank you. Senator Thank Farrell. You. Deputy President, yes, I, I do have one or two. Uh, on behalf of the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, I table a ministerial statement on the anniversary of the apology to the stolen generations, together with documents relating to the closing of GAP uh, implementation plan, and I move that the documents be listed on the notice paper for consideration and to be taken together with the closing the GAP report, which will be debated on uh, Wednesday, the 8th of March, 2023. The question is the motion moved by Senator Farrell. I'd be agreed to. Those in that, of that opinion say aye. Those aye. against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Any further ministerial statements? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting uh, Minister Farrell. Sorry. Deputy President. I uh, table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the GST and home loan interest rates. The President has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of committee. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted? Leave being granted. Proceeds, Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I move that Senator Rice be discharged from, from and Senator Shoebridge be appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on Implementation of the National Redress Scheme and Senator Rice be appointed as a participating member. The question is that the motion moved by Minister Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023 and two related bills for concurrence. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I move that these bills may now proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now be read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by Minister Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023, National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023, and Treasury Laws Amendment Housing Measures No. 1 Bill 2023. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into hand, Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave being granted? Minister, you have the, oh, sorry. I will state that in accordance with standing order 115 brackets 3, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to the 22nd of March 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Review Bill of 2022 for concurrence. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and uh, be now read for a first time. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Farrell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Minister. In accordance with Standing Order 115.3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 14th of March 2023.
President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment Consumer Data Right Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister Farrell. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read for a first time. The question is the motion moved by uh, Minister Farrell be agreed to. All of those opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated uh, into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 115 brackets 3, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 23rd of March 2023. The President has also received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Migration Amendment, Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023 without amendment, agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill of 2022, and made changes in the membership of joint committees. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to three laws, details of which will be incorporated into Hansard. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Higher Education Support Amendment, Australia's Economic Accelerator Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Um, Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. As I was saying, we outlined the mechanisms to drive these reforms through— Sorry, Senator Henderson. I've just received a revised advice from the clerk. I'll ask you to resume your seat. Clerk. Oh, no. Sen no, we have actually. Okay. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. On behalf of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee, I present the report of the committee on the provisions of the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2022, together with accompanying documents. Thank you. It appears everything's in order now, and we can proceed with your contribution on the Higher Education Bill. Thank you, Senator Anderson, for your patience. Thank you so much. As I was saying, we outlined the mechanisms to drive these reforms through five key strategic and targeted investments, including our $243 million Trailblazer Universities program to boost research and development and drive commercialisation outcomes with industry partners, a $150 million capital injection to expand the CSIRO Main Sequence Ventures program which backs start-up companies and helps create commercial opportunities, $296 million for 1,800 industry PhDs and over 800 in new fellowships, the creation of a new IP framework for universities to support greater university industry collaboration and the uptake of research outputs, and, of course, the $1.6 billion over 10 years for Australia's economic accelerator a new stage-gated competitive funding program to help university projects bridge the so-called valley of death on the road to commercialisation, the subject of this bill. In relation to the first element of the package, the Trailblazer program, this research component was aligned with delivering research that would support our national manufacturing priorities. These priority areas were those we had identified as areas where Australia has significant comparative advantage and a strategic national interest. The areas at the time were medical products, food and beverage, recycling and clean energy, resources technology and critical minerals processing, defence industry and space. We ran an expression of interest to determine what potential projects were out there to identify where there could be partnerships with industry and where these ideas could be supported through the commercial application. This process garnered significant interest from researchers 
and the types of projects being proposed were impressive. The proposals were review reviewed by a panel which comprised of leaders in the research field, industry and business leaders as well. We announced the successful Trailblazer Universities in early 2022, which included Curtin University for the Resources Technology for Critical Minerals Trailblazer to establish our competitive advantage in the critical minerals sector and to look at ways to shield Australia from supply chain disruptions. The University of Southern Queensland for a space project dubbed iLaunch that will look at automation, novel materials, communications and hypersonics. The University of Queensland for a food and beverage project that would support doubling the value of Australia's food and beverage sector by 2030. The University of New South Wales to lead a recycling and clean energy initiative to innovative, innovate our technologies from the lab to industry, from communities and homes. The University of Adelaide for a defence trailblazer aptly named Concept to Sovereign Capability focused on developing new technologies and defence projects. And to Deakin University in my hometown of Geelong for a recycling and clean energy commercialisation hub, also known as REACH, which will spearhead our recycling and clean energy advanced manufacturing ecosystem in Australia. Uh, this project at Deakin on its own is expected to generate more than $1.4 billion in revenue and create around 2,500 direct jobs over the next decade. With further, further investment and partnerships, Deakin estimates it could create as many as 7,000 additional jobs, all driven by the Coalition's Trailblazer program. Deakin will partner with other universities and education institutes, including Federation University, RMIT, Swinburne and the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, Deakin also has vocational education partners, which is essential for enhancing the skills and knowledge of the workforce. These partners include the Gordon in Geelong, Bendigo Kangan Institute, Southwest TAFE, Holmes Glen Institute of TAFE, Wodonga TAFE and Swinburne TAFE. There is a long list of industry partners for this project. I'll just raise and mention a few, including Scale Facilitation and Recharge Industries, which is headquartered in Geelong, BNNT Technology, Calix Limited, Austron Energy, Gen2 Carbon, Carbon Revolution, another great advanced manufacturer based in Geelong, uh, White Graphene, Quickstep, Viva Energy, Jet Technology, HiQ, and I say the list goes on and on. So these six projects alone, supported by close to $250 million in coalition funding, will create hundreds of partnerships across the higher education sector and, most importantly, with industry. They will inject billions of dollars into the economy and create thousands of jobs right across our nation. It is certainly a very exciting time for research in Australia. The key element of our university research commercialisation package, as I mentioned, uh, is our $1.6 billion investment in Australia's economic accelerator, uh, the subject of the bill before the Senate today. This bill amends the Higher Education Support Act to make the appropriate provisions in Schedule 1 to deliver this program and provide increased support to our universities to commercialise their world-leading research. This component of our package provides a 10-year investment for a competitive grant funding program. Again, our investment was to be aligned to areas that we identified as national priorities outlined in our modern manufacturing strategy, a strategy which was focused on expanding and modernising Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability, securing supply chains and investing in the skills and world-class research needed by our manufacturing businesses. The Albanese government has since scrapped this strategy and is attempting to replace it with its National Reconstruction Fund, which, is really, is, which really is just a big bucket to fund their election commitments. Labor keeps saying this will rebuild Australia's industrial capability and that they want Australia to be a country that makes things again, but they simply aren't listening to the sector. Um, these businesses are essential to our economy, and yet they are being crippled by skyrocketing energy prices and are struggling to get the workers they need to keep their door open. And of course, they're also facing 
great concerns with the Labor's IR changes, including its introduction of multi-employer bargaining. Economic mismanagement and skyrocketing inflation will only mean businesses will pay more under this Albanese government. And I can tell you, Madam Acting Deputy President, these concerns are ricocheting through many, many businesses across this country. I was at the Geelong Manufacturing Council's 25th anniversary dinner last week, and there was deep concern about Labor's mismanagement of energy policy as well as its IR changes, including multi-employer bargaining. So there is a deep, deep concern across our country about what Labor is doing to small businesses and medium businesses and large businesses, including in manufacturing. I do want to say that we designed our competitive grant for Australia's Economic Accelerator Program around three stage gates. The first is the initial proof of concept, the idea and the testing stage to establish if the project is viable. The second is to support the idea through what in research terms is known as the valley of death. Uh, this is typically the development phase where significant investment is required and where the greatest risk of projects not proceeding lies. And the final stage is supporting the, the project through to commercial realisation. This is all about getting the product through the development process where it is ready to be sold in the marketplace. At each stage of the process, projects will be evaluated for their probability of success with larger funding for each stage and greater industry contribution. This will ensure we are supporting projects with the greatest likelihood of success. The commercialisation component, effectively stage three, or the final stage, would be further supported through the $150 million commitment to Saro's main sequence venture. The program will work to attract projects with high commercialisation potential at the proof of concept or proof of scale level of commercial readiness. To support this new grant opportunity and ensure its success, the bill also establishes a governance framework, including a new advisory board. The board will have up to eight expert representatives from government, industry, business and the research sectors. The advisory board will oversee the program, drawing upon their collective experience to drive the translation and commercialisation of, of, um, of research. The next and final element of the bill amends the Higher Education Support Act to allow for grants to be made under Part 2 and Part 3 of the Act to support the new industry-led study and postgraduate research grants. This will enable the creation of industry-led programs that pave the way for clear and structured career pathways. It will also embed researchers in industry settings, build research careers within industry and, more importantly, create cohesion between academia and industry. Industry will benefit from the opportunities to host PhD students, which will open pathways for them to recruit high-calibre graduates. So, as I say, Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a very, very exciting bill. Um, this has att attracted enormous support. I, I am pleased to see, of course, that the government has carried this through and that this is attracting the support of the government. But um, let me just reiterate the support from the group of eight universities uh, saying in February that the commercialisation of Australia's world-class university research is key to the nation's growth and prosperity meeting the challenges ahead and enhancing the lives of future generations. The Business Council of Australia said our $2.2 billion package will significantly improve Australia's ability to commercialise our best ideas and innovations, scaling them up to create exciting new industries, new exports and new highly skilled jobs for Australians. This bill to support Australia's Economic Accelerator Program and all of the supporting elements of the Coalition's University Research Commercialisation Package ensures that government investment into research is targeted and supports areas of national priority. Our investment supports the economy, industries and businesses and our local communities by creating the jobs for our future generations. I commend this bill to the Senate. <clears throat> thank you very much, Senator Henderson. Senator Fariki. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Higher Education Support Amendment, Australia's Economic Accelerator Bill 2022. 
Um, this bill amends the Higher Education Support Act to allow the Education Minister to make grants to support arrangements to increase industry-led postgraduate research and assist higher education providers to undertake research in sectors aligned with the areas of national security. The bill also provides legislative authority to establish a national industry PhD program aimed at enabling PhD students to better translate university research into commercialization outcomes. The Greens are supporting this bill because we will not stand in the way of more funding for research. But I do want to emphasize that this bill represents a worrying continuation of the Morrison government's agenda of commercializing research and increasing industry influence while neglecting fundamental research. In fact, this bill is a reheated version of a February 2022 Morrison era bill. Translational research is of course important, but pure curiosity driven research is just if not more important, often forming the foundation for applied research. Research born of curiosity holds infinite possibilities. The invention of Wi-Fi is just one such famous local example of astroparticle physics research that created the technology behind Wi-Fi, which has changed our lives. It is therefore short-sighted to solely focus on translational research. As Professor Brian Schmidt, Vice Chancellor of the ANU states, this short-term thinking fails to understand that the innovations we need actually come from the giant pool of ideas generated by curiosity. I'm pleased that Minister Clare was quick to initiate a review into the Australian Research Council Act. Such a review was long overdue, with the past few years being particularly troubled for the ARC. Increasing political interference has damaged its integrity and independence. Trust of the ARC amongst the research community has diminished due to acts of political interference, such as the vetoing of grants and the introduction of, national, of the national interest test, as well as the rejection of grant applications due to their citation of preprint publications. The review must address all these issues and must also enshrine the importance of fundamental research. The government needs to make sure that researchers are supported and well paid and I haven't been shy of raising that issue over and over. PhD students who are increasingly struggling to make ends meet with stipends falling well below the minimum wage and universities being relied on to top up these stipends. PhD stu students are also locked out of the government's paid parental leave scheme, making it extremely difficult for them to have a family should they wish to. And it is really disappointing that this morning the Labour government voted down the Greens amendment, which was very reasonable to extend the paid parental leave scheme to PhD students. Not only is it fair to pay researchers a decent wage and have good conditions, but if we, if we don't, then there is a significant risk that Australia will lose out on talented researchers. The UK, Germany and Italy all offer stipends to PhD students which are closer to the average wage, whereas in Australia, they are so well below the average wage. Australia's public investments in tertiary institutions is also amongst the lowest in the OECD, ranked 31 out of 37, according to Universities Australia. So the solution to improving research in this country is not more commercialization. We need to significantly invest in peer research. And that's why I will be moving a second reading amendment, which notes that this bill provides a significant amount of funding for research translation and commercialization, and provides absolutely no funding for peer research, and calls on the government to recognize that peer research is a public good with immense value, recognize that peer research is as important and worthy of funding, commit to substantially increasing funding for peer research, which has fallen significantly over the past three decades and commit to a substantial increase in stipends given PhD candidates are incre increasingly struggling to make ends meet with stipends fa falling well below the minimum wage. Um, and Acting Deputy President, I'll move this second reading amendment now. I will also be moving amendments in the committee stage to ensure the Accelerator Advisory Board's research commercialization strategy 
cannot be inconsistent with Australia's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. This will ensure that this significant new funding program cannot be used to fund research that could put our emissions reductions targets at risk and make sure that the research commercialization strategy is consistent with Australia's greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. While this amendment does not go as far as I would have liked to get support for in expressly preventing the accelerator program being used to fund research which could contribute to the development of new coal and gas projects, I am nonetheless very pleased to work with the Labour government to embed a commitment to climate action within this bill. The reality is that new coal and gas is simply incompatible with the survival of people and the planet. Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels. It doesn't matter where the coal and gas is burnt. Emissions do drive global warming and climate change everywhere. But conveniently, pollution that is released overseas, called scope 3 emissions, aren't counted as our emissions. We wash our hands of the problem, but that's a dangerous approach, which ignores Australia's true global contribution to climate change. Australian coal and gas are fueling climate disasters everywhere, from the floods in Lismore to those in Pakistan, from the bushfires in the Bega Valley to the drought in the Horn of Africa. And research should contribute to progress and will be key to mitigating and surviving the climate crisis. At the end of the day, though, we must stop opening new coal and gas mines. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, it wasn't that long ago when I graduated, um, starting with anthropology and sociology as my primary major and then moving on to pharmacy. So I've got a well-rounded understanding of both the social sciences and pharmacy. But higher education has played a significant role in my life. And thus far, there is so much potential that I see in Australia's youth, students and researchers in our universities. We don't want to see Australia left behind. In the 2022 World Intellectual Property Organization's Global Innovation Index, Australia was ranked fifth in the world for our human capital and research. And yet, despite leading on research, we are ranked 37th for knowledge and technology outputs. We need to be supporting our students and researchers, making their work and their ideas come to reality, which will make our country more resilient and self-sufficient. These grants will turn great ideas into commercial opportunities and increase collaboration between universities and industry. These are part of the uh, Albanese Labor government's work to diversify our economy and strengthen our manufacturing ability. I hear brilliant ideas from students when I go visit them at schools, all the way from primary school students to students undertaking their postgraduate degrees at universities. Imagine if all of these Australians could leverage their potential. Think about where we could be in a decade. I know that priority consideration will be given to projects addressing the four priority areas of renewables and low emissions technologies, for example, hydrogen, microgrids um, and lithium or rare earth elements processing, medical science, for example, synth synthetic biology, mRNA vaccines and remote medicine, um, value add in resources, for example, provenance of rare earth minerals, advanced minerals extraction, data-driven mining, and mining automation and robotics. And finally, also value add in agricultural, forestry, and fishery sec sectors. Um, these are priority areas for a reason. This government wants to do right by our constituents. We want to see Australian innovations in clean energy, in medical science. We want to improve our productivity in mining, resources, agriculture, forestry and fisheries. When I think of Australian innovation, I think of inventions that change the world. I think of Professor Fiona Wood's um, spray-on skin technique for burn victims. Fiona and her team saved 28 lives during the 2002 Bali bombings. The pacemaker, an Australian doctor, 
developed the first artificial pacemaker in the 1920s, and now more than three million people around the world have pacemakers that support their hearts. Cochlear implants or bionic ears. Professor Graham Clark invented this in Melbourne University in the 1970s. It's now given hearing to more than 180,000 deaf people worldwide. The electric drill, originally designed for drilling rock and digging for coal, now there's a portable hand drill almost in every household. There are so, there are so many more, the refrigerator, the black box flight recorder, the ultrasound scanner, the inflatable escape flight um, slide on planes, which you all heard of, especially flying to Canberra, I'm sure. These started as good ideas and went on to become part of a life as we know it. I know that there will be many more of these world-changing innovations, and I know that this bill and, the, and Australia's Economic Accelerator Program will be part of this. I met Professor Peter Leedman from the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in WA last week. I heard about some of the amazing work they're doing, and I'm honoured to have been invited back to tour, and, uh, tour the institute again soon. Now, this bill will help them and other researchers progress the development of their technologies to commercial investor readiness. Because for Australia to fully capitalise on our talent and opportunities, we need a research ecosystem where our world-class research can be translated into real-world innovations and productivity gains. Now, Acting Deputy President, allow me to re reiterate that investment in research translation and commercialisation will help build a stronger, smarter and more diverse economy, as well as ensuring Australia becomes more economically resilient. We want our universities to play a bigger role to not just produce brilliant research, but to work more closely with businesses and government to translate this research into breakthrough products, new businesses and ideas to grow our economy and strengthen our society. Now, feedback from the university research and business, business sectors shows there is an identified need for new innovative funding mechanisms that de-risks projects for commercial partners and incentivizes fast-fail research, driving cultural change in universities and creating real partnerships with, you know, um, with industry. And the Australia's Economic Accelerator Bill 2022 will create the legislative authority to establish um, the new program, the new research funding program and a new industry-led study and postgraduate research program. Now, the program will accelerate reform in a higher education sector for translation and commercialisation, um, and it is aligned with the National Reconstruction Fund when it comes to the key uh, priority uh, objectives that it focuses on. The new industry-led study and postgraduate research program will create a clear and structured research career pathway in innovation and commercialisation-focused research. Furthermore, the, um, the program will ensure that um, it has been tested and endorsed by an expert panel. These new programs were also recommended by many of the submissions received in response to the University Research Commercialisation Consultation Paper released in February 2021. This is a part of a series of initiatives which aim to boost Australia's university research uh, commercialisation capacity. Um, and in ensuring that these initiatives respond to the concerns that the sector has consistently been raising, calling for additional support to increase the translation and commercialisation of university research and encouraging the workforce mobility across university and industry sectors. And as we've heard uh, from my colleagues earlier, the purpose of the Higher Education Support Amendment uh, Bill is to amend the Higher Education Support Act, um, which essentially allows the minister to make grants to support arrangements to increase industry-led study and postgraduate research and to assist higher education providers to undertake programs of research in areas of national priority 
that progress the development of technologies and services to a state of commercial investor readiness. This amendment creates the legislative authority, as discussed earlier, um, to establish these grants. Um, and to support the operation of the program, the bill will also establish a new governance framework, which includes the program's advisory board and priority managers. And the board will essentially be responsible for advising the minister in relation to the program, including providing advice on the objectives, conditions of eligibility and conditions of grants. The, um, the advisory board will also provide oversight of the priority managers and will be responsible for advising the minister on the commercialisation of research through a research commercialisation strategy, which is to be developed every five years from 2022 to 2023. The bill proposes that the advisory board will consist of up to eight members who will possess experience and knowledge in research and, um, and its commercialisation and represent government, industry, business and research sectors. This governance structure will ensure that the program will operate in appropriate alignment with the policy's intent. Um, and finally, um, Acting Deputy Pre President, we are fortunate in this country to have the world leading researchers in our higher education sector. This bill supports our higher education providers and our researchers in realising the great potential of Australian ingenuity and innovation. It will help make it easier for universities and businesses to work together to commercialise research building our sovereign capabilities and boosting our economy. And it's great to see the support that we've, um, that we've heard from our fellow senators. Um, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Payman. Senator Liu. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As this bill is the reintroduction of measures introduced by the former coalition government, which lapsed at the election and is now taken up by Labor, we do support this bill. A substantial piece of work led to a review of the government's significant investment in research because, although we do the, some of the finest research, it does not necessarily follow through to commercialisation to drive greater benefits for our economy. This will result in $296 million invested in 1,800 industry PhDs and over 800 in fellows over a period of 10 years. For those researchers, this fuels their ideas supporting Australia's cleverest research minds and more broadly boosting productivity, creating jobs and new industries. A key component of the coalition's 2.2 billion university research commercialisation package was translation of research to application through reform across four key areas, placing national manufacturing priorities at the core of Australian government-funded research using priority-driven schemes to ramp up commercialisation activity, delivering university research funding reform to strengthen incentives for genuine collaboration with industry, and investing in people who are skilled in university and industry collaboration. Strategic and targeted investments included $243 million over five years for the Trailblazers Universities Program to boost prioritise R&D and drive commercialisation outcomes with industry partners with this research component aligned with our national manufacturing priorities in areas where Australia has significant comparative advantage and a strategic national interest. The areas at the time were medical products, food and beverage, recycling and clean energy, resources technology and critical minerals processing, defence industry and space. This bill amends the Higher Education Support Act 2003 to make the appropriate provisions to, to deliver this program and provide increased support to our universities to commercialise their world-leading research. As an undergraduate and postgraduate student and a lecturer at one of those universities, and having been on the council of two universities, the governing bodies, I understand the importance of supporting the commercialisation of research in universities. This component of our package provides a 10-year investment for a competitive grant funding program to give the best chance of commercial realisation but with evaluation to support projects 
with gr the greatest likelihood of success. Its design was to get research through the known gates, initial proof of concept, through what we've heard, the valley of death, where there is the greatest risk of projects not proceeding, and through to commercial realisation. The commercialisation component, effectively, the final stage, would be further supported through a $150 million commitment to CSIRO's main sequence venture. The Australian Economic Accelerator Program will work to attract projects with high commercialisation potential at the proof of concept or proof of scale level of commercial readiness. It establishes an innovative governance framework, including the new Australia's Economic Accelerator Advisory Board. It creates a new suite of Australian Research Council industry fellowships that will recognise and reward our academics who collaborate with industry. In development, there was extensive consultation and wide sector support. The group of eight universities supported it. Science and Technology Australia supported it. Universities Australia supported it. The Business Council of Australia also supported it. In my own state of South Australia, associated with Flinders University, which has nearly uh, 26,000 students, 998 higher degree research students, it is the factory of the future, which is an industrial collaboration already underway with BAE Systems, Maritime Australia and Flinders, which is focused on innovation, industry technologies, research and training to advance manufacturing. Additionally, SA Scientist of the Year Colin Raston and the Vortex Fluidic device is transforming green chemistry. The high-tech yet simple device can be used in medical and pharmaceutical research, rapid COVID diagnostics, cancer treatments, food processing, materials processing, and much more across a myriad of industries, all with a focus on cleaner, greener and cheaper production. It is being commercialised right now. Chalker Lab has developed no novel polymers made from waste products which can clean oil spills, PFAS and arsenic contamination in gold mining, and is now proceeding to commercialise the new material for global markets. At the University of Adelaide, with almost 24,000 students, 1,670 of those are postgraduate researchers. Bygan Proprietary Limited is the world's first producer of sustainable and tailored activated carbon. The global activated carbon market is currently valued at around 10 billion and is growing at almost 10 per cent per year. The uses for activated carbon are diverse and growing in number. Some of the most common markets include, but are not limited to, water purification, gold recovery, soil remediation, decaffeinization, drink processing, PFAS removal, mercury removal, energy storage. Bygan recently announced they have received planning approval for an activated carbon production facility in Swan Reach on the Murray River in South Australia. The concept to support our valued researchers underwent appropriate consultation with sectors, it will be good for university students, good for our researchers and inventors, good for our university sectors and good for the Australian industry. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I have concerns about this bill. We can hear the cheers of joy from the research rent seekers. This bill includes a huge $400 million grant program over four years to add to the nearly $4 billion a year the government already spends on research. Now, research is important. I know that myself. In the past, Australia has led the world on innovation. Yet I'm not convinced that the government deserves the credit for our countrymen and women, countrymen and women's inventions. Research is not just about money. And I'm not, confused, not convinced that a huge, centralised, bloated federal government splashing huge amounts of cash is going to supercharge our economy. Science grants have already been responsible across science sectors for corrupting the science. We see that in climate. We see that in COVID. We see that in water management. Many other areas. Money for advocacy on behalf of government ideology. That is what's plagued the CSIRO and turned it into a, a siphon for taxpayer funds 
and in return the CSIRO is now corrupting the science and be, being an advocacy. Don't take my word for it, because I'm talking about senior research scientists who have retired from CSIRO saying exactly what I just said. CSIRO is now an advocacy group for the government ideology and policy. Not just the Labor Party, but the general policies that have been pushed by governments. The Australian Economic Accelerator has a focus on translating research to commercial outcomes. Sounds good. Has it occurred to anyone that the reason some of that research has not been translated to a commercial outcome might be because businesses have looked at the research and decided it's a terrible business idea? What if we're spending nearly half a billion dollars here to flog dead horses or giving taxpayer money to companies which would have commercialised the research anyway without grants because it's a good business idea? That's the point. In a free society, not corrupted by massive bloated government, merit determines what succeeds. These handouts for project businesses, projects businesses would have undertaken anyway a corporate welfare or maybe they're corporate bribes. Only the big companies will get access to this corporate welfare. Small business misses out yet again. Only the huge corporates can hire the grant consultants, navigate the forests and weeds of more than 200 grants and scheme programs through which the government provides research funding and make the applications. The Department of Education confesses that most submissions to the University Research Commercialisation Action Plan, wow, that's a mouthful, University Research Commercialisation Action Plan, quote, agreed that there is no silver bullet solution to improving research commercialisation outcomes and that new reforms need to be integrated across the whole research commercialisation ecosystem. End of quote. Anyone reading between the lines on that bureaucrat soup of buzzwords will realise that no one really knows if the economic accelerator will do much to achieve its supposed purpose. While we know that the biggest break, B-R-A-K-E, on our country and particularly our country's innovation is big bloated government, pushing on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. There's a big assumption underpinning this bill and research funding in Australia. It assumes that a big bloated federal government with a bureaucrat sitting in Canberra enforcing grant guidelines will lead to innovation and commercial activity. Big assumption. If we want true innovation, and I think we all do, and a boost in commercial activity, government grants are a terrible way to do it. Government is the one standing in the way, and it's not just the Labor Greens government, it's the former Liberal National Government. Government is the one standing in the way of innovation and commercial outcomes. Instead of grants, how about this? Get government policy focused on getting back to basics. Making electricity as cheap as humanly possible, number one. After government has spent decades blowing up the price of electricity with artificial uh, subsidies that are destroying our electricity sector. And that ripples right through the economy. Every, tr every sector uses electricity. And once it's been made expensive, that, there goes the end of our competitive advantage that used to apply. Aluminium smelters now shutting down rather than coming because they can't afford the electricity. Number two, simplifying industrial re relations so that instead of protecting the industrial relations clubs members being large foreign and domestic corporates, unaccountable union bosses, lawyers, consultants, bureaucrats, exploiting workers, as I've discussed, so many times, and suppressing small to medium-sized businesses, the industrial relations, we need an industrial relations system that protects workers and enables small to medium enterprise to get on with the job of employing people. And thirdly, fixing the taxation system with its hideous, com with its hideous complexity and its counterproductive behaviours that it drives. Fixing the taxation system with comprehensive reform so that multinationals pay their fair share of tax and relieve the burden on families and on Australian companies struggling under a high tax burden in times of severe inflation, adding yet another highly regressive government financial burden. Do these three things, Minister, and watch the commercialisation of research take off. The government will never have to make another grant. One Nation will not oppose this bill. 
Without proper reform of the important parts of our economy, though, research grants are just flogging a dead horse. And I will be returning to the topic of research grants lacking accountability, as is so widespread the case in our country. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, our thanks, Senators, uh, mostly for their contributions to this debate, uh, both informative uh, and constructive as well. Australia's Economic Accelerator Program will support our universities to work in partnership with industry to turn Australia's world-class research into the innovative products that will inform and drive Australian businesses of the future. The AEA will bridge a gap in the current research landscape by funding projects which have high translational and commercial potential. The measures in this bill will support our higher education providers and industry to leverage the great potential of Australian ingenuity and innovation. Once again, I thank senators for their contributions to the debate and I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Fruker, you have a second reading amendment. We'll go straight to the... Uh, to do you have any further comments on that, Senator Fruki? We'll I've straight. already moved the amendment. Thank okay, you. Okay, so colleagues, we have one second reading amendment uh, to this bill moved by Senator Fruki, uh, which is on sheet 1812. And I put that amendment to the chamber. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Those in favour of the amendment to sheet 1812 move to the right of the chair and those against move to the left of the chair. And I appoint Senator McKim as the teller for the eyes and Senator Cadell as the teller for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 14 and nose 29. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. We now move to the second now that the bill be read a second time. All of those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the uh, I'll recommit that. So this is the second read. So, so this is the second reading of the bill, and so the motion before the Senate is that the bill um, be moved for a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Is it the wish uh, of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Fruki. Thank you, um, Chair. Uh, Senator uh, Fruki, just sorry, if uh, those of you who are not participating in the debate, if you could uh, leave the chamber if you want to have a conversation. Thank you. Senator Fruki. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Green's amendments one and two on sheet 1838 um, together. Thank you. Is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. 
Thank you, Chair. I move Green's amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1838. As I uh, flagged in my second reading speech, these amendments are to ensure that the Accelerator Advisory Board's research commercialization strategy cannot be inconsistent with Australia's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And these are important to ensure that this significant new funding program um, cannot be used to fund research that could put our emissions reduction targets at risk and to make sure that this strategy remains consistent with Australia's greenhouse gas emissions targets. Um, so I commend the amendments to, um, to the Senate and I move them. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I just wanted to indicate that the government uh, is committed to its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, uh, and we believe the proposed amendment is sensible and highlights that commitment from the government, so we will be supporting it. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Not Okay. Okay. The question is that the amendments, as moved by the Australian Greens, be agreed to. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Those against, say no. 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 I think the ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Well, that was close. Lock the doors. The question is that amendments one and two on sheet 1838 moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Askew teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 25. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I'm in the hands of the chamber if there are no further amendments. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is the bill be reported. Those that can say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Higher Education Support Amendment, Australia's Economic Accelerator Bill 2022, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move the report of the committee be adopted. The question for the chair is that the committee of the report be adopted. Those of the opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move the bill now be read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. <laughs> Government business, order for day number three. Governor General's opening speech, adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Payment for an address in reply. So I think Senator O'Neill will have the call, but before I give it to Senator O'Neill, if colleagues could please, senators, please leave the chamber in a quiet fashion. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to respond to the address of the Governor-General at the opening of this historic formation of the uh, first term of the Albanese government. And I hope it might be the first term of several terms of Labor-led uh, government under Mr Albanese. I think it's a fact that few really could have imagined the events of the three years that preceded the change of government. Just the turmoil, the anguish, the uncertainty that was just part of people's lives. And in, in the time since the election, I have been, um, I've met with many Australians who, who say to me they just are glad to wake up without the sense of fear and dread of what next disaster might be landing on them at the hands of their Prime Minister. And that was what people were living with under Mr Morrison. Um, in addition to the failure of the government to really do their job as, gov as a government and instead uh, just permanently create panic and 
devastation. We had the reality of so much uh, external events that impacted us all as well. So we had floods, devastating bushfires, inflation, pandemics, lockdowns, and all the hurt that these elements inflicted on our nation, and they've irrevocably changed us. But out of every crisis, there is an opportunity to review the way we do things, and this government is very, very much, this new Albanese government is very keen to make the very best of the learning from those challenges that Australians faced. The long boom ended. Our first recession has, in three years, come in the face of a global downturn, and despite lower unemployment, workers are now doing it tougher than ever. Change is unlikely. Uh, change in the unlikeliest of circumstances begat change, and last year Australians voted for change of many kinds. The government, for only uh, the a change of government for only the third time this century, record First Nations representation uh, was achieved in this parliament, and, and I include in that my good friend, Dr. Gordon Reid who lives in the seat of Robertson, uh, which I was proud to represent formally in the, the other chamber between 2010 and 13, and uh, what a wonderful addition he is to the complement of members in the lower house. I couldn't be prouder of my new seat mate, uh, Senator Jana Stewart, uh, and uh, although she's just left the chamber, my, the first hijab-wearing senator, uh, Senator Payman. We've also seen the delivery of a female majority in the Senate. And Mr Sam Lim, our first dolphin trainer, elected to the lower house. And what a joy it was to hear his first speech and to look up in this multicultural, multi-faith nation and see the uh, very well-known uh, uh, saffron-coloured clothes of Buddhist monks in, in the chamber. Uh, the reality of our multi-faith nation on display there. For Labor, we've always understood that representation matters, and our diverse houses now look much more like the wonderful multicultural, multi-faith, pluralist democracy that we are and the nation that we seek to serve. It's also important, uh, I believe, this parliament will seek to enact the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. And as I make this contribution nine months into the government in response to the Governor-General's remarks, that discussion about whether we will indicate in our constitution the simple fact that First Nations people were here. That's it at its core. If we have the opportunity to do the right thing, I'm usually very proud of Australians for doing the right thing. And I have taught many Australian school children uh, who, when we get around to talking about First Nations spirituality, in particular in religion classes, and the history of First Nations people, they are unbelievably shocked that prior to 1967, Australians First Nations people were counted as flora and fauna. That is a shocking thing for Australians to know was our history. But Australians rose to the challenge of acknowledging the fact, hard to say this, this sentence, that Aboriginal people were worthy of counting in the census, that they're people and that they needed to be counted. And I think that Australians have hit that point at this, at this moment, at this historical moment for us, where it's no longer contested that Aboriginal people were here. Terra nullius has been nullified. People know the fact, and it's time that we wrote it into our hard story that's contained in that very small document, very small but very powerful document that I'm very proud to uh, call our constitution. The debate that's happening about the voice right now is a debate that we're past time having. It's already been five years, five years that the statement sat on the last government's desk, waiting for enactment. Well, at least that was the public voice. That was the public statements. They were waiting to get the job done. But they didn't do the job. And in fact, it's the reality they just gave paid lip service to a very important 
a generous offer from the First Nations people of this country. And it matters not just in a symbolic way. And I can say to you, colleagues, that I have had the privilege of uh, getting out right across this beautiful state of New South Wales. And last year I visited Wilcannia and spoke to people who were there. That, that whole community yeah, was ravaged by COVID-19. And failures to address that crisis echoed the persistent failure to get that community off its knees. The average lifespan for a man in Wilcannia is 38 years of age. It is unbelievably shocking. Two young men born into the same town in Australia 38 years ago, and one of them, a First Nations man, is likely to die at that age. Not, not the other 38-year-old man who was born who wasn't First Nations. And for women, it's not much better. The age, average lifespan age for women in Wilcannia is 41 years of age. Now, it's no coincidence that these appalling statistics in a community that is overwhelmingly Indigenous. It, it's just become, sadly, part of the documented reality of our time, and it cannot be allowed to continue. It's a result of centuries of dispossession, of discrimination and an outright campaign from the state to rid our First Nations people of their way of life. And Labor understands that when you're in government, you need to lead. You need to lift the sights, the vision, the hopes, the capacity, the economy, the community to build hopes and dreams and help to deliver the best outcomes for Australians. And that's why we'll be rolling out the, we've been rolling out the roadmap of implementation of the First Nations' generous offer to Australians that came through the Uluru Statement from the Heart and is now part of the public discussion uh, discussed in shorthand terms of The Voice. And I know that Minister Linda Burney has been putting her hand very much to the task of delivering a great outcome there, and I want to acknowledge the wise and remarkable leadership of my colleague in this chamber, Senator Pat Dodson, um, who I think just in the last 24 hours has revealed the heartbrokenness, the tears of a, a nation that weeps for the loss of opportunities being taken up to redress the imbalance of life outcomes and opportunity between First Nations people and the rest of us who call this great country our home. And I hope and pray that we will find a way to move forward together in a unifying way. No more division. Time to lift our sights. This process and its momentous consequences will change our nation for the better. It's one part of righting the historic wrongs by empowering Indigenous Australians and giving them a clear voice in our national debate. It'll establish a Makarata, which is a truth-telling commission. And that'll bring together the disparate strands of our history and tell it like it really is or was. The bad and the good, the truth. And I want to acknowledge the incredible integrity and academic leadership shown by a good friend of mine, uh, formerly of Newcastle University, Professor Lyndall Ryan, for her uh, profound contribution to our national understanding with her recording and publication of the sites of so many massacres that were part of this country. And these are hard words for me to speak, and they are tragic things to recall. But we need to put them on the record and know that that is part of our history, alongside all the great stuff. Three key words, voice, treaty, truth. 
And we will deliver all three with the help of the consultation that we're undertaking with our First Nations brothers and sisters and that incredible generosity and desire for truth-telling that I think is fundamental to what's best about Australia and Australians. Very importantly, the Albanese government will also be the parliament, provide the parliament that passes a religious anti-religious anti discrimination bill. And the bill that we will enact, in accordance with our promises, unlike five years, two different governments under the Liberal National Party who failed to deliver anything for the protection of freedom of Australians from religious discrimination. Labor will be the party that unites in support of people of all faiths to be free in our multicultural pluralist democracy to practice their faith alongside people who have no faith and their freedoms. It will be a bill that celebrates and protects our religious diversity and it will not be the kind of bill that has exhausted advocates for religious, uh, the, the right to practice their religion under the former government, which was designed like so much of the legislation of the previous government uh, as a tool to pit one Australian against another. Either or, choose a team, goodies and baddies, lifters and leaners. We heard all of that language of division. Well, that ends with the arrival of an Albanese government, and I'm very, very proud to be a senator in this Labor government that will lead in a way that unites our nation. I've spoken of the healing soul of our nation, but we have a great task ahead of us, which is the healing of the world itself. Australians everywhere I go talk to me of the raging bushfires, the floods, the droughts, minor earthquakes, record temperatures that are happening in Australia and across the world. The evidence is there for all of us to see. Our planet is warming and further warming will be catastrophic for all life on this planet. I certainly don't want that for my children and my grandchildren, and I don't think I know an Australian who wants that for any of anyone. Now, Labor will end the climate wars. Other people might want to continue, but we've got to, we've got to lift up and move on. We will get real action on climate change, and we will do it in a responsible way that manages a transition that doesn't deprive people of jobs and that isn't so purist that it, it, it can't deal with the reality of the need for a transition through gas. We will absolutely ensure that Australia benefits from a transition to clean, renewable energy. And we have in our grasp the opportunity to become a major green superpower, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. Our commitment will pass through this parliament, a commitment to reduce uh, net emissions by 43 per cent on uh, 2005 levels, and we've got on with the job of doing that. There are opportunities for us to reach out into the regions around us. The former government were too short-sighted, too divided and unable to develop a cogent and forward-thinking climate change plan and they continue to oppose ours despite having no agenda of their own. But despite that, an Albanese-led Labor you. government will do what Thank Australians need. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Askew. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'm speaking today to acknowledge the Governor-General David Hurley ACDSC's address to the 47th Parliament. His Excellency addressed this chamber in July 2022 to mark the beginning of a new parliament and to outline the Albanese Labor government's plans. It's been eight months since the Al Albanese government took power, but what do we have to show for that eight months? The cost of living is biting more than ever, and inflation is the highest it has been in 33 years. It's a struggle to do the weekly shop, to pay for school uniforms and fees as the school year begins, and to put petrol in our cars. Reducing the cost of living for Australians is well and truly overdue. Each day, households and small businesses are forced to suffer further. That is a day too long. Another anticipated interest rate on Tuesday, tomorrow, is like will be the 10th rate rise in 12 months, with still more to come, so we're told. 
When questioned about how a typical Australian home mortgage has risen by $1,400 a month, the Prime Minister did not address the issue at hand, instead once again looking to lay blame elsewhere. The 800,000 people who are facing mortgage cost hikes when their fixed rates switch to a higher variable rate this year want action to ensure that they can keep their homes. But Anthony Albanese was more interested in talking about prescription drugs, TAFE, childcare and his May budget. Hundreds of thousands of Australians are wondering whether they will have a roof over their heads in May, but the cost of living predicament our nation faces right now is the last thing on Labor's mind. The Senate Select Committee on the Cost of Living, which was established in September and is being chaired by Liberal Senator Jane Hume, has already heard that higher grocery prices and rising mortgages are leaving families struggling to put food on the table. Uniting Victoria Taz, Chief Executive Officer, Bronwyn Pike wrote about how the organisation's consumers were experiencing increasing levels of poverty, homelessness, food insecurity and violence due to the devastating impact of the rising cost of living. Uniting Vic Taz's research report, Can't Afford to Live, showed 92 per cent of respondents were cutting back on food and groceries due to rising costs. Half of respondents cut back on heating during winter last year, and parents, carers and people living with disability were skipping meals, all the while preparing food for others. As Senator Hume has said, Labor don't have an economic plan. They've abandoned finding solutions to this crisis, and instead they're breaking promises to families and breaking promises to businesses. Cost of living is the top issue facing Australians right now. The government should be developing practical solutions that will make a difference to the lives of ordinary Australians who are struggling. That frequently promised $275 cut to energy bills is sorely needed but hasn't eventuated. Instead, Parliament was recalled in a rush and at a busy time right before Christmas to address urgent energy le legislation. Instead of spending time in our electorates participating in end-of-year school events and boosting and supporting small businesses in the lead-up to Christmas, hundreds of politicians and staff had to return to Canberra for a hastily reconvened sitting to discuss energy measures. And to what end? That legislation we all rushed back to Can Canberra for in December has had no impact to date. Right now we need a federal government, we, we, government that we can trust to look after all of us when times are tough, but that is not what we have. We have a government that promised reforms that would actually make a difference to health care and Medicare, but that commitment has failed as well. With bulk billing rates so low, Australians are now out of pocket by $60 on average when they visit their GP, and that's if they can get in to see one. This Labor government was elected on a platform of strengthening Medicare, but all we've seen is the Medicare system weaken. Men mental health rebates have been slashed in half, 70 telehealth services have been cut out of Medicare coverage, ambulance ramping at our hospitals is getting worse, elective surgery is being deferred at concerning levels, and what about those urgent care clinics we were all promised? Where are they? It's time for tangible action to improve our ailing health care system, Labor. You promised to deliver 50 urgent care clinics across the country, including three in my home state of Tasmania, within the first 12 months of government. Given we are now more than two-thirds through that first 12 months, shouldn't we have seen more progress by now? Instead of being well on the way through establishing these clinics, all that has happened is that expressions of interest for about three have been requested. I and my coalition colleagues intend to hold the Albanese government to account when it comes to delivering on the commitments they made during that and since the election campaign. When he launched Labor's election campaign, Mr Albanese promised to tackle the spiralling cost of living that is making life tough for too many Australians. There were commitments to raise real wages, to make health care, childcare and housing more affordable while growing the economy to strengthen Medicare, to create more jobs and invest in fee-free TAFE and university places, as well as invest in manufacturing and renewable energy. This all sounded great at the time, Prime Minister, but as we have already seen, this government has already reneged on many of its promises. In the two years before the 2022 election, power prices fell by 8 per cent for households and up to 12 per cent for businesses. The ACCC said prices were the lowest they had been for eight years. Mr Albanese flagged energy price cuts of up to $275 a year for families and businesses by 2025, but in fact our energy bills are rising and look set to continue escalating. 
Even Labor's much-hyped submission to the Fair Work Commission to lift the minimum wage was swallowed up by inflation. In this submission, the Albanese government explained it did not want to see Australian workers go backwards, in, in particular those workers on low rates of pay who are experiencing the worst impacts of inflation and have the least capacity to draw on savings. However, inflation has continued to rise over the past eight months with no relief in sight, and real wages have actually decreased. The economic growth Australia was experiencing under the coalition has come to an end, and that is hurting hard-working Australians. To add salt to the wound, the government stifled growth in some of our key industries by freezing hard-earned grants. Grants like the Modern Manufacturing Initiative that were already awarded before the election were held up. Important industries that we're relying, we rely on every day, such as defence, space, medical, food security and heavy manufacturing, were all impacted by their decision. The coalition knows the value of primary industries in Australia. Our government invested in trade and exports, biosecurity, stewardship, supply chains, water and infrastructure, innovation and research and human capital to support the important agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries. But Minister Watt delayed taking action to assure, ensure Australia's $81 billion agricultural industry was protected and not unduly impacted by foot and mouth disease. It really has not been a good start for this government. Mr Albanese said he wanted his government to be one that was more inclusive and delivered more solutions. He campaigned on the idea of a future where no one is held back and no one is left behind. But can we already see that, as we can already see, those words are tarnished. The coalition's focus is to support good policy that is in the best interest of Australia, and we will hold the government to account when it breaches its commitments. We will oppose actions that take our economy backwards and force inflation rates even higher. The coalition will ensure we're backing families and small businesses doing it tough under Labor's cost of living crisis. We had a strong record in government of lower prices, lower interest rates, lower unemployment, lower taxes and stronger borders, and we're proud of this. The Albanese government is nearly one year into their three-year term and has very little to show for it, apart from broken promises, increased cost of living, increased interest rates and increased inflation. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you very much, uh, King Deputy President. Um, just, um, in response to the Governor-General's address and the commencement of the 47th Parliament, but also um, some very uh, poignant words that Senator O'Neill said just earlier regarding the Uluru Statement from the Heart and regarding the genuineness of Senator Pat Dodson. I certainly wholly heartily support her comments and uh, the genuineness of um, Senator Pat Cods uh, Dodson. The, uh, the Governor-General spoke at length about how the Albanese Labor government will tackle the cost of living and wage crisis left to us by the previous government. Now, we've moved quickly with cheaper childcare legislated for 1.2 million families. We have made medicines cheaper. We have secured a meaningful increase in the minimum wage. And workplace reforms are the first steps to ending the lost decades on wages. And workplace reforms, those workplace reforms are critical. And already, major employers like Coles and ANZ have come back to the bargaining table as a direct outcome of the laws passed late last year. The hysteria from the opposition and some in the employer lobby about those reforms was frankly embarrassing. They said the country would grind to a halt as soon as those laws were passed. And yet here we are. The sky hasn't fallen in, but the scare campaign, but the scare campaign was part of the broader issue that this government must address. That is the way that some employers, supported by the Liberals and Nationals, suppress wages by suppressing workers' voice and unions. In many parts of the world, government, business and unions work together productively to achieve better outcomes for workers. In Germany and most of the northern and western Europe, business collaborates with organised labour rather than attempting to destroy it. And their economies are both fairer and more productive. I know there are many businesses here in Australia who desperately want this more collaborative approach. But they struggle to compete with the businesses that undercut them by suppressing wages, by suppressing worker voice and unions. This is a serious workplace issue. It is a serious issue for the Australian economy and is a serious human rights issue. 
The most fundamental tenets of the human rights law, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, states explicitly in Article 23, everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of their interests. That right should be unimpeachable. Instead, we see from the Leader of the Opposition down a flagrant disregard for human rights. Now, I'll refer to an article in the Sydney Morning Herald published on 1 April 2006 titled Sign on the Dotted Line. It tells the story how the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Dutton, when he was Assistant Treasurer, treated his employees at the Australian Valuation Office. The article says that the Opposition Leader, and I quote, refused to negotiate a union agreement with staff even though 91 of the 105 in question had voted for one. Instead, they were offered a non-union workplace agreement, or AWA, that would see some lose $17,000. So the opposition leader employs, employs the Australian Valuation Office when he was the minister voted by a whopping 86 per cent majority for a union agreement, and he responded by depriving them of what is fu a fundamental human right. And In the process, he robbed them of $17,000 each. And This is the same opposition leader who claimed this week that he represents the Australian working class or some weeks ago, a bloke who stopped his own workers having a union agreement even after they voted to do so. And what message does that, does that send to Australian businesses? It tells them that they can too rob their workers of their voice to make an extra buck. Let's take BHP, the biggest and richest company in Australia. Surely a company that made a $32 billion profit last year doesn't need to suppress wages and their workers' voice. Well, just a number of weeks ago, the federal court found that BHP unlawfully sacked Darrell, a labour hire worker at a BHP coal mine near Marinbar. Justice Collier found the BHP sacked Darrell because, I quote, he insisted on exercising workplace rights at the mine. And what was a workplace right he was fired for by BHP for exercising? He was fired for speaking up about unsafe work practices. He was fired because he said he was unsafe that workers were forced to continue working during a lightning storm and because he refused to take an out-of-service tag off a truck that had an oil leak. But that's not all. Justice Collier also found that BHP's senior management was particularly interested in Darrell for another reason. And that other reason, to paraphrase Justice Collier, is that Darrell's brother is a union health and safety representative and another BHP mine. Now, unfortunately, Darrell is not the only person illegally sacked by large employers due to the con connection to a union. Now, take Theo, who worked as a Qantas cl cabin cleaner for almost seven years before the COVID-19 pandemic began. He was also a trained and experienced union health and safety representative. And I'll quote Theo directly on what, he, what happened next. He said, at the start of the pandemic, we were directed to clean planes with just water, no sanitizer for the trays or anything. PPP, PPE was not mandated despite managers wearing hazmat suits. Managers wearing hazmat suits, he emphasised. We were not even provided with masks or disinfectant. I made numerous approaches to management to ask for further PPE or for the risk assessment they had done. After everything was declined, I directed a group of workers to cease unsafe work, which is one of the health and safety representatives' powers. That day, I was stood down and was the last day at Qantas. Now, Qantas is being prosecuted by WorkSafe, but three years later, this case is still ongoing. And of course, Theo is not alone in being discriminated against for exercising a workplace right at Qantas. Now, Qantas is currently in the High Court over their legal sacking of close to 2,000 workers. The federal court has found on two separate occasions that they were sacked because Qantas did not want them to bargain together with the Transport Workers Union for their next employment contract. And worse still, even though the federal court ruled Qantas was guilty twice, 
they didn't have to give the workers their jobs back because Qantas said they would just sack them again anyway. That is the hallmark of a broken system. Sure, they might pay a penalty, but Alan Joyce has already got what he wanted. He sent a message to every single Qantas worker that if you dare to work together to make your workplace safer or fairer, you will be dealt with. It is absolutely totalitarian way to approach a workplace. And the opposition leader, Peter Dutton, and Alan Joyce are not the only people refusing to let their workers choose to bargain through their union. There's Woodside, which makes tens of billions of dollars a year flogging our national resources while paying a little tax as possible. Back in June of last year, eight months ago, Woodside's offshore gas workers filed a majority support determination at the Fair Work Commission. That means a majority of them have decided that they want to be represented by their unions the AWU and the MUA, and negotiate a new agreement with Woodside. That is their legal right. It happens in workplaces around Australia in every day. In the eight months since, Woodside has launched nine legal challenges, each one more ridiculous than the last, and every single one has failed. And of course, as we know, the tenth legal challenge has now just recently failed as well. Woodside has dragged those workers through the courts for almost a year. Woodside has no case to argue. And of course, in one of the cases, Woodside claimed without any evidence that some of the signatures on the petition were fake. Then after this fraudulent argument had delayed bargaining by eight months, Woodside argued the petition was now outdated. But get this, they also refused to hold a new ballot. The entire Woodside case was fraudulent and was only designed to waste the time and resources of its workforce, the AWU and its MUA workplace elected representatives. As the Offshore Alliance coordinator Zach Duncalf said, Woodside is filing application after application to discourage its workers and their union from seeking to enforce their right to bargain. Every one of the applications is without merit. It is underhanded and entirely cynical. End quote. And just this morning, just the other morning, Woodside had announced that they launched a tenth legal challenge, which I've mentioned, which they've now failed on. This behaviour from the opposition leader, from BHP, Qantas and Woodside, needs to be called out for what it is. It's about suppressing wages and workplace voice. It's about silencing and intimidating workers. They are flagrant breaches of the intent of Article 20 and 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when they get caught, they drag the workers and their unions through the courts for years at a time. And if they have to pay a small fine at the end, or they make it, they'll make it back and then some more through suppressed wages. They'll happily pay a fine or legal cost provided it sends a message to their workforce. That message is that if you try and organise with your mates to have a strong voice in the workplace, we will attack you. It's corporate thuggery at its worst, and it's its absolute ugliest. Of course, the only reason so many big businesses feel emboldened to flagrant, flagrantly suppress wages, unions and workers' voice is because they have explicit support of the Liberal and National parties. Whether it's the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Dutton, refusing to negotiate with his workers, even after an 86 per cent of them voting to do so, or former Prime Minister Morrison refusing to say that every worker should be paid the minimum wage only last year, or former Workplace Relations Minister Christian Porter saying it's too hard to regulate minimum conditions for gig workers, or former Assistant Minister for Workplace Relations <laughs> Senator Stoker saying that the nearly 2,000 illegally sacked Qantas workers that it was their own fault, we have a fundamental crisis in this country. When the Leader of the Opposition, the renegade employers that dominate some of the biggest boardrooms in this country, then think that can, they can silence their workers' democratic voice to save a buck. Conservatives and employers have fostered a culture of fear amongst Australian workers when it comes to unions. They have created an inherent fear among workers that if they try to organise, 
they'll be persecuted and punished by their employer. Now, the reality is that millions of Australians want to join a union. They just haven't had access to the opportunity to do so. In 2010, the Australian Workplace Representative Survey found that 34 per cent of non-union employees would join a union if one formed at their workplace. That is over three and a half million Australians who are being deprived of their right to join a union and whose families are left financially worse off as a result. And there's the rub. We do not have a decline in union membership in Australia. We have a decline in access to the opportunity to join a union. The people who ultimately pay for that are all Australians. Union members earn an average of 32 per cent more than non-members. That's a difference of $350 per week. In some industries, like constructions, construction, the gap is 44 per cent. Now, that explains why those opposite have such feral, thuggish attitudes towards the CFMEU. Employers know this, and that is why they and their stooges in the coalition fight tooth and nail to crush unions. That is why they have imported US-style union-busting 101 tactics. But every Australian worker deserves to access to the superior pay and conditions that come with union membership. If we are going to reverse the economy-wide decline in wages, job security and conditions, we need to reverse the de decades of attacks on unions. We need to ensure that those millions of Australian workers who would join the union if they could have the ability to do so. That is the only way that we're going to ensure that the middle class jobs once again have middle class pay and conditions. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. I um, very much appreciate the opportunity uh, given to me a few minutes ago to make some reflections upon the Governor General's address. Um, and uh, I want to make a few uh, reflections on His Excellency's uh, address uh, to the parliament. Uh, f first of all, in, um, in the traditional fashion, uh, the speech uh, set out the government's agenda for this term. Uh, and it's a newly elected uh, Labor government that, that has um, had as a mantra that we're going to be a government that did what we said we were going to do uh, in the election campaign. So that did mean that in the Governor General's address, some of the uh, commitments that he unfolded uh, in that address, making childcare cheaper, putting downward pressure on energy prices, bringing down the cost of prescription medicine, fee-free TAFE, uh, introducing uh, the National Reconstruction Fund legislation, uh, doing, uh, uh, resolving, uh, this parliament resolving uh, new targets uh, around emissions and fundamentally settling, in my view, uh, a final position around climate change. I mean, these these initiatives that the Governor General set out uh, have have already, apart from the National Reconstruction Fund, and I'll come to that in a moment, have already been implemented. Uh, this government is setting about very carefully uh, doing what it is that we said that we would do. Uh, and that is, I, I have to say, because uh, the, the, uh, we did, uh, as a government, we did opposition a bit differently uh, over the course of the last term. Uh, previously, Mr Rabbit had, I think, set the template. Uh, for what political opposition looked like in Australia, just uh, wrecking and saying no uh, and being destructive. Uh, the Labor Party, led by Anthony Albanese throughout the course of our long, uh, felt pretty long, three years in opposition, um, actually took a thoughtful approach to learning the lessons of why it was that we weren't successful at the 2019 election, internalising those lessons doing the careful policy development work, uh, not being noisy and shouty uh, when it came to how we dealt with the agenda of what passed for the Morrison government, but, but actually doing opposition in a way that Australians expected us to. Uh, and that 
bore real fruit in the national interest during the course of the COVID pandemic, because it would have been open uh, to the opposition to take a hyper-partisan approach uh, during the COVID period. It would have been open to us to oppose everything that the government proposed. But in fact, what the opposition now the government did uh, was carefully deal with all of those issues in the national interest, meet the government halfway on some of the questions uh, that mattered. We did opposition differently. It meant that when we came to making our commitments in the lead up to the last election, uh, voters took those commitments seriously. Uh, now, what I'd observe uh, in giving out a little bit of free advice to those opposite is none of that self-reflection has occurred in the Liberal and National parties. Uh, none of that reflection about what it was that was so, so corrosively bad about the government uh, that they were all a part of. Uh, this was a terrible government, the Morrison government. This was a government that sat on the shoulders of two pretty ordinary governments before it. Uh, but it was in itself the, the worst government uh, since Federation uh, in Australia. It was a government that would have made Billy McMahon feel sick. Uh, it was such a poor, such a poor government uh, because it lacked ambition for the country. They only had ambition for themselves. And I know that Senator Scars made a partisan comment about the Whitlam government. But the Whitlam government had ambition for the country, and I understand we may differ about what that ambition meant and where it led. But at least it had ambition for the country. And what are we? 45 years later, like the, the, the changes that the Whitlam government made are still remembered. Nobody in 45 years will remember the Morrison government. I can assure you of that. Uh, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government. It's impossible to look at the Governor-General's speech and the achievements and the commitments that we have made as a new government without understanding what historically framed it, a government that was characterised by complacency, a government that was characterised by policy laziness, a government that was characterised by a deep sense of entitlement that the objective of government was simply to hold government itself and for the preferment and the privilege of those closest to you. It was a government that allowed people, that allowed senior members of the government, that allowed backbenchers to retreat into a nasty, far-right, US Trump-style extremism. And you can see some of those people are still here uh, amongst those opposite. I mean, the kind of politics that is espoused by Senator Rennick, uh, Senator Antic and others is a retreat into nativist, Trump-style derivative, I have to say pretty boring, extremist politics in an attempt to scoop up potential branch members. Senator Scar knows what I'm talking about because they're recruiting them in Queensland today. Uh, the, 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 the slogan was, keep the cookers out a few weeks ago. I mean, the problem is, in the Queensland Liberal National Party, it's too late. The, the stable door is open, the horse has bolted, the cookers are in charge of significant parts of the Queensland Liberal National Party. Now, now that's, that's the legacy of this government. It, rather than do what it was that Howard did, that former Senator Boswell did, that Conservatives of courage and commitment and principle did, which was say we're going to close the door to extremism, the Morrison government fanned the flames of extremism. And that's what they did uh, in order to sort of bolster a bit of right-wing voters here, a few branch members there in a craven attempt, uh, as, uh, as the Prime Minister did, it's been very well documented uh, in his preferring the candidacy of Ms Deves in Warringah, to promote far-right extremism. Uh, and the problem with doing that, 
The problem with doing that, if you do it when you're in government and you don't reflect on it properly and learn the lessons, it shapes what you're like in opposition. Not just this term, but next term and the term after that and the term after that until you actually internalise and learn the lessons and make the hard choices. And I'm happy to dish out this advice because, terrified as I am that they might actually take the advice, I know that they're not capable of following through. They're not capable of following through. And what it meant for ordinary Australians is that we had a decade of low wage growth. We had a decade of low capital investment. We had a decade where we diminished our position in the world in a way that undercut and undermined our national interest. And none of those things mattered to the people opposite because they weren't faintly concerned with the national interest. We had a decade where the fiscal position of the Commonwealth continued to deteriorate until after the COVID crisis, where a trillion dollars in debt with nothing to show for it, with a structural deficit as far as the eye can see, with terminating measures in the budget that meant that commitments that the government made to the Australian people were only funded for one year or two years or three years, further undermining the position of the budget. Uh, nothing to show for it in terms of infrastructure, in terms of social progress, in terms of productivity measures, in terms of the things that would make life better for ordinary Australian families. We saw Medicare undermined, the health system in disrepair, energy policy failure. Now, the government has had to set about working our way through dealing with these challenges in terms of our strategic position. I mean, the damage that this government did to our position amongst Pacific Island leaders is, is utterly shameful. And it was characterised by Mr Dutton and Mr Abbott you know, making jokes at the expense of Pacific Island people about climate change when they were caught out by the famous boom mic. The problem with that moment was not that it was a mistake, a, a, a sort of joke, a, a, a sort of aside that didn't really characterise what they thought. The problem was it characterised what they thought. And Pacific Island leaders and Pacific Island people saw that. And so we're engaged in this massive effort in the region, in the Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific, in terms of our strategic position, in terms of our global position uh, of catch up and patch up. An enormous effort uh, in governance terms. I, I, all I could say really is that Australians uh, are entitled to expect much more from their government. A government that rorted public funds in its own partisan interest. And their recent criticisms of some of the funded commitments that the government made in opposition that, that, that went to that, that were specific commitments, they thought were very clever because they said, no, isn't, isn't the government doing what the last government did? Utterly betrayed their lack of understanding of the governance principles themselves. Because there is a deep difference. If you need to understand it, wander down to the Auditor General's office and I'm sure he'll explain it to you. A deep difference between what it is that a political party commits to in its election program and what are decisions of government. And the problem uh, for Mr Dutton and all of his friends is that this was a government that utterly perverted the processes of government in its own partisan interest. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But nothing more symbolises the incapacity of the Liberal and National parties to understand the position that they put the country in than the choice that they made after the election, the choice to elect Mr Dutton as the leader. Because nobody, unless I suppose they'd actually gone and elected Mr Tudge as the opposition leader, nobody symbolises more the failures uh, and the problems and the lack of moral capacity and the lack of a sense of the national interest amongst the current cohort of Liberal and National Party MPs than does Mr. Morrison, uh, than does Mr. Dutton. 
uh, and that is that is the problem. That is the problem. Uh, and people on the other side may well want to defend may well want to defend the previous government, but nothing symbolises more what Mr. Tudge said in 2016 when he when he defend, and I was quite struck by listening to this in question time. I'd, I'd forgotten about it. In 2016, when he was talking about their illegal, patently illegal, uh, robo debt scheme, he said, "We'll find you. We'll track you down, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison." Administering an illegal scheme to some of the most vulnerable people in Australia, who didn't owe the government a dollar, he created the impression in their minds that he would hunt them down and that they may well end up in prison. I mean, you can't imagine a crueler, a crueler, more cavalier approach to the most vulnerable Australians. Uh, well, there's choices in front of people. Uh, the, op the opposition can choose this week and over the next few weeks to reject the government's National Reconstruction Fund, have a mandate for. We have a chance in this country to rebuild our manufacturing sector. Uh, but this government, th this opposition over here, are currently saying no. Again, the national interest, the national security interest, rebuilding our manufacturing capability in, for democratic cohesion, for all sorts of reasons, for economic reasons, <laughs> for social ones. We've got a chance to do this. And these guys over here say no, they will not be able to go back. Uh, into regional electorates and defend that position. And while the track record of governments isn't very strong in by-elections by over our history, the people of Aston have got a choice too, and it's either uh, it's, it's, it's a vote for or against Mr Dutton Thank you, that Senator. we'll see Your time has in Aston. Expired. Senator Chisholm. No? Is there anybody else who wants to speak? I move that the address in reply be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I move the Senate now adjourn. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. 2023 got off to a bad start for greyhounds. It's only March, and there have already been 25 track deaths and 1,963 injuries this year. Over the last weekend in January alone, four dogs were killed racing. The reality is all greyhound racing is cruel and it is unsafe. On average, three dogs die every week on Australian racetracks, and a staggering 28 more are injured every single day. As the Coalition for the Protection of Greyhounds had said, this is an industry built on the broken bodies of gentle and beautiful dogs. There is cruelty inflicted on greys every step of the way. Surgical artificial insemination, or SAI, is used in about 80% of breeding for greyhounds. SAI involves anesthetizing the dog, making an incision, then taking the uterus out to put sperm in it before replacing it and sewing up the whole back. It's as horrific and unethical as it sounds. SAI has been widely criticized by veterinary associations in the RSPCA. It is in fact illegal in the UK, Norway, Sweden and Holland. Disappointingly, the Perrottet government recently backflipped on a proposal to ban SAI following pressure from the racing lobby. 
Yet another reason I look forward to voting the Liberals out in New South Wales on the 25th of March. Over 70% of greyhounds are discarded annually, many of them never rehomed. The national rate of greyhound breeding in 2020-21 was about six times the industry's capacity to rehome them. Breeding numbers are way too high to ever rehome all racing greyhounds. And this leaves volunteers and volunteer organizations to do the lion's share of rehoming, despite the industry being more than financially capable of doing so. The greyhound industry's national turnover was $9.4 billion in 2020-2021, and every single dollar of that is despicable blood money. Disturbingly, there have also been recent reports of greyhounds being exported to countries where they end up being used for breeding against Greyhound Australasia's rules. There is absolutely no way to ensure the welfare of these dogs. That's why last year I introduced a bill to ban the import and export of greyhounds for racing, breeding and other commercial purposes. And I will keep pushing for such a ban. I urge the minister to take action where the previous government demonstrated a callous indifference. Anyone who has opened their homes to greyhounds knows how gentle and intelligent they are. I was one of those lucky people, and I know my colleague across um, you know, the, the chamber is also one of those people. And there are more and more of us every single day. Public sentiment on greyhound racing continues to shift in the right direction. A survey from January commissioned by Grey 2K USA Worldwide and the Coalition for the Protection of Greyhounds found that a clear majority of people in Australia, 57%, think that greyhound racing should be banned or phased out. An even larger majority, 69%, opposed governments subsidizing the greyhound industry. And these numbers are supported by polling commission by my own office, which found that 58% of people want greyhound racing ban, and this number is significantly higher among young people and women. So politicians across the country are failing to listen to the community. And there's an overarching reason for this, money. As with all industries on rapidly dwindling social license, like the fossil fuel industry now or the tobacco industry many decades ago, the gambling industry throws cash at politicians on both sides. It was recently revealed that Sportsbet paid $19,000 to the campaign of Communications Minister Michelle Rowlands. Tabcorp has disclosed donations totaling over $3 million since 1998 to Labour, Liberal and the other parties. And I'm so proud that the Greens have never taken and will never take gambling and racing money. And in return, state governments inflate prize money, pay breeding incentives, prop up financially failing clubs, build racetracks, and maintain weak welfare oversight of the industry. The cycle of legalized corruption repeats, and greyhounds continue to die and to get injured. The world is moving away from greyhound racing, with just a tiny number of countries left perpetrating this unfathomable cruelty. Greyhound racing must be banned, and mark my words, on the back of people power, it will be banned. Are there any other senators who wish to speak? Okay. Uh, there being no other speakers, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.